order. We will now begin the daily routine. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Unfortunately, today I must rise on a point of privilege. Pursuant to Rule 29-2, I provided you sufficient notice of my intention to raise this issue today. I do so at the earliest convenience. Madam Speaker, the impartiality of the Speaker is one of the, most, is one of the Office's most important features. It's an attribute that has developed in parliamentary democracies over the last three centuries. Last night, during debate of Bill 340, the member for Yarmouth repeatedly broke with that tradition and disrespected the chair of the Committee of the Whole House on Bills by questioning his impartiality. His words and act actions were a clear and serious departure from the well-established parliamentary tradition. For clarity, here are experts or excerpts from the member of, for Yarmouth's speech on the bill. As expected, the hometown hero there in Glace Bay can talk about his teachers and not being a career politician for 20 minutes in the House. And I'm talking about the bill. I'm talking about the relationship with the MOU. I'm talking about the process that led to this moment. And yet, I'm called out of order on this, laughter, by the Leader of the Opposition. I just got to clarify that. And thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I certainly hope all members, including those that serve in key positions in this House, respect the decorum and the rights of all members to speak to these bills and to treat all members fairly and with respect, because that's the role of whomever is sitting in the chair or in the Speaker's position. Later, when the chair directed the member for Yarmouth to speak to Bill 340, he responded with, thank you, Mr. Chair, you're making it a little too obvious. This is a clear implication of bias towards the chair. As you are well aware, Madam Speaker, Mango page 253 clearly states that any suggestion of impartiality or bias on the part of a presiding officer such as the Speaker, a chairman of the Committee of the Whole, or a chairman of a standing or special committee automatically shows disrespect and amounts to, comment to it um, and amounts to contempt. Other improper reflections on the Speaker are also subject to House action. Further, Bosk and Gagnon say the actions of the Speaker may not be criticized in debate or by any means except by way of substantive motion. Later, they say reflections on the character or actions of the Speaker, an allegation of bias, for example, could be taken by the House as breaches of privilege and punished accordingly. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, upon reviewing the debate, you will find that the member for Yarmouth did not make a substantive motion on this subject, opting instead for thinly veiled accusations against the chair and disrespect disrespectful reflections on the chair. Madam Speaker, there can be no other interpretation of the words and the tone used by the member of Yarmouth except that he was accusing the chair of the committee of the whole House on Bills of bias and being a little too obvious about it. For those reasons, I've moved that the House order the member of Yarmouth to retract and apologize for each instance where he questioned the impartiality of the chair. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Order. Um, I will confirm that I did receive the timely notice uh, from the Honourable Government House leaders um, with regards to their question of privilege and um, in advance of today's sitting, and I, I appreciate that. Um, I will ask, is there any debate on the matter, or would the... Oh, I recognize the Honourable uh, Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, thank you very much, uh, much Madam Speaker. Uh, certainly trust the role of the Speaker and the Chair, but I need to rise on a point of personal privilege. And I, I need to point out the record on this, because I think the record's going to be very clear if you rule on this, and I'd like to know what your ruling is on the point of privilege before I move on any statement related to the House Leader's comments. I would like you and the clerks to review what ha what's happened in this chamber. I'd like you to count how many times myself in particular, is called on a point of order when what I'm saying is obviously and demonstrably linked to debate related to the bill. I pointed out last night that the same level of decorum that's being demanded of me is not being applied adequately or equally across, order. across the chamber. Order. 
Order. I would ask the member to uh, focus on the uh, point of privilege and whether or not the member wants to continue on a debate about it or if the member will stand in their place now and retract and apologize and then we will consider your point of privilege. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. On the point of privilege, Madam Speaker? No, I am recognizing you first on your response to what was put forward by the government House Leader. I am asking if you are uh, going to debate or if you are going to retract and apologize and then rise again on your own point of privilege. I recognize the Honourable um, Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I think, um, and I would ask you on this issue that's been brought up, the point of order, to review the record on this, and not just with debate last night, but debates previously, and come up with your own determination. Order. I, I have. I watched last night, I do every evening, that I'm not um, uh, by law able to be in that chair. I go home and watch. And um, I received this this morning. I read it um, and I have gone over everything. And I went back and actually viewed it again for actually three times. Um, I have a ruling. Um, if we are to proceed. So once again, I am going to ask if the leader of the official opposition would like to stand in their place to retract and apologize and then rise again on a point of privilege of your own. I recognize the official leader of the official opposition. I will retract and apologize and I will, uh, I will stand right after this and, and express my point of privilege. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Finance on... Order. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that was my point, whether or not it was going to be debated by the leader of the official opposition or if they would retract and apologize. So it has now basically extinguished that point of privilege because of the leader's uh, apology, apology and retraction. I am open to other points of privilege or points of order as we proceed. I recognize the honorable leader, uh, Minister for Municipal Affairs and Housing. So, uh, Madam Speaker, I rise on a point of order. Last night in the debate during Community Whole House on uh, the debate on Bill 340, the MOU bill, the, the leader of the official opposition uh, suggested that uh, myself as a member was not worthy of the designation of honourable. And uh, I just want to say that we can disagree about points or what's happening. We can disagree in this House on how we get the, the work done, but to cast aspersions on someone else's character in that way is... Uh, order. Is, um, I need to remind the Minister on a point of order um, with regards to uh, the Committee of the Whole last evening. Anything that would need to be brought to my attention has to be within the 24 hours. So I certainly don't mind receiving something in uh, writing. My apologies. It's not 24 hours, but it does have to be brought up to the chair before sitting. Order. 
So just some clarification here. So if anyone is about to stand in their place on a point of order or point of privilege, it was to be brought to the chair of the committee of the whole house. Um, so if we want to move forward, we can. Um, if there's any other point of orders other than what took pl place last night. But I think that there, this is a good opportunity for all of us in this chamber to think about the words that we are using. To think about having respect for one another. To think about, and I know it's cliche and we've all heard this before, when we start slinging mud, you're losing ground. And I am really going to start no taking better note and um, having to make rulings and decisions. Um, I think that everyone realizes that we, we are not to act in a way that is disrespectful to one another in this chamber. Um, again, attacked policies, attacked regulations, attacked the bills, but once you start attacking one another, I'm calling you out. So we are now going to uh, begin daily routine. I recognize the Honourable Minister uh, or House Leader of the Government. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, during my uh, point of uh, order this morning, um, or this afternoon I just outlined, I uh, listed three insta instances of uh, the member of Yarmouth's uh, comments last night. I'm wondering if the, uh, I don't want to keep going on this and rehash it, but I'm wondering if the member of Yarmouth can be uh, explicit of those uh, in his apologies on those three uh, instances. leader of the official opposition heard the, uh, the uh, motion that was put forward um, to retract and apologize and heard the three different um, incidents that occurred and did apologize and retract so we are now going to move forward with the daily routine okay we will start with presenting and reading petitions Presenting reports of committees. Tabling reports, regulations, and other papers. Statements by ministers. Notices of motion, government notices of motion. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Before I begin, I beg leave to make an introduction. Please do. Thank you. Uh, in your gallery, in the Speaker's gallery, I'm honoured to introduce a number of volunteer firefighters from Lunenburg West. As we all know, these are just a few of the thousands of first responders across our province who've gone above and beyond to assist Nova Scotians during the past two years of unprecedented natural disasters. So from the Bridgewater Fire Department, we have Fire Chief Michael Noss. We have Firefighter and Junior Committee Co-Chair Cynthia Isabel and Junior Firefighter Brooke Weigel. From Conqueror Bank Fire Department, we have Fire Chief Ryan Anthony and Junior Firefighters Nolan Anthony and Madison Gall. From the Hebville Fire Department, we have Fire Chief Doug Peverell, Firefighter Jerry Reed and Junior Firefighter Trenton Baker. From the Italy Cross Fire Department, we have Fire Chief Nancy Llewellyn Rafuse. We have Lieutenant Brandon Burgoyne, who started as a junior and is now a regular member uh, and a Lieutenant of Pumper 2. We have Junior Firefighter Callum Mosier. And from the Tri-District Fire Department, we have Fire Chief Paul Hayes. We have Firefighter Krista Rosevar and Junior Firefighter Kendra Rosevar. I would ask you to rise. They've risen, uh, and I accept the warm welcome of the House.
welcome to the House and thank you so very much for your service and protecting uh, your communities. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas junior firefighters are youth committed to protecting their communities and earning a personal development high school credit through hands-on learning of firefighting, fire prevention and safety skills from Nova Scotia's experienced firefighters. Whereas junior firefighters contribute meaningfully during emergencies alongside Nova Scotia's professional and volunteer firefighters, including during the recent wildfires, working tirelessly to safeguard local homes and businesses and families. Whereas young people in the Junior Firefighters Program are tomorrow's community leaders, inspiring those around them and securing the future of firefighting in the province. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House join me in recognizing the courage and contributions of junior firefighters and the work of those who train them and thereby build a stronger, safer future for all people in Nova Scotia. Madam Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye? aye. Contrary minded nay? The motion is carried. I recognize the honourable member for our minister for seniors and long term care. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas older Nova Scotians have and continue to contribute significantly to our communities and the wonderful province we all enjoy. Whereas every year between 20 and 30 percent of seniors in Canada, including those in Nova Scotia, experience a fall often resulting in emergency room visits, hospitalizations, disability, chronic pain and loss of independence and in the most serious cases, death. Whereas November is a fall prevention month in Canada, which is a time to encourage all Nova Scotians and Canadians to come together to do our part to prevent falls and fall-related injuries. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this legislature recognize November as fall prevention month in the province of Nova Scotia, and that everyone has a role to play in preventing falls. Madam Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye? Aye. Contrary minded nay? The motion is carried. <laughs> Are there any further government notices of motion? Before we move on to introduction of bills, I just want to, in the speaker's gallery, recognize two people that are extremely important to me. Uh, first, I want to introduce to the chamber my daughter, Chloe Hannah Marshall, if she would stand. Uh, Chloe is uh, 25, and I'm really proud of her. She has, uh, hasn't been here for 10 years when I was first elected, but I'll tell you what, she's been living a busy life, um, traveling and having fun, and now has settled down into the realities of uh, a big person's job. <laughs> and, uh, has, uh, and that job has brought her to Halifax this week on conference, and I'm just extremely uh, proud of you, sweetheart. Um, you are everything I actually aspire to and um, so thank you for coming today I really appreciate it and after 10 years I have never introduced to everyone um, my right-hand person who is Michelle Livingston if she would stand please um, I don't know where I would be without the help of Michelle. Uh, she has my back, and um, I just want to say thank you for everything that you do for me, for my family, for everything. So thank you. So we'll now move on to introduction of bills. And I recognize the honorable member for Cole Harbor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg leave to introduce a bill an act to establish Sickle Cell Awareness Day. The Honourable Member for 
Cole Harbour begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Establish a Sickle Cell Awareness Day. Bill 396, An Act to Establish a Sickle Cell Awareness Day. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. Any further introductions of bills? Notices of motion. I recognize the Honourable Member for Bedford Basin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I should move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the federal government changed employment insurance rules in December 2022 to allow persons who are suffering from illnesses to access employment insurance for up to 26 weeks. And whereas Nova Scotia labour law currently only guarantees employees working in provincially regulated industries a maximum of three days unpaid leave due to illness, which is insufficient for people with serious illnesses such as cancer cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and MS. And whereas, according to a narrative research poll conducted in August 2023, 86% of Nova Scotians overwhelmingly support the extension of job-protected leave to 26 weeks, a move that would give employees the opportunity to access treatment and heal without worrying whether they will have a job to return to or even income during the time they access treatment and or heal. Therefore, be it resolved, the government of Nova Scotia immediately immediately ensure Nova Scotians who are facing serious illnesses and who are working in provincially regulated industries have access to up to 26 weeks job protected unpaid leave which would leave them allow them to access the federal EI program during those weeks of leave without fear of job loss madam speaker i request waiver of notice and passage without debate Order, I would let the uh, member know that the motion does not pertain to uh, the chamber, the provincial government. Uh, limit on oral uh, notices and motion, if you look at um, page 31, um, number two, now withstanding paragraph one on the order of the day notices of motion being read, not more than four notices of motion may be given for a resolution of the House orderly in the House on a sitting day, and then only with respect to business of the House or a committee of the House, nor may any member give orally in the House at any time a notice of the motion for an order of the House. So um, because it does not pertain um, to this House in particular or a committee, um, it would be ruled out. However, I will let the member know that you could ask for unanimous consent, and if received, then we could rule that. So if you would like to put it to a motion um, and ask for unanimous consent, um, we could table it. If not, of course, um, that's your option. I recognize the honorable member for Bedford Basin. Sorry, I, I'm not clear on why this is not the business of the House. Again, as I stated, it does not pertain to the House for regular business or to a committee of that belongs to the House. Therefore, the, it's ruled out of order. But again, if you want it to be tabled, you could ask for unanimous consent. I'm not sure how that will go, but you may want to suggest and try that you could get unanimous consent to be tabled. <laughs> well, um, with that great suggestion, Madam Speaker, uh, I ask for... <laughs> Sorry, what? Um, it wasn't sarcasm. It wasn't sarcasm at all. It, I, I meant it honestly. I, I'm sorry, She's but I ex order, order. I am sorry, but literally five, ten minutes ago, I suggested to this house to be nice. 
to be nice to one another. We didn't get very far, did we? So we're going to try this again. I recognize the honourable member for Bedford Basin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I did honestly mean that was, that was a great suggestion. And so, uh, with the suggestion of the Speaker, I ask for um, unanimous consent of the House that this be tabled. There is a request for unanimous consent. Would all those in favour of this uh, unanimous consent uh, say aye? Aye. Contrary minded, nay? Nay. There are several nays. The uh, motion is tabled. Or the, sorry, there are several nays. The motion is defeated. And just for clarity, the motion is out of order. Okay, we are now moving on to statements by members. I recognize the Honourable Member for Eastern Passage. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg leave to make two introductions. You may. Thank you. My first introduction is to introduce my right hand, my constituency assistant, Lisa Roshan, who is also a dear friend of mine. I'll ask her to rise and receive the warm welcome of the House. I recognize the Honourable Member for Eastern Passage. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Before I begin my member speak statement, I would like to introduce in the East Gallery our members of a wonderful family from Eastern Passage who just last week became new Canadian citizens. I am. Welcome. It's a real pleasure to have you here at the Nova Scotia House of Assembly. I recognize the Honourable Member for Eastern Passage. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So I am honoured to introduce, and I'll ask them to rise again as I introduce them uh, to the Legislature, uh, Tucson Nguyen, his wife Natalie Ha, their daughter Lam Nguyen, and their son Tom Nguyen, who's now risen. I ask all of the members to rise to uh, welcome those new Canadian members to our Nova Scotia Legislature. Okay. I recognize the Honourable Member for Eastern Passage. Madam Speaker, I rise today to welcome and congratulate Tucson Nguyen, his daughter Lam Nguyen, and son Tom Nguyen on recently becoming new Canadian citizens. On October 25, 2023, all three family members graciously took Canada's oath of citizenship. We welcome you to Canada, Nova Scotia, and of course, Eastern Passage. Tucson and his wife Natalie Ha started a local business as new residents from Vietnam in 2020. The business, VNCA Trade and Investment Promotion Inc., provides local grocery stores and markets with fresh, locally grown vegetables year round. Madam Speaker, I ask all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature to join me in congratulating Tucson Nguyen and his children on becoming Canadian citizens and for providing local, sustainable produce to Nova Scotians. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Yarmouth. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Today marks the beginning of Nova Scotia Music Week. From now through Sunday, talented musical artists from various genres will gather in Yarmouth to celebrate. We're so happy to be hosting Nova Scotia Music Week again in our home area. The banner event will be the 2023 Music Nova Scotia Music and Industry Awards, where 21 awards will be presented across seven industry categories. This year, a variety of programming will support and spotlight the Acadian and Francophone music community. Nova Scotia has a long history of great musical talent from all over the province, including artists from Yarmouth like Wintersleep and Brian Borchard. I'm excited to see their lead singer, Paul Murphy's new project, Post Data, this weekend as well. I'd like to congratulate, congratulate Music Nova Scotia and all the volunteers 
uh, who put the hard work into making Nova Scotia Music Week happen and thank them for supporting our local music scene. A special thank you to Allegra, the executive director who I know puts her heart and soul into everything that happens. We certainly look forward to welcoming all those that are going to be involved in Nova Scotia Music Week in Yarmouth this weekend. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Madam Speaker, this past Sunday, the streets of Creighton Park in Dartmouth North were overtaken by ghosts and goblins, witches, superheroes, and more as the Kittical Mass bike ride came through the community. Families with kids rode bikes, scooters, used strollers, and walked through Creighton, Creighton Park and took, it, took in all the scary and fun Halloween decorations at the same time. Kittical Mass is an international movement for child and cycling-friendly cities. Rides are a celebration of cycling and a way to show that kids and families need safe space to ride in their communities. This year alone, Kittical Mass has hosted six rides in the HRM where families and kids ride together and have lots of fun and then eat snacks and win prizes at the end of the ride, most importantly. Kittical Mass rides are an opportunity for adults and children to ride together in an urban setting. My son, M.A., and I had a great time at the ride on Sunday, and I'm thankful for the organization for planning a ride in Dartmouth North. I ask all members of the House to join me in thanking Kittical Mass for the important work that they are doing and encourage all members to get out for a bike ride this fall. I recognize the Honourable Member for Lunenburg West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to recognize the 14 fire departments in Lunenburg West, and as an example of the important work that they do, shine a spotlight on one of them. The Hebville Fire Department has 24 dedicated members. They are unique in North America as the operators of the only aerial ladder truck which they engineered in collaboration with the manufacturer. It has a 55-foot working ladder and throws 500 gallons of water per minute. Last spring, the 24-member team was the first of many of our local departments who provided aid in the fight against the massive wildfires in Shelburne County. They worked tirelessly overnight, relieving and providing support to the local crews, and they returned 16 hours later with another team. While providing this support, the department also fought local brush fires and a wildfire in Conqueror Bank. During the July floods, floods, they answered an unprecedented 29 calls and were also called out during post-tropical storm Lee. In addition to the Hebville Department, Lunenburg West is served by Bridgewater, Conqueror Bank, Hebs Cross, Hemford and District, Italy Cross, Middlewood and District, La Have, Lapland and District, Midville and District, Petite Revere, Pleasantville and District, Tri-County, Tri-District, and United Communities Fire Department. I ask the House to join me in thanking each of them for dedication, innovation, and commitment to protecting our community and helping others during this year of record-breaking wildfires and flooding. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Fairview Clayton Park. Madam Speaker, as the market season comes to a close in Nova Scotia, I want to take a moment to express my appreciation to Annapolis Valley Produce for their commitment to bring fresh valley produce to Fairview Clayton Park over the past 20 weeks. This season posed numerous challenges with more rainy days than the previous three years combined. However, the residents of Fairview Clayton Park showed up every day regardless of the weather. From their opening day in June, the farm stand on Dutch Village Road is always busy, most days with lines of eager, cu eager customers waiting to bring home everything from apples to zucchini and everything in between. Madam Speaker, it's essential to recognize and appreciate the hard work and resilience of local businesses like Annapolis Valley Produce that contribute to our community's well-being. Thank you for coming to our community and providing us with fresh, locally sourced food. We can't wait to see you again in June for the opening of strawberry season. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Madam Speaker, I rise today to pay tribute to a dearly departed, much beloved, and globally recognized local feline. Carlton the Cat lived close to the St. Mary's University campus since 2016. Students, staff, and faculty loved Carlton so much that he became an unofficial mascot of sorts, attending lectures, walking students to and from class, and occasionally taking a nap on the stack of sweaters in the campus bookstore. Carlton had his very own official SMU ID and garnered national news attention in 2018 when he ran a campaign to be a member of the Board of Governors with the slogan, if I fits on the board, I sits on the board. <laughs> Upon hearing of his crossing over the Rainbow Bridge on Tuesday, the SMU community and much of Halifax have taken to social media to share their tributes, mem memories and gratitudes for his care and companionship over the years. I would like to express my condolences to Sophie and family and my gratitude for this feline friend to all. I recognize the Honourable Member for Kings North. 
Madam Speaker, I rise today to congratulate Mr. Kenneth Havelock Fredericks on the occasion of his 100th birthday on November 4, 2023. Mr. Fredericks was born in Middleton on November 4, 1923. He was a longtime resident of Kentville, where he operated the Kent Lodge Hotel on Webster Street, and he later worked at Canada Post as a letter carrier for 20 years until his retirement. As a Royal Canadian Air Force veteran from World War II, Mr. Fredericks now resides in the Middleton Hospital Veterans Wing. Please join me today to recognize and congratulate Kenneth Havelock Fredericks on his 100th birthday and thank him for his service to our community and our country. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Bedford South. Uh, thank you. Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize Lebanese Heritage Month here in Nova Scotia. The first Lebanese immigrants to Halifax arrived on our shores in 1884. Since that time, the Lebanese community has made invaluable contributions to the economic, social and cultural life of our province. No matter where you go in Nova Scotia, you are certain to see and feel the impact of Lebanese Nova Scotians at the restaurants where you eat and the buildings in which you live or work, for example. Madam Speaker, one of my very best friends is Lebanese, and so growing up, I often get a chance to experience the warmth and joy that is the Lebanese household. In closing, I'd like to recognize the memory of two members of the Lebanese community whom we lost far too soon, Leo and Sabah Saba. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honorable member for Halifax, Shabakdo. Uh, thank you. Congratulations are extended to Linda Scherzinger, recipient of the Honorable Mayan Francis Faith in Action Award for 2023. The Faith in Action Award is presented each year by the Atlantic School of Theology to honor exceptional individuals whose work and community outreach is driven by their faith commitment. Linda is a minister of the United Church of Canada, who, as the citation accompanying the award put it, bears witness to her Christian faith through her lifelong commitment and active involvement in working with others for a more just, compassionate, and peaceful world. A longtime environmentalist, Linda has worked with the Ecology Action Centre and the Sierra Club and has played a key role in organizing interfaith groups to speak out on climate change. She is an involved promoter in the fair trade movement for both Guatemalan coffee farmers and Palestinian olive oil producers. And through the ecumenical coalition Kairos, Linda continues to work towards collaboration among faith communities advocating for ecological and social justice. Her enduring faith in action, the AST citation reads, inspires hope for a better future. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Waverly Fall River Beaver Bank. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today to wish Elaine Blanchard and the Scotian Airs Chorus the best of luck as they travel to Grand Rapids, Michigan to represent Nova Scotia at the Harmony International Competition on November 8th. The Scotian Airs Chorus is an award-winning women's a cappella chorus with more than 50 singers of all ages from across the Halifax region. The group has been performing for more than 40 years and this year was named the Area One Championship Chorus. Madam Speaker, please help me wish the Scotian Airs Chorus the best of luck as they represent Nova Scotia at this prestigious competition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Darkmouth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to recognize a former Coal Harbour resident and chef, Jeff Anderson. Jeff grew up in Colby Village, graduated from Auburn Drive High School, and then attended the Culinary Institute of Canada. Following his graduation, Mr. Anderson worked for the Hyatt Corporation in Colorado before returning home to work in the Halifax fine dining scene. It was upon his return to the Culinary Institute for a two-year culinary operations course that led him to where he is today. He was hired by McDonald's Canada to work in their product development department. Now the question is, how long does it take to invent a new sandwich? Apparently, two years. The new Chicken Big Mac was launched recently. Jeff states that it's not as easy as it might seem to deliver a new product between testing and consumer research. Many hours of work were spent on this one product. Madam Speaker, I want to congratulate Jeff Anderson for following his path in the culinary world and wish him much success in the future. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'm hungry for some reason. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Madam Speaker, I rise today to congratulate the Village of Pugwash on being awarded a Lieutenant Governor's Community Spirit Award that celebrates the power, strength, and diversity of vibrant communities like Pugwash. 
His Honor, Lieutenant Governor Arthur LeBlanc and Ms. Patsy LeBlanc were in Pugwash on September the 10th for the award ceremony, and His Honor also presented the Community Pride in Action Awards on behalf of Pugwash Communities in Bloom. Maureen Leahy accepted the Community Sp Spirit Award on behalf of the village, while the Communities in Bloom Awards went to Michael Cunningham, Community Champion, Eleanor Conrad, Community Backbone, and Community Caretakers to Valerie Brown, Dean Hunter, Maurice Gallant, Charles Kennedy, Clara McDonald, and Larry McDonald for their tireless work on Cumberland Trails. Madam Speaker, I was raised in the Pugwash area and I am proud to represent the residents here in this house and I can truly attest that the award is well deserved. His Honour commented during the ceremony the level of belonging evidenced in the Pugwash area is a rare gift and he was impressed with the spirit of giving that is evident. M Madam Speaker, please join me in congratulating the individuals who received Communities in Bloom awards and the community of Pugwash on being the recipient of a 2023 Lieutenant Governor Community Spirit Award. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I know I've said it before, but um, we are really going well over your minute for um, member statements. It's really hard to cut someone off, though, when um, you know it's very meaningful and you have uh, individuals in the gallery that you're talking about. But I will ask that everyone, before you know we finish the session, to maybe go back and look at your statements and just see if you can read them within the minute. Because some are actually running almost two minutes. So, with that, I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On September 10th, I went on a walk for a cause along the waterfront with my colleague, the member from Halifax, Shibakto, and my new pup, Silas, to support ovarian cancer. The Ovarian Cancer Canada Walk of Hope was designed to create awareness for this vital cause, as this is the most fatal women's cancer in Nova Scotia. The statistics around ovarian cancer are alarming. One out of every two Canadians diagnosed won't live to see another five years. And survival rates have not significant, uh, excuse me, and survival rates have not significantly improved in decades. Using our voices can help change that. The walk itself was on such a beautiful day. The drink stations kept us pumped up for the cause and the sun was truly shining down on us as we walked for hope for all. I'd like all members to join me in thanking the organizers of the event and I look forward to the Lady Ball in 2024. I recognize the Honourable Member for Eastern Shore. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today to bring recognition to Marianne Nash and the leadership team at St. John of the Cross Parish in East Chesuncook. Marianne spearheaded a free clothing shop, two tunics, in the basement of St. Philip Neary Church in Muscadabit Harbour. The free clothing shop opened its doors in early November 2022, and through generous community donations, the church basement is filled with clothing, shoes, bedding, winter jackets for infants, children, and adults. The two tunic shop is operated by 19 volunteers, four days a week. Since its inception, in over 1,500 residents have benefited from the clothing bank. Thanks to the diligence of Mary Ann and volunteers, the shop recently received $5,000 Communities Care Grant through the East Coast Credit Union, in addition to $5,000 received through the Department of Community Services, and $750 from the Eastern Shore Community Health Board. I ask all members of the Assembly to join me in thanking Mary Ann and all Two Tunics volunteers for their leadership, perseverance, and kindness to their fellow community members. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I now recognize the Honourable Member for Clayton Park West, who is joining us virtually. Madam Speaker, today I rise to inform the House about an exciting time that happens in Clayton Park West on September 30th. The Sheffield Social Committee hosted their first Sheffield Fall Block Party, and I was a proud supporter. The Block Party was a fun event for the whole family. There was a bouncy castle, potluck barbecue, and bicycle decorating, followed by a group bicycle ride in Sheffield, which was a wonderful activity for the children. The event was hosted by the residents of Canterbury Close and, I, and led by the hard work and dedication of Ryan and Jenna Stanley. The couple recently moved to Clayton Park West from British Columbia, and we are very happy to welcome the ambitious team to our community. Madam Speaker, I ask the House, please join me in thanking the Stanleys and the, she and the Sheffield Social Committee for hosting this wonderful event, and we are all looking forward to it again next year. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pierce. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to congratulate my sister-in-law, Bria Brown, and Corey Allison on the birth of Lennon May. We welcome Lennon May into our family on July 9th, 2023. The Brown Cousin crew, made up of Rory, Isla, and Lennon, are going to keep us busy in the month of July with three birthday parties from July 9th to July 13th. We are all overjoyed to have Lennon May in our lives, and we are excited to watch her grow and learn. We love you, Lennon, and I ask the House to join me in congratulating Bria and Corey on welcoming Lennon into our family. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. Uh, Madam Speaker, Trevor Woodrow is a passionate, reliable, and energetic volunteer from Pictou County. He's an integral part of the Pictou County Recreation and Athletic Society, Pioneer Athletic Field, and Pictou County Athletics Track and Field Club. His involvement has been instrumental in their development at both the coaching and operational capacities. An ed educator at the Glasgow Academy, Trevor is very involved in athletics in the school system, offering his experience and expertise at provincial, Atlantic, and school sport Nova Scotia track and field events. Trevor's unwavering commitment to volunteerism has left a significant imprint throughout Pictou County. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, once again uh, this year, the uh, North Sydney Historical Society, in partnership with the North Sydney Legion and the North Sydney Fire Department, are displaying the veterans' banners throughout the town of North Sydney. What started out two years ago um, with 15 banners has now blossomed into 75 banners and it's a great uh, visual testament of past veterans of the town of North Sydney and many families uh, are able to honour their veterans in this way. I would like to give thanks to Chairman Joe Meany and all those involved in this wonderful endeavour. Thank you Madam, Madam Speaker. I recognise the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to recognize the Strength and Wellness Studio, the latest fitness centre to open in Dartmouth South. Co-owned and operated by sisters Laura and Carrie Albert, the Strength and Wellness Studio is quickly gaining a dedicated following of clients. Their mission is to be a truly inclusive space for everybody, and the sisters have created a gym experience that has been called the antidote to the big box gym, and which empowers clients who otherwise feel out of place in a traditional gym setting. Laura and Carrie also prioritize body positivity and mental health in the studio, leaving clients feeling empowered, refreshed, and excited to work on their strength and fitness. Please join me in welcoming the Strength and Wellness Studio to the business community in North Woodside and in congratulating Laura and Carrie on creating such a welcoming place for fitness and health in Dartmouth. I recognize the honorable member for for Hansies. Oh, was a... Thank you, Madam Speaker. Starting off an interesting day. Um, I'd like to recognize all the hardworking staff and volunteers who have told for the last six years at the Elmsdale Community Garden. The garden has been able to ensure fresh produce was available for harvesting for families of East Hans. The Elmsdale Community Garden also offers a wide range of supports for the community besides garden, including a community freezer, school supplies. Mm -hmm. During the COVID pandemic, staff and volunteers were able to adapt to ensure these valuable supports were continuously available. Madam Speaker, East Hans is fortunate to have people in our community willing to go beyond to enable residents of our community to live comfortably and healthy. Thank you to everyone who has been a vital part of supporting this group has to offer. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I recognize the Honourable Member for Clare. Madam Speaker, in 1953, Philippe Leblanc left his village of Comoville to learn diesel engine repair in Halifax. About 20 years later, he came back home to start his own diesel repair business with a strong commitment to excellence and customer service. As their reputation in our community grew, so did the company, expanding into diesel engine sales. Philip Leblanc Diesel Repair became a true family business when Philip's son Danny, who is now the company's president, began working alongside his father. 
Today, the business still tries with the same dedication to service their customers that Philip Lublin established 50 years ago. I invite all members to join me in congratulating the team at Philip Lublin Diesel Repair Limited as they celebrate 50 years in operation and wishing them continued success. Merci. I recognize the honourable member for Halifax Citadel Sable Island. Madam Speaker, I rise today to honour the staff, volunteers and board members at the Dartmouth SPCA. It takes a village to raise a kitten or a senior dog or a bunny or a guinea pig. These are just some of the critters that I saw this morning as I visited the SPCA shelter to pick up our latest foster kitten, Scoot. She's black and white and full of purrs and will be looking for her forever home in about two weeks. Madam Speaker, it's the tail end. It. See what I did there? Of kitten season for 2023, but you can always find someone to love at the SPCA. <laughs> I recognize the honorable member for Guysboro Trackity. Thank you, Madam <laughs> Speaker. I rise today to congratulate the business partners of the Crazy Daisy on their recent purchase of the flower shop in Guysboro. Following the retirement of the previous owner, Rose Fitzgerald, who I recognized the other day in my member statement, new business partners and sisters Catherine Nickerson and Melanie Newell, along with Melanie's husband, Neil, purchased the former Rose's Gardens of Gifts in May. They were looking for a new business venture and knew that this is the one, this is one that was well utilized and loved in our area. They took a few weeks to paint the walls, make some decorative changes and put up a new sign. Then Crazy Daisy opened its doors June 5th. That would have been their late father's 75th birthday. Just in time for prom, graduation and wedding season, they have been busy ever since. Residents from Guysboro to Canso and all points in between are grateful that another local family is choosing to stay here and keep this important business open. It is a place for local crafters and artists to also sell their products and of course for residents to purchase their beautiful floral arrangements. Madam Speaker, I ask you to join me in congratulating the Crazy Daisy Flower Shop and wish them many years of success ahead. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Bedford Basin. Madam Speaker, I would like to share some uh, special recent birthday wishes for a longtime Bedford resident. I'd like to congratulate Bedford historian, photographer, and volunteer extraordinaire Lou Turner on turning 95 in September. Lou is a special Bedford resident who's been serving his community ever since he was a teenager and joined the Bedford Volunteer Fire Department. And, uh, just this past week, he was up at the crack of dawn uh, sharing photographs of Bedford Basin at sunrise. Lou is a font of information on all things Bedford. After the July flooding, we met up at Fish Hatchery Park where I was looking at some of the damage, and uh, he noted that some of the floods had exposed some historical fish pens. Lou knew all about them and shared his knowledge with me. Lou remains a valuable resource about Bedford history, and I plan on sharing another birthday certificate with him next year. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to congratulate Katie, Mick and Callum Leahy on the birth of Connor Alexander. On August 16th, Connor came into the world to the delight of everyone. We are a close-knit group of friends. We consider each other family. And welcoming another member into our group this summer was exciting. Congratulations to Callum on becoming a big brother and to Katie and Mick on the birth of, on the birth of Connor. I ask the House join me in congratulating the Leahy family on becoming a family of four. I recognize the Honourable Member for Colchester North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise to congratulate Priscilla and Eric Jennings on their 60th wedding anniversary. I would also like to wish Eric a happy 84th birthday, which he celebrated on October 18th. This couple, who live and work together, are the original owners of Mastown Market. Back in 1969, Eric, who was a farmer, started a fruit and vegetable stand to make extra money for his family. Madam Speaker, this, this couple have spent five decades of their marriage building this business from a fruit stand to a thriving family business. Madam Speaker, this business has grown into a complex which includes groceries, a Nova Scotia Liquor Commission boutique, giftware, a fully stocked garden centre. And over the years, Eric and his family have added a butcher shop, a creamery calf, the peg, a Mastown Lighthouse Wharf and fish boat, a petrocan, 
at Tim Hortons in an office building which I happen to house my constituency office. Madam Speaker, Eric and Priscilla Jennings have built their reputation around great service and fresh local foods. Not only do they employ local residents, but they also promote local products. This business is a real asset to Masstown and the surrounding area. I thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honourable member for Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to pay tribute to the late, great uh, Bruce Guthrow. Uh, he's Cape Bretoner, born and raised, but uh, moved to Hammonds Plains and raised his family uh, in a subdivision called Highland Park, later moved to Kingswood. Um, I just want to express my condolences to uh, his wife, Kim, his, his son and daughter, uh, Jody and Dylan, who are carrying on, who carry on his tradition of Bruce Guthrow's songwriter circle. Uh, he was recently named, uh, very appropriately, an Order of Nova Scotia rep, uh, recipient. And uh, with the permission of the House, I, I, I beg leave for a, a moment of silence in his honour. Moment of silence. Please stand. Please be seated. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. I just want to make a quick introduction as my member taking the time for member statement. Ma Madam Speaker, uh, in the gallery opposite, uh, we have Riley Shannon. And Riley Shannon is here this weekend to do training with Nova Scotia New Democrats on how to defeat Conservatives, having just done so in the Manitoba election. Uh, so Riley's visiting us from Manitoba. I'd like uh, everyone in the House to give him a warm welcome, even if it's difficult for some people. Uh, and uh, also with Riley is Dave Etherington, who's our trusted organizer in the uh, NDP caucus office. Uh, welcome to both of you. Thank you. Welcome to the House. Order. Uh, the time now is for oral questions put by members to ministers. The time is 2 o'clock. We will finish at 2.50, and I recognize the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we had below temperatures last night. On the way to work today, I saw many uh, tents that people were still living in. Yesterday in the scrum, on this issue, the Premier said that there were many shelter beds in Halifax. I'd ask the Premier, how many shelter beds is he aware of that are currently available and where are they located? I recognize the Honourable Premier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'll ask the Minister for Community Services to respond. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Community Services. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And to the member opposite, there are 296 shelter beds located in Nova Scotia. A total. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the leader of the official opposition. Uh, Madam Speaker, the question is, with all of the homeless folks in, your, in, in Halifax right now that are still living in tents with below uh, freezing temperatures, how many shelter beds are available for those people that are currently on the streets? I recognize the Honourable Premier. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and the, this is like this is an important question that the member that the member raises. We know the we're concerned about the homelessness, people living rough for sure. We see them, uh, we see that happening in in Halifax. We see that happening in many communities across the province. We see that happening in many communities across the country. It is it is it is it is a challenge of our time for sure. Uh, that is why the minister uh, through through the department and their leadership working with 
nonprofit organizations working with municipalities are making significant investments, not only in shelter, but wraparound services to make sure we can support Nova Scotians uh, as best as possible and meet the need where they are. But the need is significant. There's no question about that. We'll continue to make investments to support Nova Scotians. I recognize the leader of the official opposition on his final supplementary. Madam Speaker, I think if the government was taking this issue seriously, they could tell us what the inventory is on beds that are available in the city while people desperately need them if they were taking this issue seriously. When asked yesterday, the Premier said that there are going to be people living throughout the winter in tents. He said that in the scrum yesterday. And I wonder if the government had actually moved this summer when the red flags were being waved, when the alarm bells were being rung, that homelessness had doubled, instead of trying to brush that issue under the rug and downplay it, if we'd be in a better position today. It took nine weeks to order those shelters. Does the Premier recognize that had he ordered those shelters in the summer, we'd have those shelters available for people who need them tonight. I recognize the Honourable Premier. Thank you, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'm not uh, quite sure of the, the members, uh, uh, how the member defines brushing th things under the rugs, but uh, what I would say to the members, this government, uh, for the first time in 30 years, invested in affordable units, 222 of those. <laughs> That didn't happen five years ago, it didn't happen 10 years ago, it didn't happen 20 years ago, it didn't happen 25 years It happened now, under this government. We will continue to invest in Nova Scotians. That's why we are seeing uh, more, more affordable housing development happening across the province with the leadership of this government. That's why we will continue uh, to, to invest in, in Nova Scotians to make sure that they have not only safe, uh, affordable housing, but also supports uh, as, as are needed. But we'll, we'll continue to invest in Nova Scotians, Madam Speaker because that's what this government does. Gets to work supporting Nova Scotians. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I want to ask the Premier about the state of Nova Scotia emergency rooms. Freedom of information data released to our caucus shows that there have been more deaths in emergency rooms in the last nine months than there were the entire previous year or the five years before that. This government is failing to address a crisis in our emergency rooms and it's resulting in more deaths. As a Halifax infirmary staff person said in the paper yesterday, quote, the crisis is constant, unquote. What is the government doing to deal with the constant crisis in our emergency rooms? I recognize the Honourable Premier. Madam Speaker, and we all want the best possible outcomes for, for Nova Scotians when they visit an emergency department, but the very nature of an emergency department uh, means that the, the reality is that not everyone who goes to an emergency room can be saved. That's why they're emergency departments. So we, we will continue uh, to, to work to support those working in healthcare. I know the minister was at the infirmary uh, yesterday morning, I think, at that time, uh, this morning. At that time, uh, there was two people in the waiting room and zero offloads waiting to happen. Uh, I know the, the team at the infirmary has been innovative on the way that they're coming up with suggestions on how to help support Nova Scotians that are, that are arriving there. But we all want the best outcomes uh, for Nova Scotians. And I think uh, what, I, what I would encourage the member uh, opposite is to share the full information, uh, not just little snippets out of context. I recognize the Honourable Leader for the uh, New Democratic Party. Here's some information that's not an anecdotal story. Yes. On Monday of this week, the Halifax Infirmary score in the National Emergency Department overcrowding scale was 354, which according to a hospital staff member is disaster. It's been in disaster mode for months. Rural ERs are closed, people don't have a family doctor, and people are arriving at our ERs sicker and sicker. More deaths in the first nine months of this year than in the entire last year and the five before that. While the Premier fails to make improvements in ER wait times, people are dying. When is this government going to do something for the people waiting and waiting in emergency rooms? I recognize the Honourable Premier. But Madam Speaker, and we, ha we have issues in health care, there's no question, and, and our emergency departments often feel the brunt of that. Uh, there's no question about that, and that is where people should go when they're, when they're extremely sick. There are also other situations where maybe another course of access uh, to, to care is more appropriate. That's why we've opened up so many channels. The, the pharmacy clinics are getting national recognition. You might not hear it opposite, Madam Speaker, but nationally getting recognition. The mobile clinics, national recognition. Just yesterday, Madam Speaker, I'm so proud of the minister and the team. They launched an app. It was the fourth most downloaded app in the country, I believe, yesterday. 
the purpose, the purpose of the app is to get people to the appropriate care at the appropriate time. Appropriate care is often an emergency department, but not always. I recognize De the honorable leader for the new Democratic Party. The numbers don't lie. Spin doesn't work here. That app was pushed to every, every government phone in Nova Scotia. So let's see who actually downloaded it and, who's, and on whose phone it showed up on. Madam Speaker, the Freedom of Information data shows that it's not just the number of people who are dying, it's the proportion of people dying in emergency rooms that's growing. As a hospital staff member said, people die in the ambulance hallway. On a Monday at 4 p.m., there are nine in the ambulance hallway. The patient who has waited the longest has waited 113 hours and 39 minutes, and I'll table that. How much longer will people have to wait before this government does something not about apps, not about pharmacy clinics, about the crisis in our emergency room? The Honourable Premier. Madam Speaker, all of these things are interrelated. There is no one single solution. That's why they're all important. And I will say, I would just encourage the member to, to share the full, the full information. The proportion, obviously our population is growing. Obviously our, our population is aging. Of course, when you have more people, more aged, you have more visits. But when you look at the proportion, the proportions are, are steady. And of course, the member is, 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 is making comparisons over a period of time, which included COVID, where emergency departments were often closed. There was an incredibly sharp decline during that period of time. So everything is relative, Madam Speaker. But the work that is being done by this government under that minister is leading the country in fixing out there. The, the, the honourable leader of the official opposition. Uh, Ma Madam Speaker, the Premier asked what, what I mean by brushing things under the rug. I think we have another example of it. Where we've got opposition parties that are talking about homeless people that are living in jeopardy. We have an increased death rate in our emergency rooms. And what's the Premier focused on? Getting national attention on a new app. Does that not sound like brushing this under the rug? Brushing it under the rug is when you're told the homeless rate is doubling in the province and you say, oh, it's summer. More people go outside and camp in the summer. That's brushing it under the rug. How many shelter beds are available now for people that are homeless? The, the Premier can't even answer the question. I recognize the Honourable Mem uh, Men Minister sorry, for Community Services. Thank, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. And, and we know homelessness is certainly impacting uh, you know, people in Nova Scotia, people across Canada, and certainly we have been very diligent in our work. We've been working very hard as a department for many months to secure, uh, you know, shelter shelter locations. Um, just just as a, as an aside, Madam Speaker, um, over the last two years, um, supports were increased by 8.2 million dollars this year for homelessness to bring the budget to a total of 18 million dollars, which is a 261 percent increase over the last two years, Madam Speaker. <laughs> We, we know there's more work to do, Madam Speaker, and we're going to continue to do what we can to certainly support our most vulnerable and those people who are experiencing homelessness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The leader of the official opposition. Do you want another example of brushing something under the rug? When we're talking about real people living in tents and freezing cold weather, the minister points to budget items. That's brushing it under the rug. The Premier, the Minister stood up and they're telling us there's hundreds of beds available. There's many more available here in Halifax when people need them with temperatures dropping. They can't point to any single amount that are actually available right now. Will the Premier please stand up and tell people in this House and beyond how many shelter beds are available tonight for people who need them? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Community Services. Th thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. And we, we sense the urgency. We feel the urgency, Madam Speaker. We've been working very hard as a department over the last two years to support people who are experiencing homelessness. As I mentioned, Madam Speaker, there are, there are 296 shelter units in the province. Our government has also created 417 supportive housing units over the last two years, Madam Speaker. <laughs> That's, that is 71% of all uh, supportive housing units in the province, Madam Speaker, in just the last two years. 
What I would also say, Madam Speaker, is um, through the supports that we have done as, a, as a, a government over the last two years, it is recognized that it's a roughly 747 people are not experiencing homelessness at this time c compared to what was going on over two years ago, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honourable member for Sydney, member two. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as we know, winter is here. Yesterday it snowed, the temperatures were below freezing, and the weather is just going to get worse while a thousand people in the HRM alone are experiencing homelessness. Yet we have not been able to get an answer from this government where these newly promised shelters will be. To the Minister of DCS, does he know where the sh new shelters are going yet? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Community Services. Th thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member uh, opposite for the question. And as, as I've been saying, we, we feel the urgency. We, we, we recognize winter is close. We've been working very hard as a department to make sure we could uh, support certainly people experiencing homelessness. We announced uh, recently three shelters, uh, one in Bridgewater, one in Amherst. Uh, the one in Amherst has been open since early October. The one in Bridgewater will be opening November 15th. We also have a shelter uh, that we have secured here uh, in HRM. We are continuing to do the due diligence right now, Madam Speaker, to make sure that that, that, um, that location is safe and has the inspections it needs. And I'm very, I will be very happy to announce that when, when, when we can, Madam Speaker. So thank you. Recognize the honourable member for Sydney, member two. Th thank you, Madam Speaker. And the challenges they shouldn't—they should have been announced already. They should have been announced months ago. And again, I'm going to ask this question again. This is the third time that I'm going to ask this question uh, to the Minister of DCS. People are experiencing homelessness all over this province. Uh, we talk a lot about HRM because it is a huge issue, but it is happening, Madam Speaker, as you know and as we all know, in communities across Nova Scotia. And I've asked this question twice already of the 100 shelters, uh, the, 100, the 100 beds and the, and the shelters that are going to be located outside of HRM. Uh, I, I'm going to ask this question again to the minister. Can he, for the third time, can he, can he please tell this host where the shelters are going to be located in Cape Breton? The Honourable Minister for Community Services. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. And, and certainly, we, we, uh, we, we do feel the urgency. We do have those shelters on order, those pallet shelters, 100 for here in HRM and 100 for across the rest of Nova Scotia. We've been having conversations with service providers, as municipalities as well. Uh, there was conversations with CBRM just this week. Uh, as well as um, uh, as well as the uh, uh, service providers there, we are working very diligently to to secure those locations for those pallet shelters. And as soon as we can, we certainly will let let the member and others know where those locations will be. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honourable member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On Tuesday, I asked the Minister of Justice if he could provide an update on how many more cases are being stayed due to Jordan applications above and beyond the 15, which is already an all-time high, reported in the summer. I'd like to give the opportunity to the Minister of Justice to report back to the House, as he didn't know at the time. Two days later, I'd like to know how many more cases since the summer have been dropped because of Jordan applications. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Justice. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And I don't have that number yet before me, but I will get it to the member as with the other other uh, times I've reported back, I'll bring it back to the House. The Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Madam Speaker, the answer is five. Five more cases since the summer have been reported as dropped. Out of 28 Jordan applications filed as of October 10th, and that was reported, that's public, that's in the, in the media, I'll table that. That's, that's an astounding number. Never has there been more than four before 2021 in a full year, and we're talking about a couple of months, five more cases being dropped. Madam Speaker, this is a serious issue. We know we need over 40 new crowns. His own department is asking for that. Talking about sweeping issues under the rug. This is a matter that requires serious immediate attention. Is it the contention of this government that they are going to sweep this issue to the rug to the next budget season, or are they going to act now? Here, here. The Honourable 
Minister of Justice. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And as I think I said in the House before, uh, we did ask uh, the Public Prosecution Services Director to give us a report on uh, the needs in uh, Public Prosecution Services. We do have that report. We're analyzing that report. We do see some uh, discrepancies in the numbers from what's there, but uh, we are looking at uh, uh, potentially uh, looking at going to per diem, uh, getting some per diem crowns and other things to get that uh, backlog ca caught up. So we'll continue to work on that. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, the Premier told reporters that it is a sad fact that people will be living in tents all winter. If this is a fact, it is only because this government has decided it to be. This government has had ample time to prepare for the inevitability of winter, but have failed to do so. Madam Speaker, this is Nova Scotia. Yesterday, well, this morning was negative two degrees. Tomorrow will be zero. We know when winter comes. Why is this government refusing to ensure all Nova Scotians have a roof over their head this winter? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Community Services. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. And, and certainly, we, we have sensed the urgency. We feel the urgency. This, this department has been working very hard over the last two years to support people experiencing homelessness and, and living rough. And, and I would say, you know, we, we, we have secured, like I said, a, a location here in HRM. We have two uh, shelters uh, in rural Nova Scotia as well to support certainly um, people who are experiencing homelessness. We know there's more work to do, Madam Speaker, and we'll continue to do what we can to support people who are living, living rough or experiencing homelessness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And if urgency means a year or two waiting, well, that's really not that urgent. Just this past summer, the former Minister of Community Services said that people living in tents was a natural evolution of summertime. And now again, this government is showing that they are content to leave our neighbours out in the cold. An outreach worker with Out of the Cold Community Association warned last winter that the ground is cold, the ground is frozen. I know folks here that have lost their limbs, that have lost their toes. I'm worried that we're going to see loss of life. I'm worried that we're going to see loss of limbs. Does the Premier think that potential loss of life and limbs is also just a sad fact? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Community Services. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. And, and we, again, we know that everybody deserves a safe place to live, and, and we are working very hard as a department and as a government to support certainly our most vulnerable. We continue to look at options for people, and, and like I've mentioned before, the pallet shelters that, that are coming, there's 200 for across the province, 100 here in HRM, and 100 uh, across the rest of Nova Scotia. We know there's more work to do, Madam Speaker, and we're going to do what we can certainly to support people who are experiencing homelessness and living rough. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, this government promised a better paycheck for Nova Scotians working in the private sector during the 2021 campaign. It was the front of the platform and it was all over signs across the province. Another illusion of action. The, for the last two years, we have been asking this government where their better paycheck guarantee is. Finally, after two years, an answer is given. The ba better paycheck guarantee is not coming. My question to the Minister of Finance, why did it take this government two years to let Nova Scotians know that they never planned to do this promise? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, because we've been spending a lot of money on health care to fix the health care system. Uh, and I've made that clear all the way through when these questions were asked, uh, our focus as a government has been fixing health care. That's something that's going to benefit every Nova Scotian uh, whenever they might need it. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. 
Talk about an illusion of action, Madam Speaker. We just saw another $10 million app, which is the illusion of fixing health care when every metric is getting worse under this government. When the Premier announced ahead of the 2021 provincial election campaign, he said the program would see corporations get a 50 percent of their corporate taxes in exchange for returning to workers in the less at the top 20 percent. We've been saying for two years that this would never happen. The Premier said it would happen on day one. I'll table this information. My question to the Minister of Finance is what will this government and when will this government put money in the hands of everyday Nova Scotians? The Honourable Minister for Finance. Well, Madam Speaker, I don't know if the member opposite has missed it, but we've put more money in the pockets of many people. I think about uh, CCA, 23% pay rates. I think about young Nova Scotians who are in trades, in, in occupations we need right now, who are helping to address the many things that are being raised in question period. And I think of one thing that's critical, which is housing. The more young people we have in this province getting into the trades with that incentive to be forgiven their provincial income tax, Madam Speaker, the more success we're going to have building the housing that we need for people. So, Madam Speaker, there's all kinds of people who have had better paychecks. I will also point out under my own portfolio of labour relations, mm -hmm. the last government never wanted to go to the collective bargaining table. They used to try to do their deals here in the legislature. <laughs> we're open to going to the table and people are getting better paychecks because of it. <laughs> I recognize the Honourable Member for Northside Westmount on a new question. Madam Speaker, we hear from the Minister of Finance another illusion of action. He doing things that were not included in their election platform, picking winners and losers, this is not the way to govern. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, the economic plan from this government's platform is based on two key prompt programs, the Better Paycheck Guarantee and Nova Scotia Loyal. Uh, Ms. Madam Speaker, the Premier admitted to what he's been saying all along, the campaign promise is not going to happen, which I'll table. Another summer has gone by with an illusion of action of wrapped trucks paraded around the province, but no point anywhere to be found, Madam Speaker. My question to the Minister of Economic Development, will a minister admit to the province right now that this program, like the Better Paycheck, Better Paycheck Guarantee, is not going to happen? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Finance. Madam Speaker, uh, the members talk about illusion. It makes me, he talks about it so much, it makes me wonder if he might be a fan of uh, Use Your Illusion, that album by Guns N' Roses. I can tell you, uh, Madam Speaker, picking winners and losers. Think about that for a moment, Madam Speaker. We're, we're picking targeted supports for those who are most in need. We're picking uh, groups of people working in the health care system that are essential to the health care system functioning. And I think particularly about continuing care assistance. We're choosing them, Madam Speaker. We're choosing young people because we need more of them to help with our labour shortages. So the member can suggest it's picking winners and losers. We're picking the people who are most in need and the people we need to help us move the province forward. I recognize the honourable member for West Mount, uh, sorry, for Northside West Mount. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to thank the uh, minister for that non-answer of the question. Um, what he's essentially saying, the minister is essentially saying, is that Nova Scotians who are working hard every day shouldn't be targeted with some sort of benefit that was promised to them, that they may have voted for because it was promised to them, and now they're not going to receive. Instead, we're spending thousands of hundreds of thousands of dollars on wrapped trucks, Madam Speaker, creating the illusion that Nova Scotians are going to benefit for this program. My question is, when will Nova Scotians see the benefit of the Nova Scotia Loyal Program, or will it go by the wayside with a better paycheck guarantee? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Economic Development. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I've stood in this house before and explained that actually Nova Scotia Loyal was an entire section of our platform. It encompasses an across-government approach, which includes a commitment as government, as a purchaser, to spending our dollars... Order. Order. Please. There's too much chatter. 
The member, the Minister of Economic Development has the floor. Thank you, Madam Speaker, which includes leveraging our own purchasing power, becoming very well acquainted with the realities of uh, both that purchasing power and the limitations and nuances of trade agreements. And I would point to an amendment that was put on the floor the other evening on uh, a bill that looked to uh, sole source to Nova Scotia a particular apparatus, and that would have engaged in a trade war. We are being very mindful of those opportunities. I recognize the honourable member for Bedford Basin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This government has totally dropped the ball on the QE2 redevelopment project and has not been transparent with Nova Scotians on the status of the project. In May, the government announced they were going to, quote, build more faster, end quote, but in reality, we've seen less slower. The government was supposed to tear down the parkade this summer as the first step, but then in the fall they hit pause on their so-called faster plan. In October, the minister said they are, uh, quote, designing like hell, which I will table, but Madam Speaker, we have seen no idea if these designs will ever come to fruition. My question is to the Minister of Health Redevelopment, what is the current status, status of the QE2 redevelopment project and when will it be completed? I recognize the Honourable Minister for, responsible for health redevelopment. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'm surprised that an illusion wasn't presented by the members opposite because he frequently referenced to this project as being delivered on a silver platter, Madam Speaker, but at best it was delivered in a strainer. Uh, we recognize that since day one, Madam Speaker. We are focused on moving this project in the right direction, a project that meets the health care needs of tomorrow and today, Madam Speaker, which the former plan failed to do, a plan that the former uh, the former Minister of Health uh, tried to deliver would not be able to be delivered by uh, the construction industry, Madam Speaker. We recognize this is the biggest health care project, uh, infrastructure project in our province's history. It is complex, Madam Speaker, and we recognize that the foundation of this project, that we uh, are a new plan, Madam Speaker, is more beds, something again that the member opposite failed to do. I recognize the Honourable Member for Bedford Basin. In fact, Madam Speaker, the only new build that's on time and on on budget under the QE2 redevelopment is the Bears Lake output, uh, Outpatient Centre, and that's because it wasn't started under that government. It's opening in a month. In the interim, at the infirmary, they're having to use a conference room for emergency patients to help relieve some of the pressures. We need the new hospital for patients and health care workers alike, and under the previous plan, the VG would have been torn down by the end of last year. My question is to the minister. Now that we're nearing the end of 2023, will patients and health care workers ever be able to get out of the VG for good? I recognize the Honourable Minister responsible for health um, development. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And again, I'll remind uh, the members of this House uh, of our plan, uh, again, that, would, that is focused on delivering the most acute needs of our health care system. More beds. Beds, beds, beds. We need improved access and flow in our health care system, Madam Speaker. We need to actually be able to deliver a project, Madam Speaker. Again, uh, more OR capacity, Madam Speaker. The member opposite referenced ER capacity, Madam Speaker. That's why ER, a new EDR for the HI is included, in fact, in our, in our plan, Madam Speaker. Again, uh, before you start digging holes and building something, Madam Speaker, you need to have a plan. You need to have a design. And that's why, and that's why Madam Speaker, 2023 was always slated to be a, a design year, Madam Speaker. I guess the lack of awareness from the the members opposite on how to design something probably clearly outlines why they didn't uh, uh, build or design any affordable housing use in their tenure. I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton Center, Whitney Pierre. Madam Speaker, my question is for the Premier. During the last general election, he made a distinct promise to the people of Nova Scotia. He said, quote, I would double the payments to municipalities that the province pays as a show of good faith, end quote. People voted for him based on this promise of much needed investment in roads, water, infrastructure, recreation, snow clearing, emergency management, solid waste, and so many other essential services provided by frontline municipalities. Why has the Premier broken this promise? 
I recognize the Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. So, Madam Speaker, uh, that doubling did happen through our department. The first year we doubled that. The uh, CBRM chose to use it for a tax break to Walmart. And uh, we, uh, we in, in fact, in the last uh, eight years, uh, if you think about the eight years prior, there was no extra money given to uh, CBRM, but through uh, through our actions, we the next year we gave them an extra three million dollars. This year, we've stood up another a program, so uh, we continue to be more generous than we saw in the previous eight years. And I, I don't have the memory to go back to the previous 12 years, but I have no doubt it was very little different. Maybe it was, I don't know. But uh, we we continue to do more for our municipalities than's ever been done before. The honourable member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pier. Let's remind the minister of the facts. It was going to be through the whole. The payments were going to be doubled during the whole time of the agreement was being um, re negotiated, and it was a one-time payment only. Promise, a promise broken? I think so. Not only is the premier breaking promises, he's pitting communities against each other in the process. The minister of municipal affairs and housing refused to apologize to the people of Cape Breton particularly the CBRM, for his unprofessional and disrespectful conduct when he sent a letter to the municipal administrators making them, asking them to lobby the CBRM to accept a raw deal this government has put on the table. So I'd ask the Premier to explain to the people of the CBRM why he has thrown them under the bus. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. So, Madam Speaker, I uh, disre uh, disagree with the premise of the question all altogether. We have done more for the people of CBRM than any other government. They only have to look around at all the projects going on. There's the uh, uh, Tartan Downs, there's the investments in CBRM and health care. We continue to do more. We've done more through that municipal financial capacity grant than any other, peop any other government. This current uh, version of it is is, is good for the people of CBRM. So my, my message to the people of CBRM is there's for the first time in a generation there's hope in CBRM. We see things changing, turning around, and we want to be part of that hope. Our message to the people of CBRM is we care about them. We're working hard for them. I recognize the honourable member for Bedford South. Uh, thank you. Madam Speaker, we learned yesterday that the province held 12 public engagement sessions across the province to discuss the serious issues around the lack of childcare availability. How many of those sessions were held in HRM, you might ask? One. And that meeting was by invitation only, so not very public. Does the minister think this is enough for the many parents in HRM who are waiting for childcare spaces with little to no hope? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. So as we engage in a five-year transformational journey to build child care that meets the needs of all Nova Scotians across our entire province, we have multiple opportunities for engagement across the province so that we fully understand what all Nova Scotians need. I'm very excited that we did uh, just recently undergo one phase of this engagement, and that included sessions across the province in HRM and beyond. And the focus of that session was small, intimate sessions to hear directly from families about their specific needs and very targeted needs. We wanted to hear about the needs of newcomers, so we had targeted sessions to focus on that. We wanted to hear about the needs of uh, places that have seasonal employment. We had targeted sessions focused on that. We've heard from HRM and we'll continue to hear from HRM and all Nova Scotians about the needs of child. The Honourable uh, Member for Bedford South. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As you would expect, uh, media wanted to cover these important meetings. But guess what? According to the CBC, they were told by the department they could only attend if they signed a confidentiality agreement for the media. Does the minister think asking media to sign NDAs is a way to inspire confidence in how this government is managing the child care problem in this province? Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. So I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to this because the sessions that we just recently held 
were intimate sessions where we invited families, parents, and caregivers in to speak about very personal needs, to speak about the medical needs of their children, to speak about their financial issues. These were small sessions, and we wanted people to feel comfortable and safe in an intimate environment. And that is not something that is going to be um, fostered by having cameras in their face. We absolutely um, indicated to the media that we would provide all the information around what was being asked and discussed in the sessions, and we'll be reporting back to the media on what took place. Um, but those kinds of sessions, those are the sorts of things that we need to have intimately done, and that's how we were doing them, respecting the privacy and confidentiality, uh, I recognize confidentiality of the, the family. Honourable member for Sydney, member two. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, people in Sydney are feeling the impacts of the housing crisis. A story that came out this week talked about the McIntyre family, a 69-year-old woman, Margie, and her 45-year-old daughter, Charlene, who was also her caregiver, are unable to find a new place to rent after their current rental is being sold. The family has been looking for two and a half months to find a new place to stay with no luck. Charlene said out of, out of, out of desperation, she went to view what she thought was a one-room apartment in the north end of Sydney. The cost was 1500 and Charlene said it was a room with a kitchenette built into the bathroom and a table. My question to the Minister of Housing, where are the supports for families like the McIntyres who can't find a place to rent in Cape Town? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Municipal Affairs and Housing. So, Madam Speaker, thank you uh, for the, uh, to the member for the question. And I, I do want to express my sympathy not only for that family, but we know that that story uh, can be repeated in other parts of the province. The, the uh, Drake report, the housing needs assessment, tells us there's a tremendous need across the province. The only real solution to that problem is to uh, Build more supply. That's the reality. If we don't have more houses, we can't. We can't. Uh, we the only. That's the only way. And the report tells us that 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 is the only way out of this problem. Uh, and we're working hard on that. And I would uh, suggest that that uh, the member contact our. You know, I don't know if they're eligible for uh, some of our programs. But certainly, I'd encourage the member to reach out on their behalf. I recognize the Honourable Member for Sydney, Member 2. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and we will do that. Uh, uh, I appreciate the comments from the Minister. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, Charlene said she feels at a disadvantage looking for rentals because it feels as if the units are going to a person who shows up with cash in hand for more than just a half month's rent for the, for the damage deposit, which I'll also table. They also had to fight with the Residential Tenancies Board over being given less than two months' notice <laughs> that the place had been sold and they needed to vacate the home. Madam Speaker, if the government would create a residential tenancies enforcement unit that both tenants and landlords want, there would be fewer illegal practices that are hurting families like the McIntyres in Cape Breton. My question to the Minister of Service Nova Scotia, why won't they create a residential tenancy enforcement unit so less families are disadvantaged when trying to find a place to live? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Service Nova Scotia. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I certainly echo uh, the comments from my colleague, the Minister, Minister of, of Housing, uh, and certainly to, to the family impacted in this particular situation. Again, there are there are rules, Madam Speaker, pertaining to uh, pertaining to the uh, selling of properties, Madam Speaker. And again, uh, encourage uh, members to share those guidebooks, and we can redistribute those to, to members, Madam Speaker. Uh, and again, what I'd say is is the creation of a compliance enforcement uh, division is complex. Understanding, yes, that there is calls from both sides for this for the creation of it. However, I'd caution that it is not going to be the silver bullet to the housing crisis, Madam Speaker. What we need here is more supply, more places that Nova Scotians can call home. I recognize the Honourable Member for Col uh, Cumberland North. Madam Speaker, uh, my question is for the Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, the, we are continuing to see deterioration of the once world-renowned ambulance service in Nova Scotia. When people are calling 911, they are often left waiting hours before an ambulance arrives. Cumberland County in particular is being left without any ambulances in the entire county weekly. Despite ambulances supposed to be based in both Amherst, Pugwash, Oxford, Spring Hill and Parsbro. Last weekend, once again, no ambulances were available Friday night, leaving a woman in a life-threatening situation for over three hours. Can the minister explain why the government is leaving the people of Cumberland County without any 
access to emergency ambulance services. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank the member for the question. So certainly um, the days of having an ambulance base where people are solely uh, stationed is not really the case anymore. We need to have a system status plan. So as we know, there are a number of calls across the province that are triaged by our very capable paramedics and dispatchers in this province. So we should expect as Nova Scotians that there will be movement amongst ambulances across this province in order to have paramedics respond to emergencies. So we have created a number of different initiatives. We do recently, uh, we recently implemented the, uh, the uh, transfer flight, which has uh, allowed 1,300 hours back into Grand Ambulance, uh, Madam Speaker. So we are looking at a number of different ways. We're looking at a number of different models, and I can assure the member opposite that we have a wonderful team that's working very hard in order to deliver emergency services to this province. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I would like to highlight the fact that when some of these plans are being made to improve emergency ambulance services, we're not actually seeing any improvement in Cumberland County at all. And I don't know if the rest of the province is the same. Uh, even this uh, latest uh, flight, it's between Amherst and Cape Breton, or sorry, Yarmouth and Cape Breton. Northern Nova Scotia is left completely out of that planning. And Cumberland County uh, didn't have any, uh, all of northern Nova Scotia, no community pharmacy clinics, no public housing. We are seeing a downgrade in the Pugwash Hospital, despite a new hospital being built. And we are seeing every week continued times when there are zero Question. ambulances in all of Cumberland County. Question. The people of Cumberland deserve an answer. Why are they being left behind and not provided the adequate health care? Minister system? for Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I can see privilege prevails with half facts. So I will say, in terms of the, uh, the the clinics that were available to the pharmacy, there was actually a provider, but due to an issue with the pharmacy, they were unable to continue. We're working very hard to find a new provider, and we want to support them. Uh, there has been a number of initiatives across this province. We are not leaving anybody behind. To the to the person member's point, that's the whole thing about a system status plan. 1,300 hours back into a ground ambulance system is not nothing, and it benefits every single Nova Scotian in this province. So I understand understand that it is a complex uh, system and it is difficult to understand, but I can assure the member opposite that we are working very hard in this province to deliver health care to every single Nova Scotian. I have Bendy. I have you guys. No? Okay. I must. All right. I recognize the honourable member for Coal Harbour. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We know that there are barriers for marginalized people trying to access supports. As Feed Nova Scotia outlined, the highest percentage of individuals living in food insecure households in 2022 was found among black people at 40 percent and indigenous peoples at 33 percent. I'll table that. My question to the Minister of African Nova Scotian Affairs. How are we ensuring that we are increasing supports for African Nova Scotians and Indigenous peoples who are facing food insecurity? I recognize the Honourable Minister for African Nova Scotia Affairs. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you uh, to the member opposite for the question. With regards to, I'll speak with regards to what we're doing with regards to um, food insecurities for the African Nova Scotian community. The Department of Community Services has invested money into my area, which is Preston. It's called the Preston Area Food Network. There's a huge network that's open, and it's open in the three communities of Cherry Brook, North Preston, East Preston, and members in the community who need that service, who need that facility, are able to go and to gain access to requirements and food item items every week. Thank you. I recognize the honorable member for Coal Harbor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We need to ensure that ec an equity framework is being used effectively in supporting and expanding our support services. However, 
there is a disproportionate amount of marginalized folks going to food banks and they are facing food insecurity. My question to the Minister of Community Services, how is the government using an equitable lens when providing income supports to Nova Scotians? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Community Services. Thank, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member for, for the question. And, and certainly within our department, we recognize the importance of, of working with you know, diversity and equity and, and, and supporting people who are marginalized. And, and certainly, my, the, you know, the, my colleague had mentioned kind of the collaborative uh, food networks that uh, we have across the province. We have three pilots across the province where $200,000 was given to three different communities, one of those communities being the Preston Township, another one being Escazoni in Cape Breton, and another one in Cumberland. So we've been working hard to make sure that we're identifying what are the challenges there in those, in, in those communities and certainly trying to support those communities through these types of initiatives where we, we, we work within the community and the service providers within those communities. So thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Dartmouth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. One way the government could provide more transparency is by enforcing pay equity and transparency. There is a broader global trend to use transparency in pay practices to try to close the wage gaps that persist still for women and other equity-seeking groups. This is the law at the federal level. It is the law in PEI in Newfoundland and in BC. It is also the law in multiple states and in the European Union. So my question to the Minister of Labour, will the government follow suit with other provinces to enforce pay equity and transparency? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Labour, Skills and Immigration. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member for raising this really important question. Madam Speaker, newly appointed to the, office, or the Council of the Status of Women, I'm really excited to be able to engage with the community partners to be able to dive in to understand this more. We know that it is such an important issue that women need to be able to feel that they are seen and heard in very important leadership roles, not only nationally, but of course right here in Nova Scotia. So I would look forward to working with the member. I know the member will have some ideas and wonderful input to be able to add to that conversation. It's important work and it's stuff that we will be committed to doing. Good job. I recognize the honorable member for Coal Harbor Dartmouth. And I thank the minister for that response. That's what I was hoping, and I look forward to working with her in that regard. Because um, at the end of the day, pay equity is very important for women. Because we've had a lot of talk today about uh, sweeping things under the rug. We know which gender actually cleans under the rug. Is there a question? <laughs> I recognize the Honourable Member for King South. Madam Speaker, why is the Premier unprepared to table legislation to give the Privacy Commissioner order-making authority? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Justice. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. I'm not the Premier, but I will answer the question. Uh, I didn't say, or uh, I don't think we said we will or we wouldn't. Uh, what we are in the process of doing is we're uh, doing a fulsome review right now, and uh, so we'll see what comes back and whether or not that's a recommendation. So thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. I recognize the member for uh, King South. The Premier said we are, quote, we are going to work with the Privacy Commissioner to make sure the property authority is there so that Nova Scotians have access to the information that they rightly should have access to. He went on to say, I just haven't focused on it, to be honest, and maybe that's my fault. I'll table that as well. We're into the sixth session of this House. Is the Premier prepared to admit Nova Scot to Nova Scotians that their right to access to information is still not a priority for him. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Speaker, review is being done and we'll see what comes out of it. Thank you. Order, order please. The time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers has expired. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition on an introduction. I'd just like to bring the House's attention to a friend of the House, Ben McLean, who is here, who I think hails, uh, I don't even want to say which, which part of Pictou or Pictou County, because that'll get me in trouble. 
but who certainly uh, comes from that part of the province, uh, who is living in Halifax here now. Uh, I'd like to thank, thank you, thank Ben through you, Madam Chair, for coming in and watching the House again. I ask the uh, House to give uh, Ben a warm welcome. Nice to see you again here, Ben. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the Government. Uh, the Honourable House Leader of the Government. <laughs> I always say that wrong. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Oh, oh. Uh, sorry, sorry. sorry, my fault. I'm going to recognize the Honourable Member for King's West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg leave to make an introduction. Yes, please do. Thank you. I draw members' attention to the East Gallery, where uh, one of my longtime friends and former King's West resident, uh, no stranger to many in uh, municipal politics uh, through the years, I'd like to welcome uh, my friend Diana Brothers, who is here today. Uh, Diana, yes. Diana contacted me and uh, wanted to come down to the legislature and uh, have a visit. And uh, uh, Diana was a longtime uh, municipal councillor in Greenwood and uh, the first female warden in Kings County and the first female warden in all of Nova Scotia. So she's been involved a lot in uh, initiatives to fight uh, racism and discrimination and a lot of the work she started is still uh, ongoing in Kings County. She's laid a great foundation there. And even though she's uh, not a resident of Kings West anymore, we've lost her to the big bad city. Um, I'm very, uh, she's well connected at home and I'm very supportive of her support, uh, thankful for her support. So thank you, welcome Dida. I recognize the member for Preston on an introduction. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg um, permission to recognize in the East Gallery, Sharon Brown Ross. Sharon was instrumental in the planning, design, funding, and construction of the Black Cultural Center for Nova Scotia, which celebrated their 40th anniversary this past September. I also want to recognize that her contribution as a public servant with the Public Service Commission were both at the regional and national levels. She was instrumental in the development and implementation of the Employment Equity Program for the federal government, and she was my mentor. Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> Welcome, ladies. I hope you enjoyed the last couple hours. <laughs> I now recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Pursuant to Rule 5C, I move the, house, uh, the hours of the House be Friday, November 3rd, 9 a.m. to 11.59 p.m., Monday, November 6th, 4 p.m. to 11.59 p.m., Tuesday, November 7th, 1 p.m. to 11.59 p.m., Wednesday, November 8th, 1 p.m. to 11.59 p.m., Thursday, November 9th, 1 p.m. to 11.59 p.m., and Friday, November 10th, 1 p.m. to 11.59 p.m. Oh, sorry, 9 p.m. Sorry, 9 a.m. to, I can change it again, 9 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. There is a motion to uh, extend the hours as presented by. Uh, there has been a request for a recorded vote. The bells will ring until the whips are satisfied.
No one can come in. Come on, Dave. Order. Dave. Order. No. No. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Those are the rules. So we will now have the clerk uh, will conduct a recorded vote. Brad Johns. Yes. Tori Rushton. Yes. Barbara Adams. Yes. Kim Maslin. Yes. Tim Houston. Alan McMaster. Yes. Twyla Gross. Yes. Michelle Thompson. Yes. John Lohr. Yes. Trevor Boudreaux. Yes. Tim Hallman. Yes. Kent Smith. Yes. Dave Ritzy. Brian Wong. Yes. Susan Corkum Greek. Yes. Brian Comer. Yes. Colton LeBlanc. We. Oui. Jill Balzer. Yes. Pat Dunn. Yes. Greg Moreau. Yes. Becky Druin. Larry Harrison. Yes. John White. Yes. John A. McDonald. Yes. Keith Bain. Chris Palmer. Yes. Melissa Sheehy Richard. Yes. Danielle Barkhouse. Yes. Tom Taggart. Yes. Nolan Young. Yes. Steve Craig. Yes. Patricia Arab. Yes. Keith Irving. Brendan McGuire. Derek Momberkett. Zach Churchill. Yes. Kelly Regan. Yes. Ian Rankin. We. Oui. Susan LeBlanc. No. Claudia Chender. Kendra Coombs. No. Susie Hansen. No. Gary Burrell. Lisa Lachance. No. Rafa Di Costanzo. Yes. Tony Hintz. Yes. Laura Lee Nickel. Yes. Ben Jessam. Yes, please. Braden Clark. Yes. Ali Duale. Yes. Carmen Kerr. Yes. Ronnie LeBlanc. Yes. Fred Tilly. Elizabeth Smith McCrossan. Results of the recorded vote are as follows, yeas 39, nays 4. The motion is carried. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that you now leave the chair and the House resolve itself into a committee of the whole House on bills. We will have a short recess as we set up uh, for a committee of the whole House on bills.
order. Order, we will now resume debate on Clause 1. I recognize the Honourable Member for Yarmouth. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, happy to continue debate, to continue debate last night uh, on this very important bill. Um, I, I, I do feel compelled to address uh, in relation to debate on this uh, point of order that was attempted to be brought forward by the Minister today is in relation to the debate last night on this. Uh, well, the point of order was ruled uh, out of order. I, I do think the substance of the Minister's comments are uh, important and, and worthy of clarification in the House. Um, I certainly want the Minister to know uh, I believe him to be an honourable member. Um, I believe that his intentions uh, have been uh, good during the time that I've known him. So I do want to I do want to make that clear because my statements last night were in relation uh, to a letter that came out of the minister's office. They weren't in relation to the minister's character. And certainly, if 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 that was misinterpreted, I want to I do want to clarify that for the record because I think the minister deserves that clarification, uh, and I think the house deserves that clarification if if that wasn't made clear last night. Uh, so I do I will leave that thought with the minister because certainly I. I uh, um, did not question anything personally with character or integrity. Uh, and, and what I was saying was I believe that the letter that was sent out was, was beneath the, uh, the integrity of the office. And I do have concerns about this letter in relation to Bill 340 that I, I do believe need to properly be addressed because in, in reading this letter, um, I think it's very clear that there is some coercion in, in the letter. Uh, and I think that's something that we do have to be very worried about here. And again, this is in relation to Bill 340. Uh, Bill 340 is listed in this letter. And, and again, I do want to bring the House's attention to some concerning uh, elements of this letter that I, that I do believe are, are beneath the office and, and beneath the department, uh, of, which, of which his letterhead uh, is, is, uh, is on the top of this. Uh, this letter, as I mentioned last night, Madam Chair, insinuates that the opposition uh, can have some sort of impact on this bill not passing. And again, for the record, that's not true. Uh, in fact, I'll be supporting this bill. Many members of our caucus will be voting for this bill. We are going to have a free vote on the side of the chamber because we recognize uh, for a number of communities uh, this has been long awaited and is going to be helpful. But we do have some very specific concerns about the process and how CBRM was treated. And I can't speak for the members uh, of CBRM, but I'm, I'm certain this bill will not have their support for these reasons. Uh, and, and while I do support broadly the intention of the bill, I do think it's missing some key components that the minister uh, was mandated to pursue the education funding and, and roads, uh, I do think broadly, you know, this bill will, will be beneficial to many municipalities. But, but the issue of CBRM is a very real exception here. And it's an exception that's worth noting in debate. Uh, this letter that was sent out by the, by the minister uh, with his name affixed references debate in this chamber it says, it, it says, and I'll quote, I don't know if you've been following what's been happening in the legislature with this bill, but it would be a shame for this opportunity for municipalities to receive more be missed at the stage in the process. Again, why, why would this opportunity be, be missed when you've got a majority government in place that seems committed to passing this? They have all the say. They have all the votes. There's nothing the opposition can do to prevent this bill from being passed. Uh, what the opposition can do is engage in robust and rigorous debate on it and point out where we believe there are flaws, which I might add is our job in this chamber. A very important role in a functioning democracy to hold governments to account, to point out where we believe there are deficits in legislation, and also to provide voice to those that feel disadvantaged by legislation. But this letter in particular, I, I am very concerned about. Again, because of intent, because of content. I don't know if you've been following what's been happening in the legislature with this bill, but it would be a shame for this opportunity for municipalities to receive more be missed at this stage of the process. There's no reason for that to happen unless the government itself determines to not pursue passage of the bill. I'm hopeful we can get this bill across the line and deliver on more than 50 million this bill would provide. 
with municipalities. Again, no reason why it wouldn't be able to get past the line. The voices opposing the bill coming both out of opposition parties and the CBRM have been loud and persistent. The opposition are filibustering the bill and have held it up, grounding the legislature to a halt. Again, not true. Legislation is moving more slowly because we are engaged in debate here, because we are requesting the government do recorded votes on legislation. Nothing has been ground to a halt. Time always passes in the legislature. We only have so many hours to debate these bills. And then we run out of those, those hours, particularly in Committee of the Whole. So again, this isn't true. Our only ask, and again, so issues with presentation of, in this letter of the legislative process are, are not factual. The letter does go on to say that with a looming deadline of the legislature fast approaching, we wrote to the CBRM again on September 21st. Still, they did not communicate any decision, nor did they put options to counselor vote. There, there's no deadline that I'm aware of in a legislative session, none whatsoever. So the, I think it's worth noting the, the content of this letter signed by the minister is, is false, the intent of which I think must be questioned. The intent of this letter is to scare municipalities into engaging in partisan behavior to apply pressure on their peer in the CBRM and pressure on opposition parties. By the way, our party is, is named by name, the Liberal Party. However, given the amount of opposition to this bill and the assertions of the Liberal Party that it is more than the CBRM that is discontent with this agreement, we are listening carefully. If it appears that this bill is in fact not the will of the municipalities and letting the current MOU continue unamended is an option. This week will guide us. We only want to do what is right for the residents of our municipalities. There, there's a veiled threat in here. If you don't stand up and communicate as we see fit, there could be repercussions. And again, only the government, not the opposition, has the ability to actually act on that. This is not right. Here comes the ask, and where I believe the, the coercion is, is very clearly presented. However, if you feel it is important that this bill passed, perhaps you could contact your colleagues in the CBRM and help them understand what value you see in the bill and encourage them to make the decision noted above that has been offered for over a month. Finally, if you support this bill, it may tone down the negative rhetoric if you contact opposition MLAs and explain the value of the bill to your municipality. This was, so, so again, a direct ask with a veiled threat to elicit a fear-based reaction from municipal leaders to lobby on behalf of the government. That's coercion by definition. This is not a good letter. This is a major misstep, and, and I do believe, and I stand behind my comments of last night, while the minister is an honorable member um, whose character I do not question, uh, I believe this letter falls beneath the integrity of the office in a very real and demonstrable way. Furthermore, it, it, it asserts in this letter I believe some incorrect information about CBRM. Our only ask of them was what, that whatever decision they make, option A or B, be supported by a vote of council. We felt this was a reasonable ask to ensure the decision represented the will of the majority of council, particularly given CBRM's recent history of division. Again, option A to be a part of the same agreement or option B exempt themselves from the arrangement. And we'll get to those two options as presented by the department. Here's another piece of the letter I'm very concerned about. We didn't actually receive a response. Their silence is hard to reconcile in the face of being offered exactly what they had asked for. Again, I tabled letters last night from the mayor in response to the minister's correspondence to council, where there was very clearly a response that has been tabled on the record in this house, where there was an offer to meet, and if the suggested dates were not possible, there was also an offer to accommodate the minister's schedule with an emergency meeting. And instead, we, we have in this letter a depiction of events that's very different from what the record now reflects. Furthermore, this letter was not sent to the political elected leaders of our municipalities. This letter was sent to CAOs from the minister. Again, another breach of decorum. And, and also in bad taste. 
This would be very similar to uh, a premier of another province calling all of the deputy ministers in different provinces and saying, can you help us lobby your elected officials to get them on side with what we're looking for? Uh, let's, let's, let's use an example that's happening right now where there's division in the Federation. This would be like Premier Danielle Smith calling all the deputy ministers in Nova Scotia and across the province and saying, will you convince your elected officials to support our decisions around the Canada Pension Plan? Does that, would that not seem inappropriate to the members opposite? Would that not seem inappropriate to the minister if that were to happen? I suggest it would. I suggest the minister, the premier, and the government would be very offended by that happening, by an elected official in another jurisdiction writing directly to the staff of elected officials. Entirely inappropriate. Now, I have developed some thoughts on this letter since last night as well. I, I had made the suggestion that perhaps the public service was directed to write this letter. But, but in looking at the format of this letter and being familiar with department correspondence over my 13 years in office and in cabinet and in opposition, this is a very different format, a very different font than is usually used. Furthermore, I've never seen a department send out a letter with the minister's names, name affixed that does not either have the real signature or the digital signature. I have a new theory about this. I don't think it was the public service that drafted this, and I would like some clarification from the minister if he's able to provide it. I believe it was a political staffer that wrote this, using the department's letterhead. Again, not appropriate. The letterhead is purchased by the public. Taxpayers pay for this letterhead. The letterhead represents the office of the minister as a minister of the Crown, not as a Conservative member. So everything about this I do think stinks. And I think it needs some addressing. And I think the House and the municipalities that have been attempted to be coerced by this letter deserve an apology. I think CBRM also deserves an apology because it's inaccurate, there's veiled threats in it, it's coercive, and it did not follow proper decorum or protocol, or protocol. And it led to some very serious condemnations from the CBRM. Again, the second largest municipal unit in this province that is dealing with unique challenges, that has a right to be heard, that has a right to fair negotiation, and, and, and that needs to be working collaboratively with the province. And the province needs to be working collaboratively with them if we're going to get anywhere on the biggest issues that are affecting our province. Issues that are not hyperbolic crises, that are actual crises, like housing and homelessness, where there is clearly an overlap between provincial and municipal and federal jurisdiction. Cooperation and civility between these orders of government is absolutely uh, imperative. And, and for the minister to play these sorts of political games with a coercive letter do not help bridge the gap between the province and our municipal units, especially the second largest one. We'll talk about what they've done with the largest unit when that bill comes to third reading. But these do not build these actions do not build trust. They do not build an environment where cooperation is even possible or where dialogue is happening. And that means that we're going to fail the people of this province. Look at the reaction to that letter alone from the council. And again, these are, these are justified and reasonable responses to, to, to that letter. Councillors and the mayor voiced anger and disappointment with Bill 340, which threatens to cut the annual equalization funding sent to CBRM. And several councillors bashed the Conservative government for still not working with the municipality on an updated memorandum of understanding. 
Now, the government has said that they, they have tried to negotiate in good faith. I think we have evidence in this letter that's already been tabled that there's reason to question that, at the very least. And I think we have evidence in the minister's statements and documents she tabled law amendments that good faith negotiation didn't happen. The mayor references a letter that was sent to the municipality, I believe from the minister, in relation to this negotiation. <coughs> and I'll, I'll quote the, the minister. What we were present, what we were presented with was this. And she, she holds up the letter in committee. In this letter from the minister, you will note that CBRM was offered the option to participate in the current MOU as presented or opt out for separate CBRM Pacific agreement. Herein lies the problem. The proposed MOU does not benefit the CBRM, but it did at least offer two months of communication exchange and information as pointed out by the minister. No mention to a series of recommendations to guide the conversation that were derived from 18 months of work by the advisory committee. CBRM is noting that the government did not move on a number of the recommendations that were actually provided to them by the municipality. The option for CBRM to agree to a separate agreement involved one letter and two bullet points. These bullets read, the above savings of $4.6 million will not occur at least until a separate agreement is reached. The financial parameters outlined in the existing service exchange will guide any separate negotiation with, either, with, with the CBRM. That means the above annual savings of $4.6 million will be considered a cap for negotiations. If your preference is to pursue a separate agreement, the province is willing to commit to maintain funding to match your previous municipal financial capacity grant for the next five years. Also within the process of negotiating, the province is willing to work with you to develop a charter. So again, in the presentation by, by the minister, who says there was a fair negotiation here, there is uh, neglect to move forward on many of the recommendations from his own advisory committee on this, made up of municipal leaders. And there is a uh, very clear and direct uh, financial threat to CBRM. Either play ball, take the deal, or you're going to lose money. This does not breed trust. This is not necessarily a fair negotiation. And these issues, at the very least, I think require a response and clarification from the minister. Because again, here's how much the relationship has been poisoned as a result of the minister's approach to negotiation of the uh, not so veiled financial threat to CBRM and order. I ask that the honourable member speak to the content of the bill, not the process. Um, there is, uh, there are places elsewhere uh, you could ask, for example, question period, or, or speak to that, please. So please just speak to the content. I recognize the honourable member for Yarmouth. Uh, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, bill 340 has resulted in very severe responses from our second largest municipality. The minister's actions in negotiating Bill 340 and bringing it forward have resulted in very serious and real criticisms by the municipality. Councillor Brookschrager claimed the letter threatened to hold back municipalities' benefits. Upsetting, unbelievable, and disgusting were a few words the mayor said and councillors used to describe the letter that was sent by the minister. Sentiments I, I, I agree with. I didn't think any elected official who goes into these roles to help their community would be so punitive and malicious toward another order of government. Then seeing that letter last night, again, the letter in relation directly to Bill 340, uh, a letter that references Bill 340, explicitly led to more comments. Then seeing the letter last night by the Minister of Municipal Affairs lobbying CAOs and discrediting my CAO by not including her on that list, implying CBRM essentially needs to be told what to do 
I could have not anticipated some sort of tactic like that. Walsh, Walsh said, the CAO, again, in relation to a letter that specifically and explicitly is related to Bill 340, and, and for the House, if I, need to, if I need to provide that reference again, uh, it's right here in the letter. As a result of these discussions with municipalities, we introduced Bill 340. So Bill 340 is listed in, in the letter from the minister, uh, which is what I'm discussing right now. From a CAO who has an extensive career in municipal politics. She was very upset. I've never seen a minister reach out to the administrative staff like this, she said. It's not protocol. Order. It's You're speaking to the process again and not to the content. So please speak to the content of the bill. I recognize the honourable member for Yarmouth. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, so these, uh, these comments are in relation to the content of 340 as it impacts CBRM. Uh, these comments are in relation to uh, a letter that the minister sent out that explicitly references uh, this bill. Walsh said, I've never seen a minister reach out to this. She was shocked, to be honest. It's not protocol, it's disrespect. Walsh called the tactics divide and conquer. Their comments are just unbelievable to me. I've never experienced that in all my years of municipal government. This government and this premier are unbelievable. This is absolutely disgusting what's happening right now with our municipality. I'm convinced they're trying to hold this place back, said another councillor. Again, these comments are in relation to the content of Bill 340. The letter was the latest move in the province's lack of respect for the municipality, dating back to promises he said the province hasn't kept in the MOU negotiations. Those promises, I will again reference to the House, this has already been tabled, were public and platform commitments by the Premier to double CBRM's municipal capacity grant or equalization payment. So CBRM does not believe that Bill 340 follows, follows through on the Premier's explicit and the PC party's platform's specific promise to increase their funding. And that is why we have some concerns about this and how we got here. And again, I, I say this as a member that is going to support broadly this bill. I will vote in favour of it. But there is a shadow over this bill that needs to be addressed. I believe there's a shadow now over the Municipal Affairs Department that has grown in recent days in terms of how they're dealing and working with our municipal units. And we've got to deal with that shadow because it's going to affect this province's ability to deal with municipal units from one end of the province to the other. It's, it's already impacting the trust level with our municipal units and, and the government's ability to work with them to tackle the biggest issues of the day. And again, to tackle these issues, these very real crises, housing, climate change, planning, climate resiliency, all of our levels of government need to be working together. And I certainly think we need more from the minister on this front, and we need more from the PC government. Thank you very much. I recognize the honourable member for Annapolis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to acknowledge a few people. I want to acknowledge our leader for bringing this subject uh, up and speaking to this bill a number of times over the week. Uh, I want to acknowledge my Cape Breton colleagues who have been extremely passionate about this subject, um, who took the time to listen to their uh, council and CBRM and bring a lot of their thoughts and concerns here to the floor uh, of the legislature. Uh, I especially want to thank our whip, uh, for supporting a uh, free vote. Uh, <laughs> I was just seeing if anyone, anyone was listening. But um, I am standing to support this bill, uh, 340, and the reason I'm doing so is just like my Cape Breton colleagues have done, I've listened to my council. So I represent the county of Annapolis. I represent uh, the village of Lawrencetown. 
I represent the town of Annapolis Royal and the town of Middleton. And I believe the member from Digby Annapolis would know this as well, because I know she was copied on at least one of those correspondence. But those councils are, for the most part, supportive of this bill. And as I trust them to be experts in this more so than I am, uh, even though I've spent a lot of time this last week, as a lot of our members have, studying up on what this means, I have to take their lead. And, and therefore, that's why I'm supporting uh, this bill. I will say, however, you know, this bill doesn't uh, cover a lot of things that affect the residents that I represent. Um, there are some good things, but it doesn't touch on roads. We certainly have uh, tons of roads in Annapolis. It uh, doesn't touch on education, and there are a few other things I'd like to raise that it doesn't address. Um, you know, it's a good first step but uh, there's a lot of work left to do. So, as I said, I had a number of conversations over the last week with uh, my councils and their council members. I wanted to share a few of their thoughts. I did ask for permission. This is a letter from October 23rd, and I'll table this uh, to the minister from uh, the warden of Annapolis County. And just uh, one section reads as, in quotes, after a thorough review, the changes are both positive in the short and long term. Additionally, the proposed new plan removes the cost sharing by municipalities for provincial services such as corrections and housing, which has been a sore spot for decades. We understand that Bill 340 is coming to the Legislative Assembly later this week, and we encourage the government to pass this bill. So therefore, that's why you're seeing my support. A couple things that the county didn't uh, put in this letter that I'd like to comment on um, would be maybe a concern around, um, I'll give an example. Uh, you know, the fact that each section municipalities have to pay for housing corrections and take over old schools unless they are exempted by regulation. But as far as I know, you know, that regulation hasn't been clarified. Um, and my understanding is, you know, what happens if CBRM or another municipal unit doesn't sign on? What happens to the, to the, uh, to the rest that I represent? Are they exempted by the regulation? Are they not exempted by regulation? Could the minister guarantee that if another municipal unit doesn't sign on, will others be exempted? That's one of my questions. You know, another issue that the county uh, didn't put in their letter would be the turnover of obsolete schools. I do have to uh, mention we're fortunate in Annapolis with a school, a new high school in Bridgetown. Um, we certainly have one of the oldest schools in the province at Middleton High School. I hope the Minister of Education is listening. Um, but uh, all to say, you know, the proposed wording is that the province, in quote, may require lands to be returned to the province. Well, what happens if the province doesn't want to take that or doesn't ask for the land back? And what happens, you know, is there a protection uh, that they won't revert back to the municipality at that stage? I don't think those, those questions are answered. So that loophole needs to be closed and, and needs to be addressed. I mentioned roads. I, I've got so many I, I couldn't print and speak to them all, but I've printed one. And there's a lot of back and forth between the, the uh, Public Works Department and myself and our office and the municipality. And I know I've raised this with the Minister of Public Works in estimates, and I've spoken to her senior leadership team, but I'll, I'll read a, a partial uh, paragraph from one of my constituents or sorry, to one of my constituents from the department. And it reads, some believe this road to be private. However, there is evidence that you have provided through your lawyer showing it to be public. Department of Public Works accepts that this evidence, accepts this evidence that it is in fact publicly owned as opposed to a privately owned road. However, it has never been listed or maintained consistently over the years. Stony Brook Road, as it's named, has been determined to be a crown-owned property providing access to a cemetery and to the shore. Residents of Stony Brook Road will be informed that although there have been unauthorized maintenance to this road in the past by Department of Public Works, this will not be continued. And that's dated June 1st to a constituent. The only reason I raise that, 
is, you know, this MOU doesn't address roads, as I mentioned. This is just one of dozens of examples where I see problems in future. Uh, no one's claiming that they own the road. No one's claiming that they maintain the road. And uh, like I said, that's going to lead to several problems, I think, if we don't address this quickly. I thought I would um, maybe mention some highlights from my town of Annapolis Royal, my hometown. And I've run this again by <clears throat> the council and the mayor there and the CAO. Like I said, they've, they've told me in conversations they support this. This municipal financial capacity grant uh, will offer them a top up amount of $9,700. And in a small town, we'll take any dollar we can get. In corrections, this MOU will lead to 11,200 in savings for the town of Annapolis Royal. In housing, it's probably the most substantial or one of them, it'll probably save town of Annapolis around $67,000. So that's fairly uh, considerable, like I said, for a town of uh, under 1,000 people. The third letter that I'll table and just read a part of it is from the town of Middleton. And I quote, this is dated October 24th um, to the minister from our mayor of a town of Middleton. For the town of Middleton, the changes are fairly positive. The proposed new plan removes the cost sharing by the town for provincial services such as corrections and regional housing. The regional housing deficit has been a challenge for this town, specifically over the last few years. In 2020-2021, the town incurred deficits because of how high the regional housing deficit has become, which can't be budgeted or predicted by staff. You know, this has hurt the town in its financial condition indicators reports for two years. So again, you know, one of the specific reasons why town of Middleton is supporting this, uh, my understanding is Middleton used to be a regional hub for housing, and that no longer makes sense. Um, and this MOU has, has led to a better outcome for that town. You know, there's lots of concerns, as I mentioned. There's a lot of work to be done. I wonder, with the infrastructure program that I know, uh, it's a new $15 million program. Uh, I don't see or can find or hear of any detail on that program. Uh, my understanding is the department's still working on finalizing that. I've got questions, as I mentioned, about the roads. Um, I know J-Class Row program will be cancelled or terminated, but like I said before, I've got dozens of these letters that I'm happy to share with the department and the minister on the confusion of who owns what road, who's maintaining what road, etc. So all in all, um, I wanted to stand in support of Bill 340. Um, I understand and appreciate the leader giving us that flexibility to vote the way our constituents want us to vote. There should be more of that, in my uh, opinion. And uh, I'll hand it over to my colleague from Claire. I recognize the honourable member for Claire. Uh, thank you, oh, Madam yes. Chair. And I, too, want to stand in uh, support of uh, Bill 3, 4. Oh, whoops. Go ahead. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Britain uh, Centre, Whitney Pier. Thank you. You are a, uh, the member is a true gentleman, and I, I thank him very much. Um, <laughs> um, Madam Chair, I beg leave to make an introduction. Of, of course. Thank you. Um, in the gallery opposite is my uh, longtime CA, Dylan Hutchins. Dylan has been with me since day one. He is an amazing CA and does so much for the residents of Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pier, and without him, I would truly be lost. He is a gem among gems. Thank you, Dylan, for everything, and welcome, everybody. Welcome, and I hope you enjoy your time here. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Clare. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. 
So I too uh, want to take a few minutes to talk in support of uh, Bill 340. Um, I do want to recognize the leader's uh, leadership on this to, to give us the ability to, to vote um, our conscience and uh, how our residents and constituents uh, uh, feel and we can re more fairly and ac accurately represent uh, what they're thinking on this bill. Um, for, for Claire, it is, uh, it is a net gain. And I know I did get up and during uh, second reading to talk to the bill a little bit, and um, Minister of Housing did uh, maybe uh, stand uh, to, to question my position on the bill. So I just want to maybe accurately uh, define my position. So I, I do support the bill. It's good for Claire. At the same time, I do want to recognize my colleagues from uh, Cape Breton who, have, who are advocating for their residents uh, with, with passion and, and uh, they do care about, about CBRM. So I don't want to take that away from them. And I do support, uh, you know, what they're trying to accomplish in, in fighting for their residents. Um, for Claire, if you, if you look at the municipal finance uh, ca capacity grant, the uh, municipality of Claire will uh, gain 54,288 uh, from an increase on the capacity grant. Um, for corrections, uh, it will be uh, $116,097 that they won't have to submit to the provincial government, which, which is a considerable saving. And on housing, it's uh, 67,817. And th that is obviously savings for the municipality. But on the point that my colleague from Annapolis made on housing, ha housing has always been an issue when uh, municipalities budget. Because during the budget process in my 21 years, I don't think I've ever seen that figure come in in time for the actual budget. So municipalities were, were essentially estimating that amount. And, and as the, my colleague from Annapolis did say, it does affect the budgeting process and, and the financial indicators at the end of the day. If you don't provide a balanced budget, then you know, chances are it won't be, uh, you won't be in the green. So I think that's a positive on financially and on the budgeting process itself. Um, Another good thing about uh, Bill 340 is uh, disposal of surplus schools. I know currently in Clare, uh, they're in the process of building a new elementary school. So as soon as that opens up, uh, two of our schools are going to uh, be closed. So the municipality will have uh, two, two sc surplus schools on the book. They are in the process of looking at those schools uh, for housing or the properties. They have a study. They, they did uh, spend a great deal of money on uh, looking at those two properties to see how they could be, be best utilized for uh, housing. So the fact that part of the agreement is that the f they have a first right of refusal is a positive thing. So all in all, I, I think that's quite positive for the municipality. I speak to the warden and councillors not every day, but close to every day. Uh, so they are very uh, supportive of this. Where, where maybe I think there is a missed opportunity, or I hope there's some work that will be done on this going into the future around the capacity grant. I, I think if that had been doubled, it might have solved a lot of issues that that we're discussing here today. But the reality is that municipalities are under more and more financial pressure. So a doubling of the capacity grant would have made a, a great deal of difference. Uh, education, I mean, a lot of money is collected on behalf of the province for education, and a, a freeze on that would have made uh, a significant difference for municipalities. And there's always the question of roads, which I won't get into. I know it's very complex, 
and uh, councils uh, have the every council has their own challenges with that. Um, but if I go back to the capacity grant, I, I think the, the issue I want to maybe convey to the House and is that the pressures municipalities are facing, I believe, are financial pressures are increasing every year. Um, we do see population growth, aging infrastructure, and, and if you've tried to build anything at all in the last three years from recreation, you know, complexes to, to, to housing, to anything, you'll see that it's essentially doubled. So if, if you look at pressures on municipalities, you know, a lot of municipalities, because residents are demanding a lot more from councils and councillors, are, are getting into areas where historically they, they've never been. Um, housing is one of them. I know uh, housing has become an issue that's discussed quite regularly at, at council. Um, I know in Clare, the council has uh, put out uh, last year or so an expression of inf interest for anybody who's interested in, in selling land to the municipality that they could use as, a, I guess, an asset towards any uh, developer that might be interested in coming in and uh, providing some housing. And, and with that, too, comes maybe not water, as you would see in HRM or CBRM, but certainly uh, wastewater, uh, the système digu, I forget the English word. <laughs> Excuse me for that. Uh, pardon? A système digu. So, yeah, so there's a lot of extra costs. I know they're looking at developments in Clare where the municipality would provide a uh, wastewater system to try to entice developers to come into the area. So that, that's all money that comes out of the budget. What we're seeing as well is uh, p around policing. Municipalities are struggling to see, to pay for increased policing costs, which have become significant. And there's always the question of fire services, where a lot of rural municipalities, fire services are volunteer departments. But they look to the municipality to build the fire halls, to buy the fire trucks, and to provide equipment. They do do some fundraising, but it, at the, you know, the last few years, the fire trucks have essentially doubled as well, so they're looking to, at, for municipalities to provide more uh, financial uh, contribution. So I'd, I'd say the, the doubling the capacity grant would have given a bit of uh, support to those municipalities who are trying to, to make and meet ends meet. Um, I know in the past, uh, I know Claire did and other municipalities did, they invested in high-speed internet, which is not necessarily something that municipalities historically would invest in, but it was necessary. The residents were demanding it, and I think to grow, you, you, you need to have it. So again, their municipalities had to find ways to finance their portion of that. And we're, uh, even this week, I was talking to the warden uh, from my municipality who said they're getting presentations at council about cellular coverage. And there are businesses, residents who live in areas, dead zones, they're looking to councils to maybe, as leaders or at least partners, in addressing those challenges as well. And that comes again with significant cost to municipalities. Uh, we see um, even healthcare, doctor recruiting, municipalities are again investing in those things. So I, it would be, uh, I think, advantageous for municipalities, but I would say for the province to increase the capacity grant, double it, even you know, uh, increase it to inflation, CPI, as most things are, uh, most costs at the municipal level are increasing uh, at a faster rate than uh, inflation in most cases. Um, 
So uh, I'd say that municipalities, and I've been, I was there for 21 years, so I have a lot of confidence in municipalities to deliver services, uh, to spend money efficiently, and to do a lot with sometimes very little. So that's why I believe municipalities are great partners for the province and for the federal government, where the more grants, the more money you can provide to municipalities, I think the better off residents are. And this is where, in negotiating this, this MOU, uh, it would have been an opportunity to really dig into the issues uh, that, that municipalities are facing and try to provide a bit, a bit more uh, financial capacity for those uh, municipalities. Um, many projects, I'd say, or any challenges that we face as a province, I'm convinced that the best way to solve them is through partnerships between all levels of government and have the support of residents at the same time. I, I, I believe that the more do, all three levels of government work together and the more effective they become, the better services they provide and the more infrastructure they're in the position to build. I can use the, the I know in Clare the, the uh, high-speed internet project we did, um, it was a partnership uh, well, between the private sector, Develop Nova Scotia, and municipal uh, investment. Uh, part of that municipal investment was through the federal gas tax. So we were able to leverage money, partner again with the private sector and the provincial government through Develop Nova Scotia to deliver high-speed internet to fiber up to the home to about over, well over 95% of residents. So that's why, you know, part of the debate we're having here with the MOU is, I believe, maybe um, having to do with a breakdown in communication as much as anything else. And I, so I think the, the, the way that uh, the provincial government, I, I strongly would hope that the provincial government would make its way to CBRM to try to uh, have those negotiations with uh, the municipality and try to come up with a solution that, that uh, would work for CBRM. I do want to again um, commend my colleagues uh, from Northside Westmount and uh, Sydney member too for you know, fighting for what they believe in and uh, fighting for the residents of CBRM, um, showing the passion that they've shown. And uh, w one thing I've quickly learned as uh, being an MLA in the legislature here is that uh, Cape Bretoners do fight for Cape Breton. That's one thing that's been pretty clear for, <laughs> for me here. So. But in, so I, I do uh, want to congratulate them on on, uh, on being advocates for their community and fighting for them. Um, I, I'm coming to the end here, but essentially, if you look at the bill in its entirety, I support the bill. It, for the municipality of Clare, it's, it's, uh, it's a good bill. Um, like I said, there, there are opportunities there that could have been uh, addressed and that would have made a huge difference for uh, municipalities, especially around their capacity to invest in infrastructure, uh, such as uh, housing and other issues that essentially residents are demanding that they, they take some leadership in. So with that, uh, I'll take my seat. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Sydney, member two. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'm going to get up for a few minutes uh, and talk uh, again about the bill. Um, I appreciate the comments from my colleagues, and I also appreciate, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, as we said from the onset, is that uh, we don't disagree with with a lot that is actually in the bill, um, and. Uh, I also, I'm, I'm happy that my colleagues from uh, Annapolis and Clare got up and actually talked 
about the support of it and that we, actually that we are having a free vote uh, and that uh, for many communities uh, this uh, deal is actually a good one. Um, we don't deny that uh, at all. Uh, and I've heard that in the conversations I've had with NSFM representatives and, and uh, some other uh, elected representatives around uh, the, the community or communities around uh, the province. So, so and and I, and I appreciate you know everyone uh, engaged in the debate um, uh, over the last two nights, and, and I do want to recognize uh, my colleagues on the other side. And uh, there were times during the debate that. It got interesting and, you know, speakers had to play referee a little bit, but, uh, you know, I, I want to be complimentary to both of them because I know both of them well, I know their families, uh, and aside from the fact that we have the conversations that we have in here, I know that the gentlemen go home, uh, and that also includes a member from uh, the NDP as well, but just particularly to the government side, um, I know that the guys go home and they do their best. Uh, to help their communities. So, uh, and I always say, I would say that the member from Glace Bay and I will probably get into it more than most, but he'll go home and he'll feed 100 kids and give out toys at Christmas. And uh, that's his thing, and uh, I congratulate him for it. Uh, I follow that, uh, I follow what he does each year. And, and similar to the member from uh, Cape Breton East who does a lot for kids with the pediatric unit at the regional. So, hey, we're going to have these debates, and God. God love the speakers and deputy speakers that have to put up with us when things go a little off kilter. But uh, anyway, I, I want to get that on the record because we're going to have lots more conversation about this as we get, go forward uh, and debate will be what it is. Uh, we, uh, we may have different stances on it. That's no different than any of the debates I had with the former MLAs uh, from, from Cape Breton when we were on the government side. Uh, you know. Alfie McLeod had some pretty legendary debates in here with Eddie, and they probably fill the bus more than, you know, the bat, the moment. But they're probably some of the best, right? Um, but uh, we all have personal relationships. We all know each other's families, uh, and you know, I'm coming at this speech again t tonight, similar to what I did last night. Uh, I, I'm not going to table a lot of documents, Madam Speaker. Um, a lot has been said. I will reference. Uh, just you know, I, I do want to talk about the letter. Uh, as well to the CAOs. I mentioned it last night, but I, I just, I, I want to get past, at some point we got to get past this, and we got to say, who's going to take that leadership role, Madam Speaker, to try to get this back on track? Um, because, as I said last night, uh, CBRM, hey, it's been testy on both sides, right? You've had a lot of messaging come from government here. You've had messaging come from CBRM, we had that debate last night about the strategy around CBRM used uh, may not be uh, favorable to government members. Uh, government has also used that tactic themselves. Uh, and as I said last night, everybody's accountable for their own decisions. So whatever decisions the CBRM makes, they're going to have to be accountable for them. Whatever the government makes, they will be. And whatever we do personally as MLAs, uh, we have to be accountable for the things and the decisions that we say. Uh, can I get some water? Yeah, thank you. So a whole lot's been said, and I do want to give credit to the leader of uh, my caucus, uh, the member of Yarmouth. I think he provided uh, a lot of background information uh, and presented the correspondence accurately in regards to uh, the bill and, and the challenges that CBRM had around Bill 340. Uh, and. Um, you know, particularly, I mentioned one last night. I you know, I don't, maybe I'll wait till the minister to come back. I'd rather be in the room when I when I say this. It's comp complimentary to him. Um, but uh, here we are. You know, we're we're into the we're into the law uh, law amendments port, or not law amendments. We're into the uh, committee of the whole house uh, on this. And there, as I said last night, there are there are some amendments, Madam Speaker. There are some, oh, I forgot, I, I broke the rules. Jane, the clerk is calling me on it, Madam Speaker, and I apologize. No. <laughs> okay, perfect. Anyway, so uh, you gotta know when you're wrong. Uh, but, but again, as, as I said, uh, I forget where my train of thought was now. Um, uh, as I said last night, uh, um, how do we get this back on track? And I personally think it's going to be uh, the government, 
our, 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 our government here provincially that's that's really going to have to try to try to step up and and kind of take the lead on this and, and I don't say that uh, in a way that's you know I have I have some major concerns around some of the communication that came out of government and as my my colleague said from Claire I think communication has kind of been a challenge in this from day one and and some of it is on the government but I think some of it was and, and I, I talked to some of my colleagues in Cape Breton about this some of this has been caused by the initial phases of the negotiation that uh, which I believe maybe some the, the politicians may not have known the, the full extent of and everybody had their guard up uh, right away, Madam Speaker. So we've seen CBRM, we've heard a lot of correspondence, um, and uh, we've seen the correspondence going back and forth from the government. And uh, I, I have some major concerns around it. Um, and, you know, I, I'll say it, uh, I'll probably say it by the end of my comments uh, as well, but like, one of the, one of the, um, uh, the letter that went to the CAOs, uh, that letter, uh, to me, as has been indicated before, represents a very dangerous practice when it comes to 340, and it could be it could be implemented in any any bill. But we're talking about 340, and knowing the minister for almost nine years, uh, for the for the for the for the. When you're in here, and as we all know, we, we, we learn a lot about each other, we learn a lot about our families, and we learn a lot about how we operate as individuals. And the Minister of Municipal Affairs, I've known him now for nine years, uh, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a humble man, uh, and he's a, he's, a, he's a bit of a gentle giant. And uh, you can always tell, and, and, and I, I would even use the, the Minister of Environment because uh, I see him out of the corner of my eye, but he's the same way. So you can you can you can pick up on trends on how people communicate with stakeholders. And when I saw that letter, and and my my colleague, the the, the leader of our party, made some some pretty important points when it comes to um, the kind of the style and the format and not being signed. The tone of that letter is not the tone of the Minister of Municipal Affairs. It's not. As ministers, you approve all the correspondence that comes out of your office, Madam Speaker. And I just don't think that the minister, uh, in, in, the, in the character of the, of the man that I know, would write a letter like that. A letter that obviously, uh, you know, you, you look at points of it, you know, I don't think he would have took political shots in a letter. I think he, he wants a solution to this uh, as much as everybody else does. Uh, and the question becomes this is how he gets there and, and will the minister and the government renegotiate with CBRM but if you look at the contents and, and, my, and the leader of our caucus talked a lot about it, excuse me, that's, that's not a letter that the minister of municipal affairs would write. I personally believe it's not a letter that any minister would write as I said last night. That was uh, a political letter I would argue written that in the Premier's office that was attached to uh, Municipal Affairs and Housing uh, letterhead. And it's unfortunate because I call that, in tennis they call that an unforced error. And in Bill 340, when you're trying to negotiate and get every municipality on side, um, that letter is a big misstep, a big unforced error, which uh, somebody politically uh, decided to write, probably not recommended by staff, if staff had any say in it at all, uh, but created this, 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 just this deterioration of the relationship further with, uh, with the Cape Verde Regional Municipality and trying to negotiate Bill 340. Uh, and uh, really took a, took a, in my opinion, really insulted uh, a woman that uh, she dedicated her life to public service. And uh, I, I just, I hope I never see that again, whoever's in government. That just doesn't, that, dis, 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 that destroys goodwill. And as I said, you know, there's, there's lots of documents I could be tabling right now, but I really want to focus on, on how we're going to get this back on track. And uh, there is a path. And, and I said this, uh, Madam Speaker, last night in, in regards to Bill 340 and how do you get CBRM back on, path, uh, back on track uh, is, is by, by trying to fix 
Uh, again, what my, the, the member from Clare talked about uh, is that what I've obviously seen is a breakdown in communication. Uh, and uh, members on both sides talked about different aspects of this last night uh, in regards to the bill where the government was offering a charter, which isn't a bad thing. Uh, it's something that the CBRM has been asking for. But, you know, they're trying to do their job as elected representatives in a community, but you have staff on the other side saying, well, don't worry about a charter because Bill 340 in the MOU will deal with it. So we can say who's right and who's wrong there. But, but again, it's a communication thing. It happens in all governments. I can give you a bunch of examples of when we were in government. It happens. So how do you get it back on track? You don't write letters to CAOs, right? That, 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 that's not the way to do it. So, so if the government's offering it, great. Have the conversation. If the government's saying uh, we're willing to negotiate, great then negotiate. Uh, give, the, give the Department of Municipal Affairs the authority to go down. Ideally, the Premier go down, because multiple meetings have been denied. Thank you so much. Um, multiple meetings have been denied. Uh, and, and just break the, just break whatever is the barrier is to, to, uh, to getting it done. Because I know the, the guys locally, like I heard both of them speak last night, they totally want it done. They want to do what's best for the community. We all do. You know, and if we can help along the way, great. But I just, I feel like um, there's a path here. And, and as I said, CBRM came up here and they didn't come here in a protest. They came and they, they pleaded their case. Uh, and as I said, from both the elected representatives and staff. And if you go back and you look at those in regards to the bill, Madam Speaker, there was conversations or, you know, the, the councillors uh, were, were concerned about the conversations that staff had initially uh, with them. Uh, you know, initially about, well, don't worry about a charter. You know, that's coming from staff. It's not the politicians. That's coming from staff. And then staff, is, staff again is saying you can raise your taxes 16%. And I'm kind of listening to this going, is that the, so when I'm hearing staff's doing that, I'm like, well, are they getting that direction to do that? Because I feel like they wouldn't get the direction to do that. But they did. And they, that's what they said. And again, everybody's guard was up. So how do we get it back on track? I just, I stayed clean slate. And <clears throat> look at, look at, um, Look at ways that you can rebuild that relationship. CBRM, didn't, CBRM came here and, in good intentions, provided a number of amendments that we're going to talk about tonight in regards to Bill 340, uh, Madam Speaker. You know, looking at, um, looking at the Sermgar report, looking at, uh, which in the Sermgar report, there, this is, you know, and some people would say this too, it, it, this is kind of like step one. There is more work to do with this, whether it's this government or the next government, that, that, that the, the whole evolution of the relationship with municipalities is changing. And, and my colleagues behind, uh, my two colleagues uh, from Annapolis and Clare kind of got into it a little bit too. But it is. You're, you know, you're trying to, it, it, you're, it, and, and as we know, many communities support it. So, like, it's reflective of, you know, the infrastructure, uh, the infrastructure needs of communities, the costs uh, that municipalities are facing, uh, the, the fact that municipalities are now getting into housing, they're getting into uh, other aspects of, uh, of what I would argue... And, 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 and Madam Speaker, you know this yourself as a former councillor, a lot of things that councils we never got involved with, uh, maybe when we were on council. Um, I remember my time. We did a lot around infrastructure and, of course, recreation and, and municipal issues in our districts. But, you know, we, ne we never had the cost, of, I believe, we never had the cost of living um, issues back then that, that we do now, but we had other challenges when it came to old migration and other things. So, so it's, it's very different, some similar, some similar challenges, but very different in the sense, which I'll talk to about a bit again about CBRM and its growth. So, uh, so communities support this. And we have one community now that's came up here in good intentions uh, on Bill 340 and said, here's what we can do. We're gonna talk about those amendments tonight. So I said, the, educa the education the costs around the education uh, transfers, 
That's a huge conversation this, that, that still isn't completely hashed out yet. That's going to be hashed out, but I think could have really helped if that conversation would have got further in this round. Um, I, I, I can respect the fact that you're dealing with 49 different municipal units, so that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a bigger conversation to have. But, you know, in CBRM's argument, those, those, those costs are going to increase pretty significantly over, over the coming years, one of the arguments that, that they're making. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about, uh, as well, uh, we're going to talk about the pre-1981 schools. Uh, you know, I'd like to hear some feedback from all sides on that one. Um, uh, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, CBRM's ultimate request for, for uh, a renegotiation within a year. And as I said last night, Madam Speaker, uh, as part of Bill 340, if, if we can add something like that, uh, that... Um, that uh, would just send that, that, that goodwill to CBRM, go down, indicate it, sit to, and Again, I'm going to go the, back to the process. So, like, there was a whole lot of talk, Madam Speaker, around, well, CBRM needed to pass the motion, and the government wants a motion of counsel. And I, and I can appreciate that. So why don't why, get in the car, however you want to get there, go down and meet with the CBRM, have a f fulsome conversation, and I bet you... CBRM will pass that motion because they said they would. But it take you know there's there's a public debate element that comes with this as we're doing right now on the bill, uh, and there's some preparation that has to happen around that. But they're not saying dead stop no to anything. They they went as far as coming up here saying, well now we understand that we're going to be part of Bill 340, so okay we accept that for now, but. We, we really need to look at a new agreement for CBRM. And uh, the province said, okay, we'll give you a charter. Perfect. I still think the MOU needs to come before the charter. That's my own personal thought. I think you get through this negotiation and then you write the charter. You, you, you figure this out, then you write your charter. Because the charter to me uh, is not, the MOU is, 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 the, is kind of the financial foundation uh, and and th that kind of you know ironclad agreement or however your contract is a better way to put it, Madam Speaker, contract in Bill 340 that says this is the relationship. Uh, or sorry, not 340 because we want a different uh, we want a different deal with CBRM. But if they're in 340, you can use any community. So Bill 340 is that contract for now. So if you do that for CBRM, so give CBRM a separate agreement outside of 340, which the government has indicated, um, uh, then get, negotiate that deal and then write your charter. Because the charter to me means nothing without an agree, a, a contract that outlines a lot of the, that, that reflects what we've been talking about for days, which is the uniqueness of the CBRM, which is uh, the fact that it is the second largest regional municipality, that it uh, has a very, uh, you know, set of unique challenges when it comes to uh, its size, uh, its geography, uh, and, and, and its history around uh, economic and social development that, that and, and a community in growth instead of a community uh, in decline. And uh, all of those aspects would have to be ironed out before, uh, before you wrote a charter. So let's do it. That's kind of the key here, right? I, uh, you know, I would be very happy to hear the government go down to the CBRM, say we're going to go down to the CBRM, we're going to have that conversation. We understand their uniqueness, we understand uh, some, of the, some, of the, some of the issues that they're talking about. Uh, we understand that uh, compared to the MOU, they're, uh, they're a community that's ten times the size uh, of other communities. Uh, and we're going to give them... We're going to give them, uh, first and foremost, we're going to have a conversation try to rebuild a relationship. That's the first thing that needs to happen. And then they get into the conversation about the community for what it is. And that's where I think a big part of the, the elected representatives can help out, as we all represent different communities within. Uh, we all understand the challenges unique to our, the communities that we represent. But collectively, as Cape Bretoners, uh, I think we can all play our part uh, to help uh, rebuild that relationship, and that's on all of us, right? That's not just on government. That's on that's on everyone, right? 
Um, I've seen I've seen the Cape Bretoners come together in floods and fires and pandemics and more hurricanes and more hurricanes and everything else in between, right? And and I can tell you, the the political the political stripes fall uh, fall away pretty quick when uh, when we're all trying to do our best uh, to help home. So first step, go down and and have that conversation and try to reestablish uh, the relationship. And to, and, and, and and to be honest, take. You know, take some responsibility around, uh, or, or, or at least reflect on, kind of how we got to this point, right? A point where, uh, which I believe, staff, uh, the initial negotiations with staff just really set the wrong stage uh, for the whole thing. So, so as we talk tonight uh, about uh, the bill. Uh, as I said, there's going to be a number of amendments, and and and, and, and you know, as I talked about one of the amendments, or there's one, there'll be one talking about schools, and then there'll be one talking about, you know, having that that conversation with with CBRM, uh, and we'll get a little more into the into the in depth of those amendments, of course, Madam Speaker, because we have to, and that's the rules, and we'll talk about some of that stuff, but but again. Um, also, it's going to be a little bit about, and we'll probably get into this as we get into the third reading too, but you know, I, I may try to reference a little bit of it now, and I, I'm happy to table uh, anything you need, uh, Madam Speaker, but you know, the, the CERMGAR committee, um, you know, they did some work around this. Uh, they made some recommendations around this in regards to, to Bill 340, and it works for it's it's fun. It's it, it, so the, there are communities that are going to gain under what eventually came forward as recommendations, but I just wish that the treasury uh, would have looked at that service uh, or that that municipal capacity grant, and I think that uh, the recommendation was was eventually to have uh, 15 million uh, placed into uh, the the fund. You good? That's good. It gave me a little break, Madam Speaker. A little bit of action, but uh, but uh, anyway. So so the so Sir Guard came out with uh, with her report, and uh, there were a number of recommendations that the government never never accepted, and uh, one of them was around the capacity grant, and this was a conversation when I was in the department too as well. And I said this again last night. At some point, that number needs to be adjusted. Uh, to reflect uh, the challenges that, that municipalities are facing uh, when it comes to uh, roads and it comes to, as I said, one of the great examples in the CBRM is wastewater. Uh, we were in government, we gave CBRM north of, it was tens of millions, I can get the exact number, but, but we, we helped cover the cost of their wastewater infrastructure because it was very unique, similar to HRM in the sense that that you know, coast. There's a lot of coast, and there's a lot of sewage outfall, and and you know, we're federally mandated to do it, which we're happy to do. We all want to clean up our oceans and and keep our environment clean, uh, but uh, that's going to cost millions to operate. So these are new costs that are that are being taken on by, and I use CBRM as an example. They're not alone. There's other coastal communities too as well that would be that would be looking into this. So so. So that's why I was when when Sergar came back and they made the recommendation and good on the committee because they they recognized it right um, and you'll see that in some of the amendments tonight and talking about the, the fund but uh, I wish the treasury would have looked at that number and as I said if I'm on the other side still uh, I'm saying that to myself too is that that number has to move that, that number ideally if that number if they would have took that recommendation uh, we may be having a very different conversation right now that was one of the key elements. Uh, to it, along with the education transfer and uh, some other aspects, but but eventually, whoever's in government doesn't matter if it's this one or the next. Uh, you know, municipalities are are part of the province. Uh, there's the MGA. In the case of HRM, there's a charter and CBRM. I, I'm sure at some point we'll we'll have one as well. And uh, that 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 piece of it, money, well, listen, money money matters, right? Especially in a time when inflation is as high as it is. Uh, especially when uh, we have more uh, Nova Scotians reaching out for support than, than ever before. And we have municipalities that 
that are uh, that are that are you know trying to support those uh, families and those communities in, in, in different ways. So, um, so we'll get into the, a bit of that tonight uh, as well. Uh, I just want to take a look, Madam Speaker, to see if I can pull anything out of here. Um, but uh, no, I'll leave that for now because I think we're going to get into that later. Um, but uh, again, I just I go back to I'm uh, I'm honored to to represent home, and I've had the privilege of doing that now uh, for. Uh, almost 13 years between uh, MLA and council, and and I've lived the council side. This is not the first. I've lived. I was on council at a time when the relationship was not great with the government. It was the NDP government at the time, and I would argue that it was probably the worst relationship in the history between municipal government and province. It was just communication, and I'm seeing the same pattern, and. Um, I can say that because none of the, the members are there. They weren't there then. Uh, but it, uh, was, I don't know. Maybe one was there. But the point being is, is that there was there was no communication between very little. And on our end, it was we were in a lawsuit at the time. And members in Cape Breton and MLAs would remember this. This was uh, Mayor at the time, Sean Morgan. And I was a councillor at the time, and we were engaged in, in a lawsuit uh, against the province over equalization payments. And um, it was a tough time. There was there was little to no communication back and forth. Uh, and as a result of that, it was difficult at times to get things done for the community. Uh, I remember those times as being some of the most economically challenging times. We saw some of our largest out migration, uh, and we've seen what can happen when there's a complete breakdown of a relationship. And I'm speaking for myself. This is my own personal opinion. So that, that the relationship with the provincial government at that time was it was brutal. It was it just it, it accomplished nothing. So we always, and it was all based on one foundation. It was just about money. And in, in this MOU, it's not just about money. So it, it, that's a big part of it. And I've made that argument around the capacity grant. That's why, the, that's why actually equalization was renamed to the capacity grant in the department. And I, I was part of that because there's equalization, federal equalization that comes into provinces. And, and we've heard about that. But there was also this grant uh, that it included, it was built in the 80s to support police and fire. And it came, some of the money came from Nova Scotia Power and all that stuff. But they also called that equalization. So there was this, this concept at home that the 15 million we get was equalization. And it's actually not. It was, it's, it's a portion of it, but it's actually the capacity grant. Equalization that we are getting in the community, in all communities, includes your road infrastructure, your hospitals, your schools, your all, it's all part of the federal pot of money that comes down, and governments ultimately decide how it's distributed. You can agree or disagree with me on that. That's just the facts. Um, so when I say increase the capacity grant, it's, it's, it's not actually increasing equalization. Equalization is increased by the federal government. They, all governments have the ability to, to increase what is that capacity grant. And I think by renaming it actually serves it better in the sense that it doesn't confuse the two. And uh, I think the capacity grant, if I'm still on the government side, and we were talking about this in 2017, uh, we were talking about the capacity grant saying, what do we do to uh, increase that fund? So it's a little bit of history. I might take some heat for that at home, but that's, hey, I'd rather be honest about it. I've been being honest for 13 years, I'm still here. But the point, the point I'm making is that, so I go through, I'm a councillor from 2008 to 12, and I'm on the bill, this is 340, I'm gonna make a point. Um, and it was, it, the relationship was awful. And the economy was tanking, old migration, as I said, a constant fight. That's how I viewed it. So we came in uh, in 2013, after that, and the relationship was still rocky, and it did, you know this relationship between the CBRM and uh, and the government was still 
because rightfully so CBRM is a unique community what we've been arguing this whole time is that they're way bigger in capacity you know in in, in reference to some of the other communities but also with some unique challenges coming off of steel and coal and and uh, you know the other members would offer Cape Breton how many people were working in those industries and, and the transition was tough so you know we had to build that relationship back and was it perfect? Of course not. I had many a meeting at times with council where it wasn't rosy. You know, I've, I was in there for charter conversations. I had the equalization protests at my office. We had a protest today, right? We had the protests on health care. It was, it was pretty, it was really kind of wild for a while, Madam Speaker. There was a lot of, a lot of, a lot of protests because people didn't, they, they, they kind of rejected what we, what we, what we saw was necessary change. Uh, in the community, and it was rejected in, in, in by other political parties, right? And we debate just like we're debating right now on Bill 340. So we made those decisions around, uh, you know, for CBRM. We made we made the decisions around uh, the hospitals because it was more reflective of the size of the municipality, and boy, people didn't like that. But we did it, and it was tough. And that's okay. Now look at it. Oh, there's hundreds of people working, it's wonderful. We made some infrastructure uh, decisions around wastewater because it was unique to the CBRM. Again, like 340, that's what we've been arguing. Like t tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars in infrastructure in the Glace Bay and Sydney and surrounding areas. So, you know, as a province, as a government at the time, we said, okay, this is unique to the CBRM, so we need to make this investment. And then we looked at the size of the municipality and said, okay, transit. So the international students started coming in. And we said, now we have to be cognizant of the transit needs because now we're going from a public transit system that uh, we'll, they were going to wipe out to now we need to buy buses. We need to we need to do this all again. Stuff we've been talking about as we debated uh, Bill 340. So we started looking at stuff. Well, were we perfect? No, nobody is. Right. So th there are things I still would have loved to have done if we were if we were still on the government side, but. It's democracy. Uh, so we, we looked at a, a bunch of infrastructure, looking at the uniqueness of a community, but we did that in other communities too as well. Right? That, that's why you saw investments in other communities like 340. And, it, and again, when you look at 340 and the support that other communities uh, do for this, and the extra resources they're going to get, it goes to what we were trying to do at the time around internet and around roads and around some of the stuff that the rural communities needed. But so, now we're here. And we're in 340, and this is a new uh, agreement for communities across province, and it is a new agreement for CBRM. And uh, I just, when I saw the, the the kind of the communication breakdown that that I saw with beginning with staff, I'm sitting there going, it reminded me of 2009 again. It reminded me of the deterioration of the relationship that I saw with the NDP and the CBRM. And uh, I don't want to see that again because it's, it's just it's not beneficial to the community if politicians are at it up here or if we're into it at home. And as I said, the public fight, uh, no matter what, uh, sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't and a lot of times lately it hasn't. And I just, I just want to see what's right for all communities and I want to see and I'm way off the bill, and she's trying to. I, I'm coming back to it. <laughs> I'm coming back. I promise. Um, I promise. I'm being diplomatic about it, though, Madam Speaker. I'm doing my best. Um, but but again, so so we're, we're we're you know I just I just want to see what's right for a community that that I represent uh, in this bill. Uh, and 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 just end the public end the public war and look at the amendments that we're going to put down tonight uh, that, that came forward from CBRM at Law Amendments uh, on Bill 340. And uh, you know, take a look at them. As I said last night, Madam Speaker, in regards to the bill and some of the amendments that we'll bring forward tonight, uh, one of them's free. Cup of coffee, as I said in the Cape Breton Post. But, it, but it's free. And, the, and that's the, the building of goodwill. And that is uh, just saying, you know what? A lot of mistakes were made. Uh, a lot of a lot of things were said. 
but ultimately a, a healthy relationship between uh, the provincial government and the Cape Breton Regional Municipality is important. And we all want that. We also want this to eventually go through to support the communities that support it. Uh, and as I said, I'm happy that my colleagues got up, and I hope other uh, folks, uh, other MLAs, Madam Speaker, come up uh, and talk about how much it benefits their communities, because that was a big conversation for our caucus. Uh, as, we, as we went through Bill 340, um, we knew very well, and, and in my own conversations with, with uh, uh, municipalities, that, that this, this was very beneficial for some. And we heard that uh, from, from some excuse me, from some of my colleagues. And uh, I think it's important that if people want to get up and talk about it, that's great. Um, I think that's, that's important. We don't, we, don't wanna, we, don't, we, we don't want to see anybody lose out on this. I know a lot of work went into it. Uh, I heard from, from some of those communities in law amendments uh, what it means for them for resources and, and, and why they support it. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm happy for them. I think that's great. Uh, but... Uh, 340 for home can work. Well, no, no, not 340 can work. Sorry, let me retract that. Um, 340 at home is being accepted right now, but we we all know that um, uh, this bill and why we're putting the amendments forward tonight uh, is a reflection of the uniqueness of, of the Sea Baron. Uh, it's about the uh, the vast road network that Sea Baron has. Uh, over 800 kilometers of roads that would have been part of the roads portion of this. Um, uh, their uniqueness around the transit uh, supports that they need, uh, and uh, you know, unique to the fact that um, in Bill 340, uh, which we've debated, is that uh, CBRM is is 10 at least 10 times the size of the next uh, community that that uh, is in the MOU. And as I said. For the other communities that support it, fantastic. I think the capacity grant piece, which we'll get into tonight in the amendments of Bill 340, will um, will uh, will um, be important because I said, as, as I said, if I was still the Minister of Municipal Affairs, that would have to be one of the recommendations of of the bill: is that the capacity grant be increased, uh, maybe not doubled. You know, I think there was a recommendation not to double it. Like I think that that would be ultimately a decision of government. The more money, the better. I would never want to advocate against money uh, for communities, but I think if the, if the, if the Sermgar recommendation around um, uh, around uh, that, that portion of it probably would have helped a lot in the conversation, not only with CBRM, but the other communities that are in Bill 340 that, that uh, over, the, uh, over the lifetime of the contract uh, will see less uh, equalization, uh, or not equal, uh, less capacity grant. And, you know, as I said last night, uh, Madam Speaker, you know, I, I hope we get to a point with communities that you don't need a capacity grant. I, you, you hope that a community uh, can support uh, itself uh, economically and socially, uh, that, it can, that it can provide the best supports to, to people that, uh, that need the help the most. And um, I just, I, I just, I, I just see a clear path. It, 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 nothing's easy in a negotiation, of course. Uh, but I think the first step of the negotiation, uh, in, in looking at this bill and what we'll talk about tonight, is goodwill. And I, uh, you know, I, I get in my, you know, I've been in my place speaking on this bill, probably more than any time I've ever spoke on. On anything in here, uh, and it's been it's been great. There's nothing better than I love being a councillor. I love representing local government, as as many of us do. We you know many many of us did, and continue to do. And and I think we take that foundation of municipal politics into this job. I think it gives you a different perspective when it comes to some of the challenges and and you know your experiences of taking you know being the, in 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 the shoes of a councillor and and uh, the fact that they. They really are dealing with uh, every level of government kind of issues and, and supports and advocacy uh, in their communities. They're the front line for most things. Backyard issues, I like to call them. Issues in your backyard. Councillors are dealing with. We deal with them as MLAs, but but ultimately, you know, my time on council, it uh, it was an honor to do it.
So, you know, to be in the legislature and to be able to not only talk about home, but you know, talk, talk about the Bill 340. And <laughs> I'm trying. You didn't cut me off yet, Madam Speaker. We got 19 minutes. See if they, I know you're getting close. You're getting close. As I said, I'm being, I'm being diplomatic about it. But, uh, but, but it is, you know, 340 is, is important. It is. It's a long time coming. It's a long time coming for, uh, for, for communities. And I know a lot of people put a lot of work into it. And uh, what we're going to advocate tonight is that, you know, I don't want to discredit their work at all. I think that you have a number of municipalities that have come forward that uh, this is going to benefit. Um, and that's great. Uh, I just don't think it's a good deal for CBRM. Uh, is it the, I just think that there just needs to be a separate deal. And, and as I said, and I'm sound repetitive, the government has offered that. And CBRM has kind of accepted it. And it's how do we get to a point where everybody gets in a room, council gets to make their motion, uh, government uh, comes to them in, in good faith, and they sit down uh, over the next year and hammer out that deal. Uh, and get away from what, what happened, uh, which I argue ultimately premiers make decisions on, on, on policy and how their government's going to work. Um, and, you know, there's just been a lot of negativity that was unnecessary. And, uh, you know, I'm going to repeat this again. Uh, I said it earlier and I said I was going to say it again is that I, uh, the, the letter has been referenced. And um, as I said, uh, and you know, I, 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 I've known the minister for almost nine years. And, and that's not the tone of, that, of, of the man that I know as the minister. And uh, I think he, know, he wants what's best for, for every community. Uh, I, I think, uh, I know he wants what's best here. We're into a heavy debate. Um, and uh, he'll have the opportunity to probably rebut and correct me, which I look forward to. Because, you know, I have a lot of respect for that department uh, in, in trying to do bills like 340 and trying to get these over the finish line, trying to negotiate with 49 municipalities, trying to do it. They're good people. And they've been uh, in a lot between floods and fires and EMO and, and some of the transition stuff that they're doing. Uh, I want to give staff all the credit in the world because at one point they, asked, you know, they did a lot for me, and this letter is not that. It's just not. Uh, that that's a political letter written by someone who decided that uh, it was okay to represent the Department of Municipal Affairs uh, and go directly to bureaucrats, which I've never seen in my career. I still have a bit of a career left, God willing, but. But uh, there's some pretty heavy language in there uh, towards, uh, towards uh, the CBRM, uh, and there's some misinformation when it comes to dates and deadlines, and there's no deadline on this. We're debating it. We're using the hours under the law that we have to debate it. Um, and uh, there's no threat of it being pulled off. The, the opposition can't pull it off the table. Um, Bill 340. And uh, I always get back to the bill, Madam Speaker. But, but, but it, and, and, and I think that, that that letter alone, that was kind of the, the letter that really just set the tone for Bill 340 and the negativity of... of uh, <laughs> Order. <laughs> I have to say, just because you say Bill 340 does not mean you're speaking to the content of the bill. I ask that you speak to the content of the bill, okay. please. I recognize the honorable member for Sydney member two. You have to admit it was impressive for 45 minutes though, kind of waving around. <laughs> you were let go. go. I'm, I'm, go I'm going to the bill, so in my last moments. Uh, bill 340. Bill 340, no, it's, Listen, I, I'm, I'm happy to follow the rules of the host, um, and uh, it's, uh, it's always a, a, an art form to see some, some, some of the great orders I've seen in here 
Uh, I'm not one of the. No, I'm not one of them. But I've seen some people give some great speeches. I always. The minister gave one on blueberries. I referenced it last night. It was excellent. But uh, on Bill 340, on Bill 340, uh, tonight we're going to go through a bunch of amendments. Bill 340 works for a lot of communities. Uh, that's fantastic. You have a lot of communities come forward and support it. We're happy. I'm happy that I had colleagues get up tonight and talk in favor of it themselves. I personally will not be voting for Bill 340. Uh, and the reason why I will not be voting for Bill 340 uh, is because of the challenges that we've heard from home. The challenges that we heard around the negotiations of Bill 340 with the community, uh, some of the challenges uh, that they faced uh, in having those conversations, some of the messaging that has come forward uh, as a result of Bill 340 from staff, uh, and um, also looking at the bill and, and saying uh, it does not represent uh, what I've seen in my time uh, living in the community, that, that the bill works for a lot of communities, but for CBRM, which is much, which is much larger and has a different set of unique challenges uh, that, that I, th I really think CBRM needs to have their own deal. And uh, as I said, this is about Bill 340. There needs to be uh, another bill, if it's a bill or a contract or an agreement with CBRM. Bill 340 is a reflection of <coughs> the, the recommendations. It doesn't, it doesn't reflect the rec recommendations of many of the recommendations that came from, from the CERMGAR committee in regards to the capacity grant, uh, in regards to the education, freezing the educational costs, which was also a recommendation. That never made it to the bill. Uh, if, that, if those aspects made it to the bill, Madam Speaker, I probably would have stopped talking in the first 20 minutes when this bill came to the floor. Because these are some of the big issues. It, it comes down to the fact that some, some communities, including CBRM, uh, over time will lose some of that capacity grant. Um, and I don't think Bill 340 is costed out enough to the point that we've seen the increase in costs for infrastructure and what it means to build neighborhoods and build communities and put the infrastructure in around communities that, that I think that at, 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 for any of these communities that are that are accessing the capacity grant, you don't want to see anybody lose. Uh, and you know, Sermon Grant came back with a with a fifteen million dollar recommendation. I wish the government would have. That wasn't even a doubling of the grant. I wish the government actually would have looked at it. So uh, so everybody would have would have benefited from it. I just think it's for a government that has as much money as this government has, and we've heard it, they're focused on health care, but this is about Bill 340. But the point I'm making, Madam Speaker, is that the amount of money that, that this government has received in transfers and stuff, I think $15 million uh, to top up that capacity grant would have been uh, an excellent move because, as I said in mul multiple speeches, I think the best thing a government can do is have a strong relationship with the municipalities. Because they're building roads, they're building infrastructure. Um, you can expand the scope of responsibilities. You can work in partnership on, on some of the challenges that we're facing in, in today's communities around, you know, finding housing and cost of living, and 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 as I said, some of the non-traditional uh, aspects. Well, councils are into everything, as you know, Madam Speaker. But but they're now being asked to provide more resources into those supports, and. Um, in, in an environment where, where the government had uh, additional cash, uh, they made some decisions. They have to live by those decisions. Uh, there, there are debates for other bills and question periods and other days. But um, that recommendation around the $15 million really would have went a long way. And uh, I can't speak of the government for why they didn't put that in, but it probably would have cut this debate off a lot. I think everybody agrees. I, I don't think anybody is going to disagree with that. I think, for, especially for the councillors around the room, uh, the councillors around the room, uh, the former councillors, that uh, that they know the cost of business for these communities. Um, they know the challenges, and, and I come from a larger municipality, so it's 
you know, I'm, I'm more urban, but you know, I went on tour and I met with a lot of the councillors and they came forward with their infrastructure issues and 340 helps with some of that for them because they're receiving additional money and, and uh, they, they, we talked a lot about internet and we talked a lot about um, we talked about a lot of issues and now we're talking about, you know, councils are into the conversations about housing and you're seeing, you know, federal money coming in for rapid housing and you're seeing all of these new initiatives coming in and, you know, this is a huge file. It's become, you know, if you look at, you know, issues like, you know, your traditional tr traditional issues around, you hear a lot about, well, health care and the economy. Now it's, it's, it's cost of living, it's health care, it's the economy, it's housing, it's, it's inflation, it's, it's a number of things. So council, councils are dealing with all of this. Uh, so they're, 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 they're screaming for resources. So uh, that recommendation from, from, from Cerngar to, to uh, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right, but, but, uh, but that, that recommendation to add more money to that pot would have, would have been beneficial to everyone, and, uh, including CBRM. And uh, maybe CBRM would have been happy with Bill 340 at that point. If you look at the education costs, too, and you, and you look at some of these aspects, if, if that was worked out, maybe 340 works for everybody. And, you know, there's also the question mark around HRM, who wasn't consulted on Bill 340, uh, that indicated they probably should have been part of the conversation. And uh, they, uh, they should have been, because what they've said is maybe 340 worked for them. And I'd say 340 a lot, Madam Speaker. I'm, I'm, t I'm following your rules. Um, so, uh, so here we are, uh, another night in the legislature. Uh, and uh, it's been, as I said, there's been a lot of conversation uh, about uh, Bill 340 and, and the impacts that it is, uh, the good impacts it's going to have on communities and the challenges that it's going to create for, for others. And uh, I'll take my last few minutes just to talk about home quickly and why ultimately I'm on my feet. Uh, CBRM is 100,000, uh, a community that was created at the same time as HRM under the same foundation of HRM, that you, they were going to be a super city, that they uh, were coming off of a huge transition from coal and steel uh, which resulted in a population of approximately 125,000 taking a, a big dip pretty quick. And um, it's been a journey. It's been a journey of, of trying to establish a new foundation of, of an economy, uh, moving, uh, we still have fishing, we still have other aspects, and we, we have smaller, uh, smaller pieces of our, of, of our fabric when it comes to mining and, and resource development. But, but ultimately, it's a community that uh, through all of its challenges, has maintained uh, a population in the vicinity of 100,000 uh, and is now on the cusp of really taking off. And now the minister talked about it today in question period. And, and I give the government credit for the investments that we made. We made investments too as well. It's been referenced. Um, and <clears throat> so as we, as we hit this peak of growth, I think I think the day is going to come for the CBRM when the capacity grant will be a thing of the past, but it's not right now. Right now, the government has a chance to, to ensure that the CBRM is whole, treat it for its uniqueness, and be that really second hub of the province, uh, uh, that second largest population centre, uh, uh, a place, a destination to, to open business. Uh, a place for newcomers to uh, be welcomed uh, into the community, uh, and they're just—they're asking for just a little more time. Uh, and, and as I said, came to Halifax, um, offered some amendments, and said they're willing to work with uh, with the government. And the government, in turn, said the same thing. So I just want somebody to take the lead. Give, you want to give them a charter, give them a charter. But you got to sit down and figure out how that all looks. And as I said, I, I went into the speech last night and I came into the speech again tonight not looking for, uh, did not to table a pile of documents. That's been done. Uh, I also have to be an advocate for home. And the best thing for home uh, is that everybody just get back to the table. And uh, CBRM has offered the olive branch, and so is, so is the minister. 
uh, and so uh, the, the department. And all I can do at this point is, is, is uh, you know, 340 for the communities that are happy, wonderful. I got colleagues on my side. This is a benefit to their community. Um, that's excellent. This has been a long time coming. I would not want to take that away from, from the work that people have done to it. I was, I was on tour in 2017. I met you, I met the few members uh, on the other side. Uh, and uh, I remember these conversations. So this government has got it this far. And the next government will have to deal with the education costs and they're going to have to deal with some of the other aspects of what the MOU looks like in the future. Um, and that's fine. This is the beginning, this is the start of it. So just all I can uh, do on Bill 340, uh, uh, Madam Speaker, is just implore everyone to uh, just take the time to talk. Like I said, it's free charge. Go to the CBRM, talk to the mayor and council, talk to the staff, no more letters, no more correspondence. CBRM has offered the opportunity, the government has offered the opportunity. Get your MOU done or whatever that looks like if you're willing to do it. I believe the government is willing to do that because they've offered a charter. Uh, the MOU is like a charter to me. You can, you can do it all at once, however you want to do it. Both parties want to do it. Somebody's got somebody's to step up. And somebody's got to just say, okay, who's going to lead the charge here? Two minutes, 53 seconds left, Madam Speaker. I wonder how many times I said Bill 340 in an hour. But uh, I appreciate the opportunity to get up. And I know that my colleagues on all sides have listened to me talk about this at length uh, for the last little while uh, and other, uh, other members of my caucus. Um, and I love home. It's wonderful. The community's great. The community, but the community's been through a lot. Uh, and uh, through it all, um, and, and as the members said last night, we're all proud of where we're from. We're all proud of the towns that we grew up in and we represent. And we may have a different opinion on how we get to the end of this thing uh, for an MOU for CBRM. Uh, I agree, three, 340 could have worked if the capacity grant was more. I'll say that. If the capacity grant was more and the recommendation came, 340 I think would have worked for everyone. I do. I think a, a negotiation is you got to meet somewhere in the middle, right? So, so if that if that's increased, we're not having this debate, in my opinion. There'll be other there's other issues, the roads and other. We would be having a, it wouldn't be as much of a. This doesn't work as much for one community compared to the rest. Although the argument is still there that CBRM is ten times the size, but I think that that recommendation around the capacity grant really could have, really could have. Uh, stopped a lot of the conversation I think that we were having in here tonight, but that's okay. You know what I mean? We're, that's what we do. We debate. We're using the hours that we have and and uh, eventually this will go to uh, uh, third reading and, and it, will, it will pass. So um, I'm going to use, I got to use my last minute. So, so I'm proud of home. I'd like, I'd like to use my last minute this way. <laughs> I'm proud of home. I'm proud of council. They stood their ground. Many of them uh, I've worked with are my friends. You may not agree with their approach, but other governments have used the same approach. I won't go there. But they fought for their community. They fought for what was right. The government representatives fought for what was right. We debated the issues that matter to us. And there's been a lot of information. There's been a lot of correspondence. We're now into Bill 340. We have some, some tangible amendments that are coming from CBRM. Maybe government will support them. One of them's easy. Uh, and that's just to pick up the phone and have a conversation. And uh, I think in my career and in life itself, no matter how challenging an issue may be or a relationship, uh, sometimes it's just the opportunity to sit down and say hello. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I recognize the honorable member for Colchester North.
Thank you, Madam Speaker. I uh, beg leave to make an introduction, if I could. Yes, please do. Uh, Mr. S Madam Speaker, in, I think she's uh, still here in the Speaker's Gallery, is a good friend, uh, uh, Municipal Councillor from Colchester, um, a tremendous community asset, long-time 4-H worker. Uh, if you stand up, Lisa, Lisa Patton. Um, I had to actually get the a special permission to get her in the speaker's gallery because I didn't have the heart to ask her to go over and sit on this side, on the other side. And the reason is Lisa and her family have been good friends of mine for a long time. Her father uh, became a good friend of mine after he beat the tar out of me in the, night, in the provincial election in 1993. Her, her father was former MLA uh, agriculture minister in the, in the Liberal government, Ed Lorraine. Um, and uh, I, I really want to, uh, I actually got Lisa to sit here and listen to that long-winded speech uh, or the member from Sydney member to, uh, so I could get to introduce her. But uh, anyway, uh, Lisa Patton is a great asset to our community. I've been doing my best to get her to, to come to the good side. But anyway, great friend, great community worker, and I, I thank her for everything she does. Uh, please accept it. Welcome to the province house. I hope you enjoy your time here. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Economics and Development. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I rise to add just a few comments on this bill. Order, order. There's little excitement in the room after the introduction. Um, I'd ask that everyone hush a little bit. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Economics. Thank you, Madam Chair. So certainly all three um, municipalities in my constituency are very supportive of this bill. The brand new mayor of the town of Lunenburg uh, writes of the great benefit um, that this uh, bill provides and uh, that he is looking forward to working together with government within the framework of this agreement, and I can certainly table a copy of that. Certainly, the mayor of the municipality of the district of Lunenburg was, uh, uh, her worship, the Honourable Carolyn Bolivar Getson, was very central to the negotiations that informed this bill and speak to what I believe is the widespread uh, appreciation for it. This is a bill that the leader of the opposition himself has said that he's supporting and he is offering a free vote among members of his caucus. And yet, he has railed against this bill for at least three hours. Madam Speaker, he can't have his cake and eat it too. This bill means over $50 million for our municipalities. It is a good bill. But don't take my word for it. Take the word of Yarmouth County Warden John Cunningham, who writes in part, on behalf of Council, I want to express the municipality of Yarmouth's gratitude for the work completed to date by government and by the Service Exchange, Exchange Renegotiation and MGA Review Committee. Bill 340 represents an important incremental step to modernize the relationship between the province of Nova Scotia and municipal governments in Nova Scotia. And I will table that. With those comments, Madam Chair, I will sit. I, I recognize the Honourable Minister for. Oh, I, I recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Chair. I stand to make a few comments on Clause One of Bill 340, an Act respecting municipal contributions and grants. And uh, I will be supporting this uh, bill, Madam Chair, uh, because I've heard from the councillors in uh, Cumberland North that uh, are asking me to support this. And we are here to 
uh, portray the wishes of the people what, that we represent. Having said that, Madam Chair, I do want to share, so it's on the record, um, and I have shared this with the, those that I've spoken with back home, I do have concerns about the bill. And those that have called me and spoken to me about the bill, I did share with them my concerns that there's too much in regulations. And Madam Chair, uh, even though the CAOs of our municipal governments are being told that they will no longer have to contribute to corrections or housing, when you read the bill that we have to vote on, uh, that we're expected uh, to vote on, it specifically says uh, in the bill, both under corrections and housing, that the municipalities will, will be paying a contribution to the province for the fees. So uh, it doesn't, it's not clear to me, and the, those that have uh, prepared this bill have been given more information than what we've been given, even though we're the ones that are, su that are supposed to be uh, voting on this bill and we're the ones that uh, are, are uh, casting our vote in support or against. So those that I've spoken to have shared with me numbers that they've been told, but um, I don't have any, any formula in front of me, Madam Chair, that tells me that those numbers are accurate. I hope that they are. Uh, for the sake of all of our municipalities. Uh, certainly in my experience, uh, I've been given something to sign, uh, asked to sign something that was not, that was not what I had agreed upon. And uh, I think that it's uh, a cause for concern, Madam Chair, that all of the information is not being give, given in this bill and that there's too much information in regulations. So uh, I am hopeful that everything that the municipalities have been promised is going to actually be the case, Madam Chair. But I, I do have concerns. Certainly the, the municipalities around the province have been asking for municipal reform for this municipal service exchange agreement for many years. And uh, there's certainly been a lot of uh, discussion around things that municipalities have not been happy with and they don't believe that they should have to contribute to uh, provincial services like corrections, like housing. Uh, J-Class Roads has is, is, is always been controversial as well. In preparing and reading this bill, I went back and looked, uh, Madam Chair, at the discussion paper that was published back in December of 1993, and then the actual Provincial Municipal Service Exchange Agreement uh, from October. Order. I just would like to put a reminder that you cannot take pictures in the house. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Chair. In preparing for um, Bill 340 and just to help myself uh, have more knowledge, Madam Chair, I read through the Provincial Municipal Service Exchange that was printed back in October 1994 and then was put into, uh, uh, I guess the agreement was for August 1st, 1995, and that's what we've had in place here in Nova Scotia for the Provincial Municipal Service Exchange since then. And it's really interesting, Madam Chair, when you look back at this agreement, this Provincial Municipal Service Exchange Agreement that was dated October uh, 1994, so almost 30 years ago, and uh, it even has the speech from the minister at the time. And it's something if anyone else has time to read, I'm sure you'd find it, find it very, very interesting. It goes through the history of when uh, social services became under provincial responsibility, that used to be under, under municipal, and all the other changes that took place at that time, such as policing that used to be paid for the, by the province but was put under, under municipal. Now, one of the comments that I wanted to make, Madam Chair, was around commercial taxes. And after all, this Provincial Municipal Service Exchange Agreement that, that this is reforming, after all, it is all about money, Madam Chair, and how much money the municipalities are collecting and how much money uh, they have to give to the province and vice versa. The bottom line is that the money is coming from the taxpayer 
and we are seeing huge increases in assessment rates, uh, assessments for people around the province, both residential and commercial, and uh, people cannot afford the increases that they're seeing in their property rates, both residential and commercial. So I do en encourage the minister responsible for municipal affairs to take a look at other initiatives as well where the taxpayer can get some, some uh, relief. And I encourage the minister to take a look at what New Brunswick next door are doing. They're, they're making some positive changes to give the taxpayer some relief. I'm not sure if there's something funny, Madam Chair. Excuse me? Oh, sorry, I just saw you laughing. I just didn't no, know I was not funny. laughing, thank you. I did smile. Yeah, and I can. Okay. Yeah. All right. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I do did want to mention that in relation to uh, this bill to bring it back to the taxpayer and uh, just to remind the minister to, to be looking for some municipal tax reforms for the taxpayer because that is, uh, at the end of the day, um, people need to be able to afford uh, their taxes. And right now it's very confusing for people. Uh, Madam Chair, the tax rates are, uh, what they're paying is based on two things. It's, it's based on their market value assessment as well as the tax, the tax rate. And when people call my office and complain about their tax bill, uh, they'll go to the municipality who will say, well, it's not our fault, it's the province that sets the market value assessment. And then the province will come back and say, well, it's the, it's the municipality that have set the tax rate. So it's really uh, not easy for the taxpayer, Madam Chair, in this situation. It's very confusing for them. And I do think it's really important that we are always looking for ways to uh, bring some tax relief to the consumer uh, and to the residents here in Nova Scotia. And with those few words, I will take my seat. But like I said, I, I will be supporting this bill based on the feedback that I have been provided uh, from the municipal leaders uh, in Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Chair. I recognize the Honourable Member for Shelburne. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll keep my words brief. Uh, I, I just wanted to, to stand in support of this bill. I have five municipal units that would be in, in uh, my constituency, one of which would have uh, the highest tax rate in, in the province, which is Lockport. Um, all, of the, all of the units will be getting, they're all in support. I have one letter here I'll read in a minute. But having been a former municipal councillor and stuff and understanding the costs, um, you know, with, with housing or with, uh, with corrections, knowing that they're variable, it's, it's really good that those costs would no longer be included. If you look at, um, I think, the town of Clarks Harbour, you know, they had their FCIs in the red a couple of years ago over a housing project, right? So I think it gives better control over the municipalities' uh, costs and expenses. And, and every one of the five units that I spoke with, Shelburne, Town of Shelburne, Lockport, Clarks Harbour, Municipality of Barrington, are, are all in support of this. This is a good deal. Um, Good afternoon. This is from Municipality of Shelburne. Good afternoon. I talked to the Deputy Warden in regard to the Table Demo Use Service Exchange, uh, and we are in support of these four items, the, the housing, the surplus schools, corrections, and upstate's admissible finance capacity. Uh, this is our understanding that roads, option B, are no longer included. Many thanks. And that's from the, the Municipality of Shelburne. So with, with those few words, uh, I just wanted to let everyone know I'd support this bill. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Community Services. Oh, sorry, I, I recognize the Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, I'll uh, try to be brief as possible when it comes to Bill 340. And uh, I, I would agree with the Honourable Member from Shelburne that removing the costs for uh, corrections and housing is not a bad thing. I think it's great that we remove those from 
their purview of municipal collections. And I agree 100% with that. And that, in CBRM's case, should be a direct flow through to reducing the tax rate for those amounts um, to the, to the, uh, to the residents. But I, I don't think Bill 340 goes far enough in the fact that I, I believe that we should also be removing the uh, amount that's charged to municipalities for education. Because in CBRM's case, and I tabled this document uh, the other day, the chart that shows CBRM is going to, the costs for education are going to increase by from 4.8 million to 8.257 million over the course of five to six years. And that's going to be a net uh, loss for CBRM. So while some parts of the bill are, uh, I support, I absolutely can't support the bill in its entirety because we can't support certain parts of the bill. It's either all or nothing. And in this particular case, I don't think it's gone far enough. I don't think um, education should be charged, and I think that in itself should be removed from the tax bill of the residents of CBRM and all residents of Nova Scotia. Education is a provincial responsibility as is housing, as is corrections, and should be dealt with by uh, the province. Therefore, that flow through tax directly to residents of CBRM should be removed. And that's great if that would, could happen, but that doesn't provide um, enough room for CBRM in particular. We're talking CBRM with its unique challenges around transit, with its unique challenges around policing and fire because of the size of the municipality. The capacity grant that's given is not enough. I don't agree with the fact that we're reducing the capacity grant from 15 million to 13 over the period of five years because right now CBRM is unable to survive on the capacity grant that they currently are forced to live with. The Premier in, in his campaign in 2021, in August of 2021, recognized that the capacity grant to municipalities was not sufficient and ran on a promise of doubling the capacity grant to all municipalities in the province of which CBRM receives a large chunk of that because of the nature of the finances and the levels of poverty at CBRM. The agreement was that the capacity grant would be doubled until such time as a new agreement could be negotiated with municipalities. The problem with that is we are, and we've talked about this in the past, is that we're lumping CBRM, which is the second largest municipality in the province, in with 47 other municipalities which are much smaller in size. CBRM being 10 times bigger than the next closest municipality in the system that falls under Bill 340. We talked about the letter that was sent to CBRM with the options. Option one being take the agreement as is and have corrections and housing come out of it. 
We talked about the fact that the $4.5 million in savings really wasn't $4.5 million in savings. It's $4.5 million in flow-through costs that are no longer required to be paid to the province by the municipal unit, which is collected directly from residents. So it's a positive for residents, there's no question. However, it's not a cash windfall for CBRM because they don't take those funds out of general revenues like maybe some other municipalities do. So Bill 340, in my opinion, causes hardship for CBRM and again it's it's about it it's I'm torn because it's good for some municipalities and not so good for others I think there was something like 17 municipalities that are going to end up with less money over time because of the increases in educational funding that's required to be paid to the province and I'm not sure that every municipal unit has, has realized that educational costs are going to continue to grow over time um, and, and their, their net windfall uh, will be reduced by that amount each year. So I think that we need to look at all aspects of municipal funding when we're talking about Bill 340 and the capacity grants. For me, there, there is a, a, a simple solution, and I talked about this a little bit yesterday, to the whole idea of making this agreement happen. It's a separate agreement with CBRM, we need to take away the idea of this $4.5 million cap because that's not an agreement. You might as well just continue along with the MOU. We need to double the capacity grant to where it was in year one of the mandate of this government which would then provide 30 extra million for CBRM, which, you know, we heard the minister um, talk about the fact that it was a tax savings mm -hmm. for big corporations. And, you know, I'm sure if, if uh, we were to look at that, there was tax savings for all residents, which then had to be roll back because of the change in the capacity grant the following year. So as a resident, in one year they saw a reduction in their taxes only to be clawed back the following year because they took, and you know, we saw some of the comments from uh, the councillors at CBRM and when they voted for that, uh, that tax reduction, they did so because they thought in good faith the government was going to hold true to their promise and renegotiate the capacity grant, not reduce it. We heard... Um, the member for city member to talk about the changes in time since he was a municipal councillor to today and what was required to run the municipality. Back in 2012, there were 40 more employees at CBRM than there are today. Transit has grown by 400% in the municipality, yet they still have the same number of mechanics to operate the buses. They still have the same number of employees to run the, run the system. 
and the system is going to, at some point, run itself into the ground. Mr. Chair, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that we have a municipality and uh, today we heard Minister um, of Housing and Municipal Affairs talk about the fact that CBRM is in growth mode, it's in, it's in an uphill climb, and they will tell you the same thing. They're poised, poised over the next number of years to be in good shape but it's gonna take some time to get there. And CBRM needs a hand to get from today to those couple of years out when they see the benefits of all of the work that's happening in CBRM right now. The new NSCC campus, which is accepting students already for 2024. the new hospitals, the healthcare, the billion dollars worth of infrastructure that's being built in CBRM that was started under the former Liberal government and is being continued and completed under the current government. These are all great things for CBRM. However, Bill, C, Bill 340 doesn't get them where they need to be. Who knows? And I, I think it was the, the, the member for Sydney member two talked about the fact that five years from now, 10 years from now, seven years from now, CBRM may not even need a capacity grant. if the growth continues, but it has to be growth that's managed because as we know, we need the infrastructure and the services to support the growth that CBRM is experiencing. And the current setup of this bill doesn't allow for that. There's not enough funds for CBRM to move in the direction that they need to move. They've already cut services and I'm, I, I, I'm going to rephrase my, my um, when I talk about the tax rates and say CBRM has one of the highest in the system in Nova Scotia. They can't afford to raise taxes anymore. The idea that there's room and, uh, you know, we, we saw the, the fun little, uh, video that is put out on Twitter that takes excerpts of people's uh, speeches and uh, takes them into context. I would like to remind the creator of that video that the gap in taxes that is talked about was, taught, was proposed by the cons Progressive Conservative Party to CBRM. It's not a real number, it's not a real figure. There's no capacity in CBRM to raise property taxes. We're continuing to see a rise in property values in CBRM. We talked uh, last night at length about uh, CFO Campbell's presentation to law amendments, which I thought was very well done, where 
she talked about a, a young family, two people working, making $120,000. And that sounds like a lot of money. But really, in today's context, a, a couple making $120,000 a year between the two of them is quite average. It's above average. And for them to purchase a modest home at $250,000, their property taxes in CBRM would be over $5,400 a year, or 4.6% of their income. And we know that the maximum livable average is around 4% of income that's considered adequate or in the right zone for taxation. In CBRM, anybody looking to purchase or looking to, we've heard members talk about the fact that they would love to downsize and which would be wonderful for part of the housing pro problems that we're seeing. You have these homes with two, three, four bedrooms, which is way too much when you get older to try and clean and try and maintain. but people can't afford to downsize because when they do, the value of the property that they're buying is similar to the value of the property they're in and their taxes are gonna be higher than what they're currently paying because they're, if they've been in their home quite some time, they're likely capped. So looking at a doubling of the capacity grant and the effect that that would have on CBRM, it, it was laid out pretty clear in CFO Campbell's presentation when she talked about what was required in a negotiation. There wasn't a lot of detail to it because there's not a lot of detail required. It was to remove corrections, remove housing, which is already talked about in Bill 340. In addition, take away the cost pressure of education and put that where it belongs, under the province's purview. That would allow the CBRM to lower the tax rate to a reasonable level. And a doubling of the capacity grant. And there could be caveats to that. You know, let's double it for a period of five years and then renegotiate. Maybe that could be a sliding scale at some point. <coughs> and I really love the, uh, the member from Sydney Member 2's analysis around what is equalization and what is not equalization. Equalization is a number of things. Equalization comes in the form of health care, comes in the form of roads, comes in the form of 
municipal services comes in the form of policing. It comes in many different forms, but the premise of equalization of comparable services for comparable taxes is what's really important for me. And when we need to compare communities to lump CBRM in with 47 other municipalities of which the closest sized municipality to CBRM is 10 times smaller, automatically you would assume that there is no comparison. We're comparing apples and oranges and trying to make apple juice. It just doesn't fit. Similarly, I talked about this last night, comparing CBRM to Halifax is also comparing apples to oranges. They don't fit. So CBRM should be pulled from the agreement and negotiated based on its unique characteristics. And this, in my opinion, is all about relationships. We've all had friends and family that we've had good relationships with over the years and not so good relationships with over the years. But at the end of the day, we're all on the same team, we're all in the same boat, we're all family, we're all friends. Nothing can't be worked out and negotiated. Right now, it would appear that the relationship between CBRM and the provincial government is apples and oranges. However, there's no issue with those two groups coming together for a common goal. And that's, that's generally when we have a problem with a relationship. We need to look at what is our common interest? Well, in this particular case, the common interests, as far as I can tell, are a strong CBRM, a strong Nova Scotia, a strong HRM, and a strong 47 other municipal units across the province. Because when we all have that sh collective strength, we're gonna be that much better able to compete in the global world that we find ourselves in. So I would urge the municipality and I would urge the province to put the situation behind and work together on that common goal of getting a deal done. And I'm sure it can happen. In any negotiation, very rarely is it possible for both, both parties to get 100% of, of what they want because that's not a negotiation that's generally That would be a dictatorship, I guess, on either side. Um, both sides have to be flexible in determining, you know, CBRM needs to actually look at their 
facilities at their books and determine, okay, we've asked for this, what exactly would it take for us to have a deal? The province can look at their side and say, we've offered the same thing that we've offered to other municipalities, but the situation is different in CBRM. It's unique. How can we change and cost it out? Like, what would be the actual cost of not charging municipalities for education? We know in CBRM's case, it's about 16 million a year. Halifax would be more than that. But the other 47 municipalities across the province would be significantly less than that. So if we said the cost to the province is 100 million, just pulling a number out of thin air, because I haven't looked, I don't know exactly what that number is. We've gotten way more than that in the increased revenues. Way more than that in the cumulative surpluses that we've seen over the last number of years. <clears throat> so that would tell me that it's doable. And I, I, I know uh, I know that there's a mandate and everything stems around health care. I completely understand that. But the government has made record investments in health care over the last um, over the last number of years, of which we haven't seen any changes, any difficult, any changes in the metrics other than them going down. Um, so the money is there for health care. If we were to take some of this surplus that didn't get spent in health care and apply that to municipal units to help our residents pay less taxes, which in turn would help residents have more money in their pockets, which in turn would help residents with food, lodging, heat, housing, which are all determinants of health care and good health. So whether we invest specifically in that system or in another way, we are improving health care in the province. In its current form, 340 doesn't allow us to do that. And I'm grateful to the leader of the party who has said, you know what, there are municip municipal units that this is going to be good for, and there may be municipal units that currently it's not good for, so vote your conscience. Vote for or against the bill based on how it affects the residents where you live. Could this bill, with changes or amendments, of which we'll see as, as, as time goes on, there's a lot of changes recommended to the whole, uh, the whole bill in different clauses. If some of those were implemented, that may change the way that we feel, certain of us feel about this bill. And it would certainly change probably the way 
that some municipal units feel about the bill. All I can do as a representative of my community is stand here and let the House know how it's going to affect the people of my community. And right now, if this bill is passed and CBRM is included in it, it's going to mean an increase in taxes for the people of my community, which is not something that I can support yet or vote for or allow to happen. We've seen the municipal unit where I come from very thoughtfully put out the reasons that they can't support the bill. They came, they came to law amendments and were very respectful and were very thoughtful about their arguments. As, as I've continued to say, um, you know, it's hard to argue with numbers. And when we look at the net effect of Bill 340 on the finances of CBRM, and I'm only talking CBRM, the net transfer to the province from CBRM, even with corrections and housing removed will increase by $4 million over the life of this agreement from 2023 through till 2029, 2030. The net transfer will go from 4.8 million negative from CBRM to the province to 8.257 million. which is close to $4 million difference. So, if we were to factor that out by resident of the CBRM, that's a significant amount of tax dollars that CBRM is going to have to justify collecting from its residents in order to satisfy the increase in transfer to the province of Nova Scotia. And if the province continues to have these big swings financially, <laughs> where we predict a 500 million deficit and we land with 150 million surplus, pretty soon residents of CBRM and residents of other municipalities are going to look at this and say, where in the heck is this coming from? How can you show that big of a swing year after year after year and not give some of that back? through to, through the municipal taxation, through to the residents of Nova Scotia and CBRM. It just, it, it boggles my mind how we've gotten here where we are today with 340. And looking back, We all had high hopes for um, our municipal partners when this government came in because like when, when the government 
indicated, hey, we're going to double the capacity ground. I thought, wow, that's recognizing that there's an issue with the way municipalities are funded and the capital grant, whatever you want to call it, uh, equalization, municipal capital, whatever. It's the amount that goes from the province to the areas that are needing it based on a number of factors. Maybe it's time that we, and, and, and I thought part of this whole idea was looking at um, how this, this fund gets distrib distributed. And as we talked uh, the other night, I think the fund is 30 million-ish, uh, 20 million-ish of it is funded by Nova Scotia Power. So the province's contribution through the equalization payment of 2.85 billion that comes from the feds every year is 10 million. And I, I know uh, folks will tell me that there's other things involved, and I understand that. There's, there's all kinds of things involved in calculating um, where the equalization money from the, from the feds is spent. And I'm not saying that hundreds of million, millions of dollars at this point need to, uh, need to go to CBRM because there's other things that come into play, but a fair amount, a comparable amount of equalization funding should be going to CBRM to offset the differences in the taxes that the residents are paying. And that's just, to me, common sense. We shouldn't expect residents of one area, which is the furthest away from the capital, to pay more for the same services. That's what equalization is all about. Mm -hmm. And I look at um, I look at 340 as a mechanism to start the change that's required. For years, CBRM has talked about its needs and its inability to get ahead and successive governments have not dealt with the unique needs of CBRM. But there's an opportunity right now for this government to make history. But we're not seeing that in this bill. This bill is more about status quo. It's more about lumping CBRM in with everybody else, all of the smaller municipalities, and heck, CBRM, and, and I feel bad that this is being held up for those municipalities that are going to benefit from this agreement. It will eventually pass through. But it's our job to do our best to help the government see, in particular, for one municipality in this province, the second biggest municipality in the province, with unique issues, unique growth, to be treated the same 
as a municipality that doesn't have those specific challenges. And the challenge of transit is a huge undertaking for any municipality to try and fund. A growth of 400% we see for the first time ever, people actually waiting for transit, lined up for transit. It's a great problem to have, don't get me wrong. It's a great problem that CBRM is seeing such a growth in population. However, growth that goes unmanaged is creating problems for those folks. There's no infrastructure for them to live. There's no ability from them to get from point A to point B. We've just seen uh, a new route added through West Mountain Coxeath, which is long overdue. But the funds are not there to maintain and to grow the system. CBU has had to kick in funds to purchase buses because the municipality can't. They don't have the ability under the current funding structure. They can't cut any deeper. The, the fact that you have a municipality of 100,000 people, which was made up of so many small municipalities, were forced to amalgamate in 1995 and to not have their grant change since then just blows my mind. And to have their grant not change since 1995 until Bill 340 is going to take it down by $2 million. I don't know how we can ever see the logic we know that things have become more expensive in the last number of years so when you when you picture CBRM trying to maintain their bus fleet. Parts are more expensive. Fuel's more expensive. To buy buses is more expensive. And that's before we even get into police services, before we get into fire services, before we get into water and sewer and wastewater. I talked about this a little bit last night. Um, the north side is still waiting for wastewater. It's 160 to 100 to 200 million to, to build the system. But building the system is one thing. There's money for that out there. There's grants, there's federal capital infrastructure, provincial infrastructure. Then we talk about the maintenance and the running of those systems. Millions of dollars. We need to build this in because the tax base is not there. We, we, we've heard about the need for housing, the need for infrastructure within the CBRM, and 
We see it whenever we get the opportunity to be on the island. There's 10 cities in CBRM just like there are here in Metro, in HRM. You know, we, we see housing projects that can't happen because the funding is not there. We see infrastructure that can't happen because it can't afford to be maintained after it's built. I don't think that the parties are that far apart. I truly believe that a deal where there's a will, there's a way, a deal could be negotiated. You know, hopefully at the 11th hour, cooler heads will prevail and a deal can be struck with CBRM and the province of Nova Scotia. I know that there's a lot of capable people on both sides that would be very strong in negotiations. And as I said earlier, there's give and take in every form of negotiation. Maybe we can come up with an interim deal for a number of years, at least to phase in CBRM so that they can get that hand up to where they need to be to become sustainable, because right now they're not sustainable. And at the end of the day, the province is gonna to have to step in at some point anyway So why not do that up front? Do the hard work, the heavy lifting up front. And have both sides walk away with that picture that says we did it. We got this negotiated. It's a win-win for the government. It's a win-win for CBRM. But most of all, it's a win-win for the residents of Nova Scotia and the residents of CBRM. <clears throat> That's all that they can ask for because, you know, the residents of the community are not worried about who gets credit for solving this or who gets credit for growing the community, who gets credit for lowering taxes. Only the politicians care about that. And if we thought less about who gets credit and I want to get credit for this and I want to be in that picture and I want to do this and I want, as opposed to what's the right thing and all levels of government need to stop governing for two, four, six years. And we need to change the way we do politics and start making decisions for 30 years from now, for 20 years from now. You know, when I, when I look at the budget that was put forward last spring, and I see the growth in the deficit, that's not a budget even though it's not coming to fruition, it's not a budget that was put together with the future in mind. It's a budget that was short-sighted in the fact that we're gonna spend like crazy over this period of time and we're gonna burden <coughs> our children's children with the debt to 
the tune of an increased um, debt servicing of $900 million per year. That's a lot of money. We can come out of this in a win-win situation. We can ensure that CBRM gets a break. We can ensure that the rest of the municipalities in the province get what they need through Bill 340. And you've heard some of my colleagues talk about the benefits and we've heard some of the letters read from, from some of the municipalities where the government members reside. And as I said, that's great given the fact that there's been an improvement for some municipalities. But the proof is in writing on how it affects CBRM. It doesn't affect CBRM in a positive way. It pushes them further behind. We had the report from 2019 that indicates CBRM is in a situation of dire need and dire straits. We heard the member quote, the member from Inverness quote uh, Guns N' Roses earlier, so now I'm quoting dire straits. Um, you know, it's all of the evidence points to the fact that CBRM needs this hand up to get to where they're going so that they can get there and be re less reliant on the province, less reliant on the capacity grant. And at some point, as the, me the member for Sydney member two said, wouldn't it be wonderful if all the municipalities in this province got to a point where they required a capacity grant of zero. Because that would mean that everybody is doing well. Tax rates are lower, residents are thriving, municipalities are thriving, we're at growth in all areas, infrastructure's growing, and everything is sustainable, but we're not there yet. And by changing and making amendments to 340, pulling CBRM out, negotiating directly with them, that helps CBRM get there. The four and a half million, that's just a number pulled out of thin air. It's not real. It's not a true cost savings. It's simply an amount that is flowing through. And we should stop doing it because it's not right to be collecting that from the residents because it should be paid provincially out of our provincial tax dollars that we also, as residents, pay annually. <laughs> but it's going to take some time for us to get there. Pulling out of Bill 340 for CBRM and letting the rest of the municipalities go through who are happy with it would make things a lot simpler. Taking the time 
to negotiate the right deal with CBRM, but not penalizing them and, and not giving them ultimatums and not giving them letters that say, you shall do this or this, reply to me in nine days, or we're assuming you do this and that. That's not the way negotiations happen. Jump in a plane, a car, a bus, can't, you can only get a train as far as Truro. But go to CBRM, sit down with the administration. I would, I would even argue, keep all the politicians here in Halifax, keep all the politicians in Sydney, and have the two staff come together because the staff don't have any political plus or minus to them. All the staff is going to do is negotiate the best deal for both sides, what's required in order to make things work. <clears throat> CBRM is not asking for the moon. They can very easily negotiate, but it has to be done in good faith. So let's take the politics out of it. Let's, at a staff level, mend those fences, have that negotiation take place, bring the politicians in to sign the papers and do the ink. Whenever let that let them come together and come up with what works for both sides that's truly what's required here madam chair over the next number of days we're gonna see amendments come through on many of the clauses of Bill 340. And I would, I would urge the government members, I know it's rare for opposition amendments to be accepted by a majority government. I'm not naive, but I'm hopeful that as citizens of Nova Scotia, that you'll look at each of these amendments that come through and judge them not on where they come from or who they come from, but seriously take a look at them and what the impact may or may not be for your community and for the people of CBRM. Because at the end of the day, this is the only mechanism that we as opposition have to try and change or look at a bill. And the, the amendments that you're gonna see come forward have been well thought out, they're not stall tactics, it's none of that. It's legit things that we feel should be changed in the bill to make the bill better for the residents of Nova Scotia. And in particular, in my case, for the residents of my community, Northside Westmount, the broader CBRM, Cape Breton in general. So Madam Chair, I would urge for cooler heads to prevail, for the government staff to head to Cape Breton, CBRM staff to meet on a level playing field, negotiate a better deal for CBRM, and then we can all shake hands and be happy camper. So thank you, Madam Speaker. I'll end my comments there. I recognize the Honorable Minister of Community Services. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. and. Um, I just wanted to you know, stand up for a couple of minutes in, in support of Bill uh, 340. 
And um, I will uh, read a little bit from kind of a letter of support from Richmond. But, but before I do that, I, 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 Rich, you know, I just want to kind of get a couple of things on the record because Richmond was brought into this conversation uh, uh, at second reading. And um, a, a member opposite had tabled a, um, a report or an article um, suggesting that, um, you know, Richmond County had issues, uh, certainly with this bill. And when that was done, I was encouraged by a colleague across the way to kind of have a conversation with, with my colleagues, uh, my municipal colleagues in Richmond County, to understand what their concerns were. And so, so I did. I, I did just that. I reached out to the warden, had a conversation with a couple of councillors, and, and to their surprise, um, that this article was written that said they had those concerns. And I and I have that article that was presented by 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 the opposition that said Richmond Municipal Council wants assurances from the province that Bill 340 will not mean municipalities will end up paying for transportation infrastructure and I can I can table the same article that that was uh, tabled earlier um, what I would say madam Spe madam chair um, after my conversations with the warden and I and I believe they had a conversation with the person who, who wrote the article who was not at the council meeting uh, but did write the article um, but if, if I will table a new uh, new version of that article which basically says Richmond County or Richmond and I just wanted to get that on the record because I know it was brought forth in second reading and I just wanted to make sure that, that my, my, my municipal colleagues in Richmond Counts, uh, County were heard. And, and I will read a, a little bit from their letter of support, certainly with respect to Bill 340. So uh, it was a well thought out letter uh, by the council. And so the, the municipality of uh, council uh, or county of Richmond has been closely following the legislature debates on Bill 340. There's a great deal at stake for municipalities and we appreciate the complexity of attempting to strike a balance between provincial interests and the interests of the municipalities. Um, we also recognize that the current MOU is decades old and must be modernized to ensure that municipalities and ultimately our constituents are better served. After 18 months of consultations, recommendations have been made to make changes that will significantly impact municipal units, eliminating the requirements for municipalities to cover deficits for housing and corrections will save our county in excess of $400,000 annually. Funds we can reinvest in our communities or use to reduce our tax rate. We also look forward to the new cost sharing infrastructure program funds as our county faces a significant infrastructure deficit related to water and sewer systems in particular. Although Richmond County does not stand to benefit from changes to the programs for the province to take over obsolete schools built prior to 1981 or the road program for trunks and collectors for towns, we fully appreciate that these issues are top of mind for many municipalities as they grapple with their own infrastructure deficits. The letter goes on to say, we thank you for listening to the collective input of municipalities in pursuing modernization of the MOU and subsequently in moving the proposed road um, road proposal stream B to Schedule A for allow more uh, time for thoughtful discussion. Bill 340 and continued work on modernization of the MOU will have a great value to rural municipalities like Richmond County and to the citizens of Nova Scotia. So Madam, Madam Chair, I just wanted to make sure we got this on the record, make sure that I got on the record that uh, Richmond does in fact support Bill uh, 340 and I will be supporting Bill 340 as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. I recognize the Honourable Member for King South. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And I'm uh, pleased to rise to speak for a few minutes on, on Clause 1. Uh, I want to start um, by acknowledging that this is in the mandate letter uh, of the Minister um, to create a new MOU with municipalities. And it does highlight in that mandate letter the importance of roads uh, being part of that discussion. Obviously, uh, corrections, education, and housing have been uh, a huge irritant with uh, for municipalities. Uh, I was a municipal councillor uh, for four years, and it uh, it is a huge problem to have such. Uh, large sums of money co collected from property tax owners, property, property, property tax payers, homeowners, um, uh, where the municipalities have uh, no say in how that money is spent. So 
the intent of moving and getting an MOU uh, completed. Uh, I, I applaud the government uh, for doing that. I will share some disappointments in where we have ended up, uh, but it's, uh, it's certainly something uh, that has been more than an irritant for municipalities. Um, uh, and I think <laughs> the biggest irritant uh, has been education, because uh, it is a significant amount of money, and the province has indexed that to inflation each year. So that number has grown and grown and grown each year uh, uh, and cost uh, property taxpayers uh, significant amounts of money. And that, in contrast with the municipal capacity grant never changing and never being in, uh, indexed, uh, ha has been uh, something that has fr frustrated municipalities uh, for, uh, for a long, long time. Um, one of the concerns that this whole process has raised, um, uh, and there are different opinions uh, around the province and by members of this House, uh, I'll be supporting this bill um, and uh, the numbers uh, uh, for my municipalities uh, uh, are, are interesting. Maybe I'll, 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 I'll come to that in a minute. Um, uh, but this has been presented in a context where there's been a significant breakdown in trust, in my view, between municipalities and uh, the government. And uh, in relation to HRM and the other bill that is before the House, uh, that has uh, uh, significantly undermined the relationship between all municipalities uh, because of uh, those uh, uh, initiatives by the government to delve into municipal uh, responsibilities in a very, very he heavy-handed and, and undemocratic way. And in this bill, the uh, relationship and the strain on the biggest stakeholder of this bill in CBRM, and uh, I'm not saying that I completely agree with all the points that CBRM is making, but I do agree that they need to be listened to, sat down with, and uh, negotiated with, and certainly the frustrations that we have heard uh, from uh, CBRM uh, has has uh, revealed a complete break breakdown in trust and a feeling that the uh, government has not uh, listened to them or engaged with them in in a, in a meaning meaningful way, and. Uh, in that they are the biggest stakeholder, the one who has the most, the biggest financial interest in this, uh, it, it is uh, more than a shame that the government uh, and the minister and the premier could not make uh, a stronger effort at, uh, at working with CBRM to uh, find some common understanding uh, with respect to uh, getting this across the finish line in a, in a productive manner. Highlighted in that is, you know, is a document um, which uh, outlines the, ch the fiscal changes to uh, each municipal unit, which actually refers to municipalities as losers, and I will table this document, um, and you know a column in which the, any offsets for losers has gone to zero. Uh, it, that's an unfortunate way to negotiate and present a position uh, and a financial model 
to a municipality. There are 16 municipalities here that are losers. The biggest municipality is CBRM. Um, and there are lots of winners here, and you're, many, many of us will stand and support our municipalities that are winners. In fact, the biggest winner is the town of Wolfville, which I represent, and I've talked to the mayor, and this is big for the town of Wolfville. The municipal capacity grant is going up 1,390%. Wow. <laughs> the big winners are uh, the, the uh, West Hance Regional Municipality getting a million dollars more in the, in the grant, while CBRM is losing 1.6. Other big winners, Town of Bridgewater, Town of Kentville, uh, town of Truro, and the District of Guysboro, one of the few regional municipalities that seems to be a big winner. Uh, it, it does raise some questions of how this formula is, and obviously I guess we at this level will not get those details. Um, but there are five municipalities uh, in which the grants are increasing by one to 200 percent, and as I say, Wolfville is get, getting 1,400 percent more in, uh, in the capacity grant. Uh, so it, it, I think it underscores uh, the almost divide and conquer uh, way that this negotiation has gone forward, and, uh, and I, I just, I find that unfortunate. Um, my other concern uh, that I want to highlight here is the unfortunate, uh, the job is of an MOU and dealing with uh, this important piece of work is the job almost has barely started. The heavy lifting is really the roads discussion and the education uh, transfer. And I know there was an attempt to get the roads into this MOU. The towns, this is a big issue for towns, as the unfairness of the structure of how we fund roads in this province. But unfortunately, the way this has been handled really hijacked the ability to make progress on that. And I want to refer uh, to a letter from the mayor of the municipality of Kings uh, with, you know, concerns about how things were being properly uh, costed, etc. And, and I do, I meant to, to uh, underscore an important uh, point is that we, municipalities deserve our respect. We have a lot of very dedicated, smart, hardworking councillors and some and very professional staff at the municipal level. And I just hope and wish that the government takes that into account in how they deal with municipalities. And as as I expressed earlier, the heavy-handedness of HRM, our biggest municipality, and the councillors and the mayor, and how this government uh, has, has really undermined their relationship with our largest municipality, um, and again, CBRM is our second largest municipality. Uh, this is concerning. This, this is a step backwards in, in municipal-provincial relations. Uh, and I just implore on, on the, to the government to remember that there are extremely dedicated municipal councillors that work very hard for very little money, that have a very competent staff to uh, sit down and work through these difficult issues with the province. So I, I want to go back now to this letter from uh, the Municipality of Kings with respect uh, to the unfortunate 
uh, lack of progress on the roads. And, and I will share with you a paragraph. Regrettably, the Roads Committee's report was overtly withheld from municipalities. We have just now received it as a result of num numerous complaints on that front. Also, the CERMGARD Committee was formed to discuss, consult, and report regularly to municipalities. Instead, the members were signed non-disclosure agreements. It's the government of non-disclosure agreements. That, that was my editorial, back to, to the quote, uh, that were asked to sign non-disclosure agreements and did not report to municipalities and appear to have taken on the status of a negotiating committee. To top it off, that committee also had not shared its report with either the NSFM board or membership prior to us all being presented with what had the appearance of a fait accompli. Therefore, it cannot be inferred that any of the recommendations have come from the municipalities. I have truly been confused by such cloaked procedures. They have done nothing to inspire confidence in the process. I think the quote from the mayor speaks for itself, and uh, I'm uh, going to leave it at that. So, I think um, the other concern that I, I wanted to raise or, or, or to you know, add my voice to was the issue that was raised by the member from Cumberland North. Uh, and I, uh, it, it appears the legislation is actually not committing in legislation to getting rid of the municipality's contribution to housing and corrections, that in fact, that will be done at a later date in regulations. Again, with that breakdown in trust that I feel uh, is there, uh, it really makes one wonder why the government would not put that in legislation, what might be the reason that uh, this needs to be put in regulations? Is it that this will not occur for a year or two? Uh, I do notice in the uh, spreadsheet of the uh, financial uh, implications to each municipality, they're using numbers from 22, 23 for corrections, uh, but they're projecting 23, 24 for housing. Um, we're doing two fiscal years and how we're cu calculating this. Uh, is there some reason to wonder whether the regulations might be pushed off to the next fiscal year? Um, uh, I, I think we all would have liked to see this and I'm sure municipalities would have liked to see uh, this in legislation as opposed to a promise that regulations uh, might sometimes uh, sometime uh, make this happen. Um, there remain other issues that have not been addressed, uh, and again, that's why I feel this MOU uh, has only really begun the work, and I am uh, concerned and fearful that once this box gets checked on the minister's uh, to-do list, um, that the, the real important heavy lifting work that needs to happen with respect to roads and education uh, will be kicked down the road for another decade or two. Um, there are big issues with respect to the cost pressures that are happening to municipalities. CBRM has articulated many of those. Our municipal colleagues talk about um, the extensive pressures with respect to policing that they are under. And in my home community of Wolfville, uh, there is a particular is issue that really should be part of an MOU and an arrangement between the province, and that's uh, with respect to uh, 
in uh, f funds in lieu of taxes for university properties. Uh, residences, the municipality gets uh, funding in lieu of taxes, but all of the academic buildings in our towns in Antigonish, uh, in Wolfville, in, in uh, uh, Church Point, in Sydney, the municipalities do not get uh, they're, they're, they don't, do not get tax revenue from major institutional buildings in the municipalities. And that is significant, particularly for a small town like Wolfville, where the community doubles in size when the university is sitting, and 80 percent of those expensive police calls are to do with students in the community. Yet the municipality does not receive tax money, taxes, revenue from those university buildings. So those are issues that uh, deserve uh, to be worked on and worked on uh, uh, now to make more progress here with respect to the relationship between the province and, and municipalities. Um, so I, I will leave it at that. My concerns are the breakdown in trust between the province and municipalities, the lack of com firm commitment in legislation to the financial deal that has been struck, and a concern that the MOU is only 20 percent complete and that there is significant work to do in an environment where trust is at a low point, but there is significant work to do to get back to the table to talk about the issues of the education transfer roads and, as I also suggested, in terms of my home community uh, university uh, ability to collect revenue from the university institutions. So with that, I'll leave my comments at that. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. So I, I thank you, Madam Speaker. I would like to, Madam Chair, I would like to just say a few words uh, to address a few of the things that we've heard on uh, Clause 1. And uh, the, there's a few realities here. I would say that uh, the municipality's uh, interest in what the government is doing and appreciation for what we are doing is at an all-time high. We have over 30 letters of support for this uh, MFCG. The towns in particular have been extraordinary for this uh, new MOU. The towns in particular have been extraordinarily supportive of this simply because of the, the roads issue. Uh, that which has been a, a, a plague for the towns for for a long time. The reality is, this is the this will be uh, the first successful. You know, this is uh, updating a 1995 agreement. In 1995, the internet didn't exist. A long time ago, uh, 27 years ago, and uh, it's been a long time coming. And uh, there's been a number of things that uh, have been said that that maybe members weren't fully aware of uh, what what was done. So I, I will just briefly address a few of them. Uh, the, the reality is that the, the non-disclosure uh, agreement was requested by the NSFM, but in truth needed by our department as well. Uh, we needed it because sharing some of the confidential data in the, uh, the formula uh, needed that. Uh, we needed to have that NDA there. Yeah, the NSFM, uh, I think you could, they probably should answer as to why they wanted it too. I, I, will, I will surmise that it was needed by them so that the actual committee could do the negotiations in-house and every idea, good, bad or ugly, could be weighed out and had those, uh, had those ideas and all the suggestions been right out there, then uh, probably would have torpedoed the process in reality. So once we went to the public consultation format of that, there was extensive consultations, uh, or public, I mean, within the, the, uh, uh, 
municipalities. There was extensive uh, consultation there in which all, the, all of the municipalities, to my knowledge, virtually every one of them, I can't say 100 per cent, but uh, they all did, in which CBRM participated very vigorously, including the fact that our own senior staff had two special meetings with CBRM. So they had numerous times to be aware of what was in the uh, uh, what was in the agreement. Plus, their senior staff participated in the committee, so they they had numerous opportunities and numerous times to be aware of this. And the reality is, this is a terrific deal for every municipality, none better than CBRM. This is a great deal for CBRM, for the people of CBRM, where four and a half million dollar, uh, whether it's a four and a half million dollar tax break. Which, which, from what I understand, the mayor and council are saying is what it will be. That's a terrific deal for the CBRM people. Uh, various municipalities will treat this uh, money in various ways, and uh, the some will use it to provide increased services. We recognize that there's tremendous demands on our municipalities to uh, provide more services. So we've had tremendous, uh, tremendous support that. That explains, I think I've explained the, uh, the non-disclosure agreement thing uh, out. Uh, it, it served purposes in the process. And, uh, but once the uh, process reached a certain point, of course, then it, it all came out. Did things change after the consultation happened? Uh, they did. Uh, there was some uh, concern raised about what we called Part B roads, which dealt with J-class roads, and that, that got dropped out. So the consultation process resulted in further changes to the plan, the proposal. In terms of the uh, calculation of the municipal financial capacity grant, uh, uh, what you have to understand is an extraordinarily complicated calculation model, but it's NSFM's, it's not ours. It's their, they, de they developed that. Uh, calculation model which calculates need, which sees in reality CBRM get approximately half of that block of money each year. That, that calculation was frozen about 10 years ago because at the time CBRM was starting to receive a declining amount of it. And uh, be, presumably because other municipalities in that calculation were, were starting to be more needy, I don't know, or maybe CBRM was starting to be less needy, I don't know why, but it was frozen because of that. So the desire to see it unfrozen was expressed by the members of NSFM. We said okay to that, but we committed to keeping the amounts the same for five years. So we're putting in an extra $3 million for five years to keep those amounts the same. So in reality, the provincial, from our point of view, we were committed. It was. We were committed to maintaining it the way it was too. So, and we have done that. So, we, and we will do that. That is a part of it. In terms of why everything is in regulations, uh, so you must understand that this is uh, uh, when we were in the process of offering CBRM option A or option B. We didn't know which they would take. So to put it all in the bill means that it's crystallized put it in regulation, we can, we can make adjustments, right? You know, so uh, that's, a, that's a reality. So uh, um, in terms of, uh, I mean, there's been so many other things said by the opposition, I, I don't know how to even possibly address them all. It's, uh, uh, and I've seen uh, opposition, you know, it's, uh, it's reminiscent of a buddy, what's his name, I think, and the other fellow skid about a boat that's in bad shape, and then, then it's not in that bad a shape. So it, it goes, <laughs> finally ends up with one person saying, I've seen, wor seen worse, oh yeah, it's not that bad. Um, so uh, it's been interesting to watch that dynamic, but we've had, uh, as I've said, we've had an extraordinary, uh, uh, you know, uh, vote of confidence in reality from our municipalities on this, except one, granted, um, about this, and I would still maintain that no municipality is better off than uh, CBRM, I, I didn't think I was that exciting a speaker. <laughs> so that, that's the reality. Um, I'd get my train of thought back. Um, 
the reality is, is all 49 municipalities benefit because all 49 municipalities have been contributing to net operating losses of housing and to corrections. Uh, and I, I should publicly thank the Department of Justice for taking that on the chin. That's a, a, a payment that was going directly to justice, part of this deal, not to, uh, not to municipal affairs and housing. That's the reality. As far as the net operating losses go, what you need to understand is that on, on our 11,200 public housing units, we have about $65 million a year in revenue from rent and we have about $165 million a year in costs. So we're $100 million behind every year in public housing. That's the reality. And, uh, uh, you know, we're working, on the, uh, we're working on a massive reorganization of public housing. And it's an incredibly daunting task. And I've, it seems like every week I hear a new horror story, which I can't, sorry, I can't tell you. Uh, but um, anyway, we're, we're working on, on that. But the $100 million a year loss every year is split 50% provincial, 40%, approximately 40% federal, 12% municipal. The 12 percent municipal is a number that varies depending on the amount of maintenance we do in each jurisdiction, and that's where this net operating loss comes from. One of the reasons why it's been such an irritant for our municipalities is the bill always comes in late in the year, and they can't budget for it. They don't really know how much we're doing in any one area, and uh, so it's always, uh, it shows up at the last moment and it's always annoying because they didn't know what it was going to be. And, um, so, but that's, uh, you know, if you were to ask me year over year, what's the single biggest investment we make in housing every year is public housing. And uh, uh, we're working hard to uh, bring uniformity in public housing. And I probably shouldn't digress into public housing right now in this talk, so I won't. But I will, I will go back to the, the benefits of this for each of our municipalities, my, my colleague from King South mentioned Kings County. Kings County will be to the better almost a million dollars. And they are a county, the municipality of Kings County has not been one of the, one of the areas that benefited from the municipal financial capacity grant uh, due to the economic strength essentially of the area, right? So, uh, which the municipal financial capacity grant calculation is a calculation of relative economic strength. So, but, but some of our towns, as, uh, as the member mentioned, it'll be a significant benefit to Wolfville. And I have a letter here which I will table from the town of Wolfville uh, categorically supporting this new agreement, absolutely in support of. Uh, and uh, I'll just read briefly on, so this is from Mayor Wendy Donovan to the Office of the Legislative Council on behalf of the Town of Wolfville. I'm writing to support Bill 340 and encourage the committee and House to approve it. As a small community, a local taxes, daily pressure on local infrastructure, police, fire services, not only our residents, own residents, but thousands of reg regional students for whom Wolfville is a service centre, thousands of tourists and thousands of university st students. The current uh, service exchange is over a quarter century old. So. And it goes on to reference the, uh, the road, so I'll table that. So we see over, overwhelming support uh, for it. However, as the member from Kings South mentioned, and I don't, I don't minimize that at all, part two of this renegotiation will, will get into some of the, uh, will get into other elements that are, will, are incredibly important, fire, policing, and, and uh, part B of roads and how we handle all that. Um, it, it is a, uh, it will, won't be easy. What I will say, just finally to close up, is that this represents, what we are offering here in this ag agreement represents a fundamental change in the way this uh, MOU is, uh, sees the world. So in 1995, and if you go back and look at the 1995 Service Exchange Agreement, you would say it was written by accountants. Uh, not that accountants are a bad thing. I appreciate accountants. We need them. But what, what I mean by that is there was 
two columns, province, municipalities, and there was like a series of numbers, and it was balanced down at the bottom by, and I, I think if my memory serves me cor correctly, and it seems like an incredibly small number right now for what we're talking about, 178 million, 178 million, and there was a need to make those two numbers. In, in 1995, or presumably 1994, there seemed to be a need to make those two numbers balance out. So we're service exchange, so the exchange part of that word was a big deal in 1994. And uh, so that's how, in, the, in, the, in this, we see uh, corrections get tucked into it and maybe net operating losses. That's how we had to make the thing balance, right? And uh, so we've, we're, we have not taken that philosophy. And that's why when we say this is a 40 to 50 million to the better for the municipalities, it's because we weren't, weren't trying to make a service exchange agreement. So where we, we saw the numbers all balance out, but we were simply saying, okay, we can do that. We're recognizing the needs of the municipalities and we wanted to have an, a, an agreement that recognized that and strengthened their hand, which we achieved, I think. So, so saying that is why this sort of fundamental shift in philosophy kind of quietly happened. I don't know if the people really realize that, but that's the reality. So uh, we're very proud of this, uh, this moment uh, uh, and uh, personally pleased to see opposition members who were very critical of this now be in favor of it. They, they have come to understand it. I appreciate that. So with that, uh, I will take my seat. I recognize the Honourable Member for Annapolis. I just want to clarify, I, you know, it was nice to listen to the Minister on that, but just to be clear, uh, um, I don't think I was critical in the beginning and then became supportive in the end. I, I've been supportive of this. I think I was clear in my remarks and I uh, just want to have that on the record. So. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> Seeing no other speakers, Clause 1, shall Clause 1 carry? There's, there's been a request for a recorded vote. We, shall, we will recess until the whips are satisfied.
order. The Committee of the Whole House on Bills will come to order. There has been a request for a recorded vote. I will recognize the clerk. Brad Johns. Yes. Tori Rushton. Yes. Barbara Adams. Yes. Kim Maslin. Yes. Tim Houston. Yes. Alan McMaster. Yes. <clears throat> Twyla Gross. Yes. Michelle Thompson. Yes. John Lohr. Yes. Trevor Boudreaux. Yes. Tim Hallman. Yes. Kent Smith. Yes. Dave Ritzy. Yes. Brian Wong. Susan Corkum Greek. Yes. Brian Comer. Yes. Colton LeBlanc. We. Oui. Jill Balzer. Yes. Pat Dunn. Yes. Greg Moreau. Yes. Becky Druin. Yes. Larry Harrison. Yes. John White. Yes. John A. McDonald. Yes. Keith Bain. Chris Palmer. Yes. Melissa Sheehy Richard. Yes. Danielle Barkhouse. Yes. Tom Taggart. Yes. Nolan Young. Yes. Steve Craig. Yes. Patricia Arab. Keith Irving. Yes. Brenda McGuire. Derek Momberkat. No. Zach Churchill. Kelly Regan. Ian Rankin. Susan LeBlanc. Claudia Chender. Kendra Coombs. No. Susie Hansen. No. Gary Burrell. No. Carla McFarland. Rafa Di Costanzo. No. Tony Ince. Laura Lee Nickel. Ben Jessam. Yep. Braden Clark. Come on. Ali Duale. No. Carmen Kerr. Yes. Ronnie LeBlanc. Yes. Fred Tilly. No. Elizabeth Smith McCrossan. Yes. The results of the recorded vote are as follows, yeas 34, nays 7. Clause 1 is carried. Is there any debate on clauses 2 to 5? Carried. Shall clauses 2 to 5 carry? Carried. The clauses are carried. Clause 6. Carried. I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton, Whitney, Center, Whitney Pierre. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would draw the uh, member's attention to NDP 1. Changes recommended to the Committee on the Whole House of Bills, page 2, add immediately before Clause 6, the following clause. 6. Schedule A of Chapter 1 of the Acts of 2018, the Education Act, is amended by adding immediately after Section 70 of the following section. 70A1. Notwithstanding Section 70 or any agreement the payment required of a, municip of a municipality under Section 70 in a fiscal year may, be, may not be higher than the payment required in, in the fiscal year immediately preceding the coming into force of this section. Two, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing shall consult and negotiate the, with municipalities on the elimination of payments required under Section 70 renumber and cha change cross-references accordingly. Now, what this, what this recommendation does is it goes back to the CIRMGAR uh, Committee's proposal on mandatory contributions. In the mandatory contributions, we have si in the CIRMGAR report, it had the recommendations of 
municipalities eliminating through mandatory contributions, housing, corrections, and the one that the government did not take into consideration, education. So with that, it, in, and in the Sermgar report, uh, uh, it says it is imperative that other mandatory contributions made by municipalities continue to be a priority if it is of the utmost importance that the matter be given due attention and consideration to ensure equitable and sustainable outcomes for all concerned. The NSFM requests the Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing to engage in productive discussions over the next five years with regards to contributions to education. In the interim, it is recommended that the current amounts for contribution to education remain frozen and not be subjected to any increases. So we are taking our di the direction from the Sermgar report that the proposed action says that the province assumes full responsibility for the cost of corrections and operating losses incurred by the regional housing authorities. Additionally, it is recommended that any, that the contributions towards education be temporarily frozen while discussions towards phasing out such contributions are underway. This was, we know that education is going to be one of the major costs government's going to incur over the next several years. We know that the municipalities are going to incur, incur most of that cost in their um, in in their operations. So when they when they're doing their budgets, they got to take into consideration the cost of education. When they do their taxes and their ta and to discuss their tax rates, they're going to have to take into consideration the rising costs of education and the savings that the minister has continuously pointed to that the municipalities are going to save, according to him, under this MOU, well, it was pointed out to us that a lot of this savings is going to be eaten up by education. So, and it was really uh, brought, the, um, Jen Campbell, the CFO, for the CBRM, um, in her response, in her uh, law, in her law amendments testimony, um, basically said this. Uh, I'm just going to try to find this page because I was been looking through it all night and I seem to have lost it. Just bear with me, everybody, please. So essential tax. Okay, oh, so here, yes. So next year, CBRM's education transfers will increase by 1.1 million. That's more than the total we pay for corrections today. Our capacity will decrease by 3.5 million per year, even with housing and corrections eliminated. The result of continuing education transfers, transfer increases, and the 1.6 million loss of capacity grant funding will be taken from CBRM and redistributed to other municipalities when the formula top up is left in five years. So what they're actually saying in all of this is that as long as education remains in the MO, as long as education is left out of the MOU, any um, or a percentage of the potential savings that some municipalities might have might actually be eaten up by the education, by by the educational costs, um, I, I'm using CBRM as an example because they actually um, costed it out for us, and what they what they have um, said was that so the CBRM's net transfers to the province will increase from 4.8 to 8.27 million. That's doubling. And three, uh, which is a 3.47 million dollar um, added pressure due to Bill 340, even though housing and corrections are eliminated. That it's very telling to me, 
And that tells me that education is continuously going to cost the CBRM money. We know it's going to adult. We know um, that it's going, we know education is going to be costly to our province. We know that, um, We know that I think it's I think they, I think I remember a study saying uh, over a decade. It's going to be a decade expense over the so. What what could be lost? Like what what do we have to lose? By putting this in. If Sermgard, the advisory committee. Said, yes, to it. Um, that they would want to see it. Why not freeze them right now? Freeze the costs because right now it's rising by CPI. So why don't we, why not just freeze them where they are now, and we work towards eliminating those fees from municipalities? I mean, please keep in mind, municipalities have no say whatsoever. I mean. They don't even help with the, with the school board elections anymore because there's no school board. Because they used to fall in with each other. School board and municipal used to have their elections at the same time. So there's not even that. They have absolutely, the municipalities have absolutely no say in education. And it's surprising to, and I, it's not really surprising. I think I know why the province decided to keep the education piece in there. Housing and corrections is just a small little cost, is a smaller cost to municipalities. Not, not to minimize it, but it's a smaller cost. But the province knows that the education costs, the cost of education is going to rise, and why not have municipalities um, Pick up the tab for that. We'll take the, the we'll take those housing corrections. That's fine because the big ticket item will be on education, and this is not just affecting the CBRM. I'm using the CBRM as an example because it's what I know. But my I would every municipality pays. Every municipal unit, whether you're a town, village, it doesn't, or whatever you're classified as, as a municipal unit, you're going to be paying education costs. This is going to affect, uh, I'm hearing music. Is someone playing the guitar? Dance oh, okay. Um, <laughs> great, okay, wow, that's, that's, that's great echoing in here. Uh, so anyways, Okay, calm down. Um, so anyways, what I'm saying is the reason why the pro I think the province chose to keep, um, or keep off the table education is because education is going to be the big ticket item. And they don't want to pay the full cost of education even though it is a provincial responsibility. And I think to do something like that is unfair to the municipal units themselves, but it's unfair to the residents. It's really unfair to the residents that they have that they that they're going to have to pay through their municipal taxes on education. That their municipal unit is going to charge them. Uh, on their tax bill through the tax rate on something the, the municipalities have no say in. And really, they have no say in how, in how much of a contribution they're going to make because it's, a CP, it's CPI. It's unfair. And it's going to affect all of our municipalities. And I'm not asking for the total eliminate. This, this, this clause is not asking for total elimination of, of education fees. It's asking for a freeze while the, province, while the province and the municipal units work towards elimination 
of the fees uh, and, the C and, and the municipalities having to do that mandatory contribution. So I, I, I really do am going to ask my, my colleagues across, the, uh, across in the government side, because as I said last night, I will, I'll be putting forward amendments. My colleagues in the, Liberal par in the Liberal caucus will be putting forward amendments. And I only ask that you consider them because you're the majority government. You have a majority. It's up to you whether these amendments pass or not. And I ask you to consider them. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, mixed chair, and uh, I'm happy to get up and talk about um, this amendment because in, in the other uh, times that I've had a chance to, to speak about uh, this Bill 340, um, I've reiterated the fact that the education piece is a big stum stumbling block um, for negotiation of this agreement. And if I'm to look at this um, amendment, uh, it changing Schedule A of Chapter 1, the Acts of 2018, the Education Act, is amended by immediately after Section 70, the following section, this is the important part, 70A1. Notwithstanding Section 70 or any agreement, the payment required of a municipality under Section 70 in a fiscal year may not be higher than the payment required in the fiscal year immediately preceding the coming into force of this section. That's just a fancy way to say you're freezing the education payments required by municipalities. And the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing shall consult and negotiate with municipalities on the elimination of payments required under sec Section 70. And of course, we're going to renumber and change and do all that cross referencing thing. And the part two of this amendment is the one that I really um, believe is the important piece. Freezing it is a good thing. Eliminating it is a better thing. And um, I, I can't, the days are, and nights because of the hours are, are uh, coming together on me, but I believe it was last night when I tabled the document from CFO Campbell from CBRM. And, and this is the only document that I can go off of because it's the only one that lays it out for us in no uncertain terms, the elimination of the housing piece and the elimination of the corrections piece, again, as I'm not disputing our welcome changes to the formula. They do provide 4.5 or $4.6 million in taxes that are not required to be charged to CBRM residents. So in that regard, it will be beneficial for the residents. But, mixed chair, if I look at currently 4.6 million, currently in 23-24, I'm just gonna use round numbers because I don't have them in front of me, it's, it's a little over 16 million in education fees that are flowing through to the residents of CBRM. That's almost four times the amount of corrections and housing. So imagine the impact that we could have 
on the tax rate of CBRM. And, uh, and my good friend from Richmond talked earlier about Richmond supporting the bill and I'm, I'm very glad that they, that they do. But the rural tax rate uh, in Richmond is somewhere around 85 cents. In CBRM, it's closer to $2. So there's a big difference between what a resident has to put pay in Richmond versus what a resident has to pay in CBRM per $100 of assessment. So you can understand why the residents of CBRM are concerned with Bill 340. Coming back to the amendments that we see put forward by the NDP, Um, in Clause 6, freezing Part A, temporarily freezing the education amount will save a significant portion because when we look at that graph that was a very nice graph all laid out for us in color. It showed currently a net deficit amount of 4.8 million to a net deficit amount of 8.275, something like that, strictly caused by two things. The reduction in the capacity grant from 15 to 13 million and the increase in the education payments required of CBRM to the province from 16 million to 21 million by 2930. So 70A bracket one bracket the change to basically freeze education payments will save CBRM residents $5 million, which is more than the amount for housing and corrections combined. When you add that savings in four million to the savings of 4.6 million, that's a significant reduction in the tax of the resident of CBRM as to what it will be by 2930. However, if you're able to take that a step further, which is 70A bracket to bracket, negotiate the removal of that education fund, which is a provincial responsibility. Education is provincial. You will save the residents of CBRM $16 million, a further reduction in their tax rate, which may bring them closer to what the good people of Richmond are paying and other municipalities. They know that they're going to have to pay more because they have services like transit, services like water and sewer, but overpaying for things like education shouldn't happen. 
there's an opportunity through voting on Amendment CWHB NDP-1 a vote of yes changes the bill for the favorable. And we heard some folks talk of saying, oh, you're filibustering for the sake of filibustering. I don't even know if that's a term, but I'll tell you why I'm filibustering. I'm filibustering because my residents deserve the same that every other resident in Nova Scotia gets. And by implementing this amendment, NDP-1, it goes a long way to ensuring that that can happen. Adding this amount together with looking at the capacity grant that we talked about earlier would be a no-brainer for CBRM and other municipalities that are hurt by this particular clause in general. It would be a no-brainer for them to jump on board and say, let's sign, where do I sign? And I would be the first to stop and say, you know what, this is, this, this is closer to fair than we've ever seen. Let's get rid of the education costs You know, I spent 16 years, I believe it was, on the school board. And everything we did, every policy that we passed, every time we were responsible to do something, it was all through direction of the Minister of Education. Curriculum was developed by the Department of Education. Negotiations were done on a provincial level for the most part with some things done locally by the school board. Education is clearly a provincial responsibility. There's no business, there's no control, there's no policies developed, there's no transportation. None of these things are at the control of the municipal units. Therefore, why should municipal units have to pay for these services? It makes about as much sense as municipal units. Why aren't we charging municipal units for health care? You know why? Because the residents of those communities are paying for health care through their provincial income taxes, the same way that they're paying for education through their provincial income taxes. They shouldn't, in, a, in essence, and, and in this clause, I'm fighting for all municipalities in Nova Scotia. 
no municipality should be required to pay for education funds. The only funds municipalities should be required to pay for are things that are under their control. The only thing that municipal residents should be taxed on by their municipality are services that are being provided by their municipality. The municipal government shouldn't be billing the residents for money that the province is expecting them to pay. Why should the municipality do the work of the provincial government and double tax its residents? As I stated last night, we know that $16 million per year is required from CBRM to pay the province. We can assume that Halifax pays significantly more to the province for education because of its size. We can assume that every other municipality pays a portion of educational funds based on the size of their municipality over time, which is less than CBRM pays. And depending on their size, the next one is 10 times smaller. So maybe they pay 2 million. I don't know the exact numbers, but you can take that rate right down to the smallest municipality. So as I said last night, if we were to assume it's 100 million across the province that the province is collecting from municipalities, that is a drop in the bucket when we look at a $14 billion provincial budget. Why are we burdening municipalities with what is a very big bucket at the municipal level and a very small drop in the bucket? We heard the Premier say that he's going to continue to put drops in the bucket. Well, here's a way to help with the municipal bucket. Pull the educational funds away from the municipal units and put them where they should be back at the, at the provincial level. The fact that in this amendment, CWHB NDP-1, in part two, we talk about the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing shall consult and negotiate with municipalities on the elimination of payments. I would change that even further and remove consult and negotiate municipalities and I would just say shall eliminate and change that maybe to a period of time. Freeze them for two years, eliminate half in year three and half in year four. So 
by the time you get to year four, you're at zero. That's a true negotiation that could happen with municipal units. But instead, we're leaving the educational part as is. We're going to continue to charge municipal units for an amount that they have no control over, an amount that nobody knows where it came from or how it's developed. And what is the benefit? What's the benefit to the residents of CBRM and other municipal units across this province of the amount that's being paid for educational funding under this clause? There's no benefit other than the education system, which should be part of our provincial taxes. We saw a government that came in with 150 million-ish surplus last year. More than enough to cover off the costs of taking the educational payments off the hands of municipal units. Mix Chair, I think that this amendment, CWHB NDP-1, is a reasonable ask. You can have your finance team, your education team, cost this out very quickly as a matter of fact, I think I can hear the calculators working now to come back and say this is a good compromise to start. This is a compromise in life, you know, uh, we've been talking songs today, we've talked Guns and Roses, we've talked Dire Straits. You can't always get what you want, but in this case, we hope the municipalities get what they need. And what they need is a hand up to the next level. CBRM has indicated, and, and we met with them as a caucus, CBRM has indicated to us that there is a point in their evolution where they feel they can get and they, they can become the municipality that they want to be, but they need a hand to get there, as I mentioned earlier. And by implementing this amendment, just in case we forgot, CWHB NDP-1, to freeze the education amounts for the first part of the amendment, and then to negotiate their elimination to zero. What a wonderful thing that would be. It's another song, I think. What a wonderful thing that would be, because that would go a long way in improving the relationship between the provincial government and the municipal units. And we talk about the number of municipal units that are happy 
with this bill. Imagine how happy they would be if the educational pieces were pulled out. They would be ecstatic with the bill. And again, it's not about credit. We'll give that where it's due. If you guys take it out, you get the credit for it. You made municipal units whole again. To quote a, to, to quote a term, you may understand, you can make municipal units great again. To me, that's that the way to do this is and, and again I'll go back to CBRM because that's in my that's where I live and that's where I know the best and I, I was I was present for the presentation from the CFO. I'm a numbers person and I understand numbers. But the CFO laid it out so perfectly. Removing those educational numbers saves the taxpayers right now over 16 million by 2930 21 million. 21 million dollars that is no longer charged to one of the highest municipal units tax property tax systems in all of Nova Scotia. Over the years, we've seen a large outflow of people from CBRM. There was a time, again, when I sat on the school board, when we were way under capacity in the majority of our buildings. We did the right thing for the education system at the time because we were mandated at that time by the provincial government, by the Minister of Education to look at all the buildings in the system that were under capacity by a certain amount. Because whether you have 100% capacity, 70% capacity, 30% capacity, or 20% capacity, your fixed costs are the same. You still have to heat the building. You still have to maintain the buildings. You still have to provide ventilation for the buildings. You still have to provide snow removal. You still have to mow the lawns. The costs are the same for many of those units. So what did we do as a school board, an elected group? We took our job very seriously. At the time, we closed 17 schools in CBRM. We right-sized a lot of the capacities. In my hometown, when I was a kid, there was St. Joseph Elementary, Notre Dame, the Red Brick, there was uh, St. John's School, there was like four or five elementary schools in my community of Sydney Mines. Now, mixed chair, we have one. We have one elementary school servicing the town. 
The same thing happened in North Sydney. There was a middle school in North Sydney, a middle school in Sydney Mines, and a middle school in Berdor, Florence area. Mixed chair, the middle school in Sydney Mines is still operational. My father went to high school at that school. My father turns 80 this year. That school has been on the docket for replacement for 10 years, more than 10 years. But that's not, that's not the responsibility and this idea of charging the residents of the community educational funds when clearly all of the decisions, at least back then we made some local decisions with guidance from the province, but now all the decisions regarding education are made centrally. They're made here in Halifax with input with the, I remember in a campaign promise that um, the local was gonna be put back, but I haven't seen that yet. It's on the list, put that on the list. Um, but right now, all the decisions are made centrally with regards to schools, yet we continue to charge municipal units an educational fee which is going to grow and grow and grow over the, the next number of years to 2930 to an exorbitant amount of 21 million for CBRM. Implementing this amendment, at the very least, will freeze that amount at current levels of 16 million, which is a good thing, but a better thing is eliminating that cost altogether because that saves the taxpayer a CBRM. And, and you can extrapolate, you could, you could talk about any municipality in this province, they're all paying this fee. So, and assuming the math works out, educational fees are four times greater than the fees required for housing and corrections. So every municipal unit, if, it, if the formula holds true across those units, every unit, every town, every municipality, every village, every county will save four times more by implementing, four times more than they're currently saving by implementing this amendment. That's gotta be a good thing. And I think the municipal units that have sent all the letters in that you're all reading from would send another one to say, holy smokes, thank you, that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> to get that positivity and show of good faith from the province would, I know, I know as a resident of CBRM, I'll write you a letter myself um, saying thank you because that means my taxes will go down. Heading back to this amendment, 
it makes sense. And hopefully, um, my colleagues from the government side are, are looking at this and thinking, well, if we're removing responsibilities of the province, such as housing, such as corrections, why would we continue to charge for education? Just because it's a bigger amount? Just because it's four times the amount? It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. And, and I don't know when this started because I've only been around a couple of years at, this, uh, at these tables or I guess they're tables. <laughs> but it doesn't matter who started it. You have an opportunity. You hold the power to finish it. To take the responsibility. You know, um, a former boss of mine who I have a lot of respect for, who taught me a lot of things over the years, always said a good leader can show their vulnerability. A good leader can acknowledge when they're wrong. A good leader can change things based on feedback. We've all seen those memes of a good leader standing out in front and pulling with the rest of the team and leading the charge. And we've all seen the bad leader sitting at the back telling people where to go. A good leader would implement this amendment because it's good for the pro We can't have, I mean, I definitely don't have all the answers. And there's not one person in this room that has all the answers. It's impossible. You can't have all the answers. 55 heads are better than one. Forty-eight municipalities. I'm sure if you sent a letter to them tomorrow, to all the CAOs, including CBRM, tomorrow and said, what do you think? What do you think about us removing the education amount from, C from Bill 340? I bet you wouldn't have to call them up and ask them for the return letter. It would be, boom, absolutely great idea. Don't know who came up with it, but it's a good idea. It's important. It's important sometimes to take a second look at what we're doing. You know, uh, There's nothing wrong with asking someone for a proofread of something that you've done. Or, what do you think? What do you think of this? We all know it's time to implement reform to the way municipalities are funded. And
The bill, uh, 340, called the Municipal Reform Act of 2023, is, is a step in the direction, but it can be better. It can be better because the idea of passing legislation that's good for some and not good for others doesn't make any sense. If you can make some changes that are good for everyone, then I don't know why you would not do that. I think this is a good amendment. If I was writing it, I would have gone further and talked about the elimination right away of the educational funds. But what the NDP has done has given you a runway to gradually implement the elimination of the fund. So by freezing the amount where it currently sits, there's zero effect on the revenue of the province right now. It gives the province an opportunity to plan for the implementation of getting to zero. As I said earlier, it can be a gradual negotiation to get, for example, for, from CBRM to get from 16 to zero. Maybe it's done over three or four years but it can and should be done because and maybe I'm sure my, some of my other colleagues want to speak about it so I won't go on much longer but I'll end with this. Education is a provincial responsibility, not a municipal responsibility. Remove it from Bill 340. It doesn't belong at the municipal level. Take the responsibility, be good leaders, and help the residents of CBRM and every other municipal unit in this province. And that's all I have to say about that right now. Uh, mix chair. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pier. Thank you, mix chair. There was um, something I actually forgot to uh, say that I'm, I was kind of kicking myself um, in my in my remarks, and and so I thought I'd correct. I would. Um, I would correct that mistake that I made earlier and just I wanted to talk about the actual taxes and so I'm kind of doing uh, I'm doing a little bit of math here um, so and I was talking to a council colleague of mine and and who was help, who was providing you with some of that math and I, I thought that's a good point to make so I'm gonna make it and then I'm gonna sit um, in the town of Dominion um, education and housing and corrections um, cost roughly is 41 cents roughly on the dollar. Housing and corrections makes up roughly 7.4 per uh, 7.4 cents of that rate. The rest of that rate of the 41, which if my math is correct would be about 36.4 cents on the dollar would be education. If housing and education and corrections, all of them were to be eliminated, it would save the town of Dominion um, quite a bit of money and it, 
their rate, their tax rate, would actually go down to roughly about a uh, dollar fifty-nine. Um, and I believe now, and I'm just going to get something up here because I was fiddling around with some numbers here. And I believe right now their tax rate in, in, in Dominion, just one sec here, I had it, is at the moment two do, uh, just about $2.01 one, one or two cents, depending on if you're rounding or not. And so that's a signif that's significant decrease in the tax rate by eliminating all three housing, corrections, and education. I just want, I forgot to make that point earlier, and I, I want to have it on the record uh, and to show the, the immense savings that our residents could have by eliminating all three, and underscore that point. So thank you very much. I recognize the Honourable Member for King South. Uh, thank you very much, Mix Chair, and I want to just rise and uh, support this amendment and, uh, and to kind of uh, support the concept and the arguments that have been brought forward by uh, my fellow members. And uh, I have just spent a little time kind of looking at the, at the numbers uh, with respect to the impact on municipalities. Um, because there, there was something the minister said that made me puzzle. There was two incongruent numbers to me. The minister said that there would be a 40 to $50 million benefit to municipalities. He mentioned that today again. But today he also gave us the math on the housing contribution. And if you will recall, the minister said that we're, the deficits in providing public housing are $100 million. The province pays this. The federal government pays that. Municipalities pay 12%. Well, that's $12 million. So, and we know that the, I'm familiar enough, I don't have a good enough memory, uh, but I do remember that housing was substantially more than the corrections number. Um, so I began to uh, look a little bit co more closely at the numbers. And if I go back to the what I call the winners and losers list that I tabled earlier today, I totaled up the incremental funding increase that the province uh, has done in this negotiations, and it actually totals 19.7 million, not 40 to 50 million. It does align with housing being 12 million. Um, so if the benefits to municipalities are 19.7 million, what, are, what is the impact of the growth in education? Because the education contribution is 82% of what municipalities are transferring to uh, the province. And this, the SimGuard report indicates that $94 million from municipalities are transferred annually to the province for, for housing, education, and corrections. Well, we know that 82% of that is education. So $241 million is coming from municipalities to the province for education. So if you're still with me there, so what is the impact of inflation and this has been an irritant for municipalities, which I mentioned when I was spoke previously, that education funding was increasing each year. And I, to be all honesty, I can't remember if it's increased by CPI or if it's increased by the percentage of the education budget increasing. But if we look at this year's budget, 
and this year's CPI, they're actually very close. The education budget rose by 7 percent, CPI rose by 7.5 percent. So if $241 million in education funding is increased by 7 percent, that is an additional $17 million. So the municipalities are signing a deal, as I said earlier, that is giving them a positive impact of $19.7 million. But in one year of inflation, the municipality now has to raise another $17 million in transfer. So within just over a year, the benefits of this to municipality are eaten up by the inflation on education. So this amendment is saying, let's freeze those education increases while the negotiations continue so that municipalities can actually benefit from this deal rather than that additional $19 million being eaten up just by inflation on the education transfer. So I think these are important numbers and a strong argument to support this motion, this amendment by the NDP to freeze education so that municipalities can actually keep that money that is part of this deal, that 19.7. Because if not, education is basically going to take it all back in the transfer and municipalities will not have that as tax room, lowering taxes, or uh, an ability to fund more in the municipality. So I want to share those calculations with folks that underpin the arguments that my colleagues have made that we need to freeze the education transfer from inflation or else the municipalities will not see a, a benefit, a net benefit in this agreement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I was remiss with uh, my previous comments. I, I sat down too, qu too quickly. Um, there was some other things that I wanted to get, to wanted to get out. Um, I just have to refresh myself with uh, the amendment here, NDP-1. The municipal uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing shall consult and negotiate. Yeah, that's it. So we want to support this amendment so that we can move forward. You know, we've been, we've been talking uh, so long, but this will go a long way to allowing or helping us to support the, the passing of this bill because this puts a lot of money in the hands of residents of our respective communities. As I stated earlier, it's 16 million for the residents of CBRM back in their pockets, which will be spent in ways that allow them to live a little bit easier in their community. So right now, they're double paying for education, in, in my opinion, in the fact that they're, they're being charged through their provincial taxes for this government, for this provincial um, responsibility, but at the same time, they're being charged through their property taxes in the CBRM to pay for the same amount, to pay for the same service. So we talk about comparable taxes for comparable services across this country. 
The service of education is there, but the tax piece is not comparable. We're paying extra in this province for an amount that is provincial in nature being charged at a municipal level. And Mix Chair, as, as I said a moment ago, freezing the tax on education, all that does is keep so that the municipality won't have to raise taxes to meet the difference. But it doesn't, at the end of the day, help the resident because their taxes, well, it helps them in a certain way because their taxes are not going to increase to meet the in increased educational payments as required. But what it does do is freeze so they know what they're paying today is equivalent to what they've paid previous. So I just wanted to um, get that out um, mix, mix chair, and uh, with that, I will take my seat. Shall the amendment carry? No. There has been a request for a recorded vote. The bells will ring until the whips are satisfied.
order. The Committee of the Whole House on Bills will come to order. There was a request for a recorded vote on CWHB NDP1 amendment. I will ask the clerk to uh, conduct the vote. Brad Johns. No. Tori Rushton. No. Barbara Adams. Kim Maslin. No. Tim Houston. No. Alan McMaster. No. Twyla Gross. Michelle Thompson. No. John Lord. No. Trevor Boudreau. No. Tim Hallman. No. Kent Smith. No. Dave Ritzy. No. Brian Wong. No. Susan Corkum Greek. No. Brian Comer. No. Colton LeBlanc. Jill Balser. No. Pat Dunn. No. Greg Moreau. No. Becky Druin. No. Larry Harrison. No. John White. No. John A. McDonald. No. Keith Bain. Chris Palmer. No. Melissa Sheehy Richard. No. Danielle Barkhouse. Uh, no. Nope. Tom Taggart. No. Nope. Nolan Young. No. Nope. Steve Craig. Patricia Arab. Keith Irving. Yes. Brendan McGuire. Derek Momberkat. Zach Churchill. Kelly Regan. Ian Rankin. Susan LeBlanc. Claudia Chender. Kendra Coombs. Yes. Susie Hansen. Yes. Gary Burrell. Yes. Carla McFarlane. Rafa Di Costanzo. Tony Ince. Laura Lee Nickel. Ben Jessup. Braden Clark. Ali Duale. Carmen Kerr. Yes. Ronnie LeBlanc. Yes. Fred Tilly. Yes. Elizabeth Smith McCrossan. Yes. The results of the recorded vote are as follows. Yeas 8, nays 26. The amendment is defeated. Clause 6. I recognize the honourable member for King's South. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mixed <laughs> Chair. Um, obviously, this uh, clause uh, has, I think, f fairly uh, sound support by municipalities. Uh, the intent of it is obviously to uh, have abandoned education centres revert back to the province, um, leaving, although the uh, right of first refusal for municipalities. Uh, and Madam Chair, I move, uh, mixed chair, I move that you now rise and report progress on Bill 340. Can I do that? The motion is to rise and report back prior. There has been a request for a recorded vote. The bells will ring until the whips are satisfied.
order. The Committee of the Whole House on Bills will come to order. Um, the hour of adjournment has been reached. The committee will now rise and report progress. The Committee of the Whole House on Bill reports uh, back. I recognize the clerk. That the Committee of the Whole House on Bills has met and considered the following bill, Bill 340, and the Chair has been instructed to advise that the Committee has made some progress on that bill. The hour of adjournment has been reached. The House stands adjourned until 1 p.m. November... Nine. Oh my God, sorry, excuse me, pardon me. The order of adjournment has arrived. The hour of adjournment has arrived. The House stands adjourned until 9 a.m. on November 3rd.